Section 18 of Final Report of the Advisory Committee on Human Radiation Experiments. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Melanie Young. Final Report of the Advisory Committee on Human Radiation Experiments. Ethics of Human Subjects Research, A Historical Perspective, Chapter 2, Part 3. Nuremberg and Research with Patients The record of conducting non-therapeutic research with unconsenting sick patients during the post-war period discussed above seems to stand in particularly sharp contrast with the claims about the conduct of research involving human subjects in the United States that Andrew Ivey made during his testimony in Nuremberg. We have seen how some observers, even before Nuremberg, recognized that employing uninformed, vulnerable sick patients solely as a means to a scientific end was simply wrong. We must, however, also acknowledge that the particulars of the Nuremberg medical trial did not call for careful attention to the issues surrounding research with sick patients. None of the German physicians at Nuremberg stood accused of exploiting patients for experimental purposes. Nonetheless, it is likely that Andrew Ivey would have argued that consent was appropriate in virtually all instances of medical research. Dr. Hermann Wagotsky, who worked closely under Ivy at Northwestern in the late 1930s and early 1940s, explicitly commented during an Ethics Oral History Project interview that he did not believe that his mentor drew any sort of ethical line between various types of clinical research. I don't think he made any distinction between research with sick patients and research with healthy subjects. Research was research. It didn't make any difference. Additional evidence that Ivy would have supported standards of consent for research with ill as well as with healthy subjects comes from his response to a set of rules for human experimentation put forth by the German Ministry of Interior in 1931, presented to him after he had prepared his written report for the AMA in the fall of 1946. These rules appear to be considerably more comprehensive and sophisticated than the Nuremberg Code itself. Most significantly, the 1931 German standards cover both therapeutic and non-therapeutic research, calling for consent in both types of medical investigation. For reasons that are not clear, the prosecution team at Nuremberg did not choose to place much emphasis on these German standards in constructing the case. Ivy did, however, attempt, without much help from the prosecution, to initiate a discussion of the 1931 standards during his testimony. It is clear from the trial transcript that Ivy saw a rough equivalence between the more detailed and extensive German rules and those formulated by the AMA, with his assistance. Shortly after discussing the AMA principles on the witness stand, Ivy had the following exchange with Prosecutor Alexander G. Hardy. Question. Do you have any further statements to make concerning the rules of medical ethics concerning experimentation in human beings? Answer. Well, I find that since making my report to the American Medical Association that a decree of the Minister of Public Welfare, Ivy should have said the Minister of the Interior, of Germany in 1931 on the subject of regulations for modern therapy for the performance of scientific experiments on human beings, contains all the AMA principles which I have read. Hardy did not take what now seems an obvious opportunity to allow Ivy to expand further on these rules. However, a few minutes later, Ivy brought up the German standards again on his own, and again Hardy did not pursue the topic further. At this point, Ivy stated his general agreement with the German standards of 1931 even more firmly. I cited the principles 
from the Reich Minister of the Interior, dated February 28, 1931, to indicate that the ethical principles for the use of human beings as subjects in medical experiments in Germany in 1931 were similar to these which I have enunciated and which have been approved by the House of Delegates of the American Medical Association. Ivy's assertion of similarity between the AMA principles and those in the 1931 German document may not meet with agreement among those who compare the two. Though they may be viewed as similar in philosophy and intent, the German Interior Ministry document is far more detailed and comprehensive than that of the AMA. Contrary to Ivy's claims at Nuremberg and the positioning of Ivy by the prosecution, he cannot in any full sense be taken as the embodiment of the entire American medical profession in the years immediately following World War II. Again, Dr. Rogotsky spoke to this point in his recent interview. Well, I've always felt that that stuff that Ivy wrote up during the time of the trials was pretty much an expression of his personal philosophy about research. And it was the kind of understanding that we had in working with him about how he felt. Voluntariness being, number one, you had to volunteer and had to be in a situation where you could volunteer. And consent in the sense that you didn't do anything to anybody that they didn't know what you were doing. That you explained to people what it was you were going to do and why you were going to do it and that sort of thing. Even if it is true that Andrew Ivey would have wholeheartedly endorsed the notion of obtaining consent from any research subject, whether an experiment held the possibility of personal benefit or not, whether the subjects were sick or healthy, it seems likely that the AMA House of Delegates would have been hesitant to endorse a condensation of Ivey's principles of research ethics if they had been explicitly extended to cover all categories of clinical investigation. Obtaining consent from patients within the normal clinical relationship was not a common practice in late 1946. At that time, and for many years to come, patient trust and medical beneficence were viewed as the unshakable moral foundations on which meaningful interactions between professional healers and the sick should be built. In fact, it was not until 1981 that the AMA's Judicial Council specifically endorsed informed consent as an appropriate part of the therapeutic doctor-patient relationship. But in the end, it must be acknowledged that the facts of the Nuremberg Medical Trial did not force Andrew Ivey, the AMA House of Delegates, the Nuremberg prosecutors, or the judges to grapple with the distinctions between research with sick patients and research with healthy subjects, or therapeutic and non-therapeutic research. The Nuremberg defendants stood accused of ghastly experimental acts that were absolutely without therapeutic intent, and their unfortunate subjects were never under any illusion that they were receiving medical treatment. To rebut the claims of some of the medical defendants that obtaining consent from research subjects was not a clearly established principle, Ivy could, and did, offer a variety of examples on the witness stand from a long tradition of human experimentation on consenting healthy subjects. Ivy and the members of the prosecution team were not faced with what might have been a more troubling process. Finding examples of well-organized non-therapeutic experiments on sick patients in which the subjects had clearly offered consent. Simply put, the Nuremberg Medical Trial did not demand it. American Medical Researchers' Reactions to News of the Nuremberg Medical Trial It is important to have some understanding of the extent to which American medical scientists paid attention to the events of the Nuremberg Medical Trial and made connections with the messages that emanated from the courtroom in Germany. The Nuremberg Medical Trial received coverage in the American popular press, but it would almost certainly be an exaggeration to refer to this attention as exhaustive. 
Historian David Rothman has provided the following summary of the trial's coverage in the New York Times. Over 1945 and 1946, fewer than a dozen articles appeared in the New York Times on the Nazi medical research. The indictment of 42 doctors in the fall of 1946 was a page 5 story and the opening of the trial a page 9 story. The announcement of the guilty verdict in August 1947 was a front-page story. But the execution of seven of the defendants a year later was again relegated to the back pages. The Advisory Committee's Ethics Oral History Project suggests that American medical researchers, perhaps like the American public generally, were not carefully following the daily developments in Nuremberg. For example, Dr. John Arnold, a researcher who, during the medical trial, was involved in malaria experiments on prisoners at Stateville Prison in Illinois, offered a particularly vivid, if somewhat anachronistic, recollection of the scant attention paid to the Nuremberg medical trial among American medical scientists. We were dimly aware of it, and as you ask me now, I'm astonished that we were not hanging on the TV at the time, watching for each twist and turn of the argument to develop. But we weren't. It might have been expected that the researchers at Stateville would have been particularly concerned with the events at Nuremberg, because some of the medical defendants claimed during the trial that the wartime malaria experiments at the Illinois prison were analogous to the experiments carried out in the Nazi concentration camps. The strongest statement of awareness came from Dr. Herbert Abrams, a radiologist who was in his residency at Montefiore Hospital in the Bronx throughout most of the trial. The Nuremberg Medical Trial was part of the history of the day, and there was extensive reportage so that the manner of human experimentation as it had been done by the Nazis was very much in the news. We were all aware of it. I think that people experienced this kind of revulsion about it that you might anticipate. It was surely something, at least in the environment I was in. We were aware of, and that affected the thinking of everyone who was involved in clinical investigation. It seems likely, however, that the environment this young physician was in would have caused a heightened awareness of a trial dealing with Nazi medical professionals. Montefiore is a traditionally Jewish hospital that was home to many Jewish refugee physicians who had fled the terror and oppression of the Nazi regime. A trial of German physicians almost certainly would have been of particular interest in this setting. Even among American medical researchers who might have been aware of events at Nuremberg, it seems that many did not perceive specific personal implications in the medical trial. Rothman has enunciated this historical view most fully. He asserts that the prevailing view was that the Nuremberg medical defendants were Nazis first and last. By definition, nothing they did, and no code drawn up in response to them, was relevant to the United States. Jay Katz has offered a similar summation of the immediate response of the medical community to the Nuremberg Code. It was a good code for barbarians, but an unnecessary code for ordinary physicians. Several participants in the Ethics Oral History Project affirmed the interpretations of Rothman and Katz, using similar language. Said one physician, there was a disconnect between the Nuremberg Code and its application to American researchers. The interpretation of these codes by American physicians was that they were necessary for barbarians but not for fine, upstanding people. This same physician later acknowledged that, in a sense, some American researchers did not pay attention to the lessons of the Nuremberg Medical Trial because it was not convenient to do so. The connection between those horrendous acts carried out by German medical scientists in the concentration camps 
and our everyday investigations was not made by American medical researchers for reasons of self-interest, to be perfectly frank. As I see it now, I'm saddened that we didn't see the connection, but that's what was done. It's hard to tell you now how we rationalized, but the fact is we did. The popular press mirrored the view that human experimentation as practiced in the United States was not a morally troubling enterprise. It was as American as apple pie. Between 1948 and 1960, magazines such as the Saturday Evening Post, Reader's Digest, and the American Mercury ran human interest stories on human guinea pigs. These stories generally focused on specific groups of healthy subjects. Prisoners, conscientious objectors, medical students, soldiers, and described them as volunteers. The articles explained the ordeals to which the volunteers had submitted themselves. Among these men and women, the New York Times informed its Sunday readership in 1958, you will find those who will take shots of the new vaccines, who will swallow radioactive drugs, who will fly higher than anyone else, who will watch malaria-infected mosquitoes feed on their bare arms. The articles assured the public that the volunteers had plausible, often noble, reasons for volunteering for such seemingly gruesome treatment. The explanations included social redemption, especially in the case of prisoners, religious or other beliefs, particularly for conscientious objectors, the advancement of science, service to society, and thrill-seeking. In sum, most articles in the popular press were uncritical toward experimentation on humans and assumed that those involved had freely volunteered to participate. However, a smaller number of press reports in the late 1940s and 1950s did suggest some tension between the words at Nuremberg and the practices in America. As early as 1948, for example, Science News reported the Soviet claim that Americans were using Nazi methods in the conduct of prison experiments. Concern also began to be voiced about the dangers to volunteer guinea pigs. In October 1954, for another example, the magazine Christian Century called on the Army to halt, at the first sign of danger, experiments at the Fitzsimmons Hospital in Denver, where soldiers were called upon to eat foods exposed to cobalt radiation. It is also possible that press accounts of experiments with patients rather than healthy subjects were more inclined to be critical, even in the late 1940s. A Saturday Evening Post article from the January 15, 1949 issue describes how a VA physician kept quiet about streptomycin trials involving the medical departments of the Army, Navy, and VA because of the risk of congressional chastisement from publicity-conscious members of the House and Senate who might have screamed, You can't experiment on our heroes. If it had been known that Army and Navy veterans of former wars were being used in the medical investigation. This was a real worry of the doctors who formulated the clinical program. Evidence suggests that some American researchers were genuinely and deeply concerned with the issues surrounding human experimentation during the years immediately following World War II. One source of insight into the thinking of American physicians engaged in clinical research during the 1950s is found in the groundbreaking work of medical sociologist Rene C. Fox. For two five-month periods between September 1951 and January 1953, Fox spent long days in continuous, direct, and intimate contact with the physicians and patients in a metabolic research ward that she pseudonymously called Ward F. Second. In 1959, Fox reported with remarkable sensitivity and eloquence on the ethical dilemmas faced by the physicians conducting research on this ward. 
She did not suggest that the scientists under her observation were unaware of the Nuremberg Code. Instead, she offered a point-by-point -point paraphrasing of the code, which she identified as the basic principles governing research on human subjects, which the physicians of the metabolic group, her collective term for the researchers whom she studied, were required to observe. Rather than being unconscious or contemptuous of a set of principles intended for barbarians, Vox reported that the researchers on Ward F. II were sometimes troubled by their inability to apply the high, but essentially unquestioned, standards enunciated at the Nuremberg Medical Trial. The physicians of the metabolic group were deeply committed to these principles and conscientiously tried to live up to them in the research they carried out on patients. However, like most norms, the basic principles of human experimentation are formulated on such an abstract level that they only provide general guides to actual behavior. Partly as a consequence, the physicians of the metabolic group often found it difficult to judge whether or not a particular experiment in which they were engaged kept within the bounds delineated by these principles. Sometimes, private discussions among researchers about the ethical aspects of human experimentation led to public events. A good example from the early 1950s is the symposium held on October 10, 1951, at the University of California School of Medicine in San Francisco, at which Otto Gutentag made the presentation discussed earlier. One of Gutentag's colleagues, Dr. Michael B. Shimkin, organized the symposium in response to some confidential criticism that he had received for research carried out under his direction with patients at the University of California's Laboratory of Experimental Oncology. The exact nature of this criticism is unclear from the records that remain of the episode, but Shimkin reported in a memoir that remedial steps were taken including written protocols for all new departures in clinical research, which we asked the cancer board of the medical school to review. In his memoirs, Shimkin also recalls that patients were screened carefully before they were admitted to the Laboratory of Experimental Oncology. They had to understand the experimental nature of our work, and every procedure was again explained to them. The initial release form even included agreement to an autopsy. The understanding did not absolve us of negligence nor deprive patients of recourse to legal actions, but did set the tone and nature of our relationships. In all our five years of operations, not a single threat or implied threat of action against us was voiced. Two patients did instruct us to terminate our attempts at therapy. The criticism Shimkin experienced also demonstrated to him that a more open discussion of clinical research might be of benefit to his colleagues. According to his recollection, there was an almost visible thawing of attitude by the airing of the problem at the symposium. Less than a year after Shimkin's 1951 San Francisco Symposium, the organizers of the First International Congress of the histopathology of the nervous system, which was held in Rome, were sufficiently concerned with ethical issues that they invited Pope Pius XII to address the moral limits of medical methods of research and treatment. In a speech before 427 medical researchers from around the world, including 62 Americans, the Pope firmly endorsed the principle of obtaining consent from research subjects, whether sick or healthy. He also pointed his audience to the relatively recent lessons of the Nuremberg Medical Trial, which he summed up as teaching that man should not exist for the use of society. On the contrary, the community exists for the good of man. In an interview in 1961, Dr. Thomas Rivers, a prominent American virus researcher, recalled that the Pope's words had been influential among medical scientists working during the 1950s. In September 1952, 
Pope Pius XII had given a speech at the First International Congress on the histopathology of the nervous system in which he outlined the Roman Catholic Church's position on the moral limits of human experimentation for purposes of medical research. That speech had a very broad impact on medical scientists both here and abroad. The growing influence of the Nuremberg Medical Trial can be seen by looking at two editions of the best-known textbook of American medical jurisprudence in the mid-20th century. In the 1949 edition of Doctor and Patient and the Law, Louis J. Regan, a physician and lawyer, offered very little under the heading experimentation, and what he did offer made no reference to Nuremberg. The physician must keep abreast of medical progress, but he is responsible if he goes beyond usual and standard procedures to the point of experimentation. If such treatment is considered indicated, it should not be undertaken until consultation has been had and until the patient has signed a paper acknowledging and assuming the risk. However, in Regan's next edition of the same text, published in 1956, his few lines on human experimentation had been expanded to three pages. He presented a lengthy paraphrasing of the Nuremberg Code, and he repeated verbatim, without quotation marks, the judge's preamble to the Code, stating that all agree about these principles. Regan characterized the standards enunciated by the judges at Nuremberg as the most carefully developed set of precepts specifically drawn to meet the problem of human experimentation. Immediately following his discussion of Nuremberg, Regan laid out the 1946 standards of the American Medical Association, which, as he put it, researchers needed to meet in order to conform with the ethics of the American Medical Association. End of Section 18 Recording by Melanie Young Section 19 of Final Report of the Advisory Committee on Human Radiation Experiments. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Melanie Young. Final Report of the Advisory Committee on Human Radiation Experiments. Ethics of Human Subjects Research, a Historical Perspective. Chapter 2, Part 4 New Times, New Codes In the spring of 1959, the National Society for Medical Research, NSMR, an organization that Andrew Ivey had helped to found in 1946, sponsored a national conference on the legal environment of medicine at the University of Chicago. Human experimentation was one of the major topics presented for discussion by the 148 conference participants, primarily medical researchers, from around the country. The published report of this conference reveals that the many researchers who gathered in Chicago understood the Nuremberg Code well enough to use it as a point of departure for discussion. As a group, the conferees acknowledged that the ten principles of the Nuremberg Code have become the principal guidepost to the ethics of clinical research in the Western world. Not all those in attendance, however, seemed to have been entirely pleased with this state of affairs. A Committee on the Re-Evaluation of the Nuremberg Experimental Principles reported general agreement with the spirit of these precautions, but discomfort with a number of particulars. For example, they suggested that the absolute requirement for consent in the Code's first principle might be softened by inserting either explicit or reasonably presumed before the word consent. They also added a clause that would allow for third-party permission for those not capable of personal consent. The 1959 NSMR conference strongly suggests that by the late 1950s, many and perhaps even most American medical researchers 
had come to recognize the Nuremberg Code as the most authoritative single answer to an important question. What are the rules for human experimentation? The same conference also provides compelling evidence that many researchers who were giving the ethical issues surrounding human experimentation serious attention at this time were not entirely happy with the prospect of living by the letter of the code. The sources of discomfort with the Nuremberg Code can be grouped, retrospectively, into three broad categories. First, some recognized the discrepancies between what they had come to know as real practices in research on patient subjects and what they read in the lofty, idealized language of the code. Others simply disagreed with some elements of the code. Still others disliked the very idea of a single, concrete set of standards to guide behavior in such a complex matter as human experimentation. Henry Beecher, the Harvard-based medical researcher who was Louis Lasagna's mentor in the early 1950s, published a paper, Experimentation in Man, in the Journal of the American Medical Association only a few months before the NSMR conference in Chicago. In this lengthy piece, Beecher addressed a mixture of all three sources of discomfort with the Nuremberg Code. Beecher offered the assertion that it is unethical and immoral to carry out potentially dangerous experiments without the subject's knowledge and consent, as the central conclusion of his paper. But, even with this strong statement, he was not entirely happy with the first clause of the Code. He viewed the Nuremberg Consent Clause as too extreme and not squaring with the realities of clinical research. It is easy enough to say, as point one of the Nuremberg Code does, that the subject should have sufficient knowledge and comprehension of the elements of the subject matter involved, as to enable him to make an understanding and enlightened decision. Practically, this is often quite impossible, for the complexities of essential medical research have reached the point where the full implications and possible hazards cannot always be known to anyone and are often communicable only to a few informed investigators and sometimes not even to them. Certainly, the full implications of work to be done are often not really communicable to lay subjects. Point one states a requirement very often impossible of fulfillment. Beecher's second form of difficulty with the code can be found in his opinion of another Nuremberg Clause, which states in part that a human experiment should not be random and unnecessary in nature. Beecher cited anesthesia, x-rays, radium, and penicillin as important medical breakthroughs that had resulted from random experimentation. He further stated that he would not know how to define experiments unnecessary in nature. Finally, Beecher expressed skepticism in general that any code could provide effective moral guidance for researchers working with human subjects. Near the beginning of his paper, he wrote that the problems of human experimentation do not lend themselves to a series of rigid rules. Later in the piece, he expanded on this thought. It is not my view that many rules can be laid down to govern experimentation in man. In most cases, these are more likely to do harm than good. Rules are not going to curb the unscrupulous. Such abuses, as have occurred, are usually due to ignorance and inexperience. The most effective protection for all concerned depends upon a recognition and understanding of the various aspects of the problem. Another episode involving Henry Beecher further clarifies the medical profession's dissatisfaction with the construction of the Nuremberg Code. In the fall of 1961, Beecher and other members of the Harvard Medical School's administrative board, the school's governing body, were presented with a set of rigid rules that had begun to appear in Army medical research contracts. The members of the board quickly recognized the principles, policies, and rules of the Surgeon General, Department of the Army, relating to the use of human volunteers in medical research, awarded by the Army as little more than a restatement of the Nuremberg Code. 
The Army Office of the Surgeon General's provisions, as we discussed in Chapter 1, originally appeared in 1954. Given what we have just read of Beecher, it is not surprising that he was uncomfortable with the prospect of working in strict accordance with the Nuremberg Code. If he were to receive funding from the Army, nor, as we see from the minutes of the administrative board meetings, in which this matter came up for discussion, was Beecher alone in his opposition. At the October 6, 1961, meeting of the board, when the Army contract insertion was first mentioned, some members felt that with the minor changes, the regulations were acceptable, while others described the regulations as vague, ambiguous, and, in many instances, impossible to fulfill. One of Beecher's fellow board members, Assistant Medical School Dean Joseph W. Gardella, M.D., produced a thoroughgoing written critique of the principles, policies, and rules of the Surgeon General, and thus of the Nuremberg Code, following the October 1961 meeting for the consideration of the other board members. Gardella opened his analysis with some general comments on the intended meaning of the Nuremberg Code. The Nuremberg Code was conceived in reference to Nazi atrocities and was written for the specific purpose of preventing brutal excesses from being committed or excused in the name of science. The Code, however admirable in its intent and however suitable for the purpose for which it was conceived, is in our opinion not necessarily pertinent to or adequate for the conduct of medical research in the United States. After questioning the pertinence of the Nuremberg Medical Trial to American medical science, Gardella went on to raise a general question about the scope of the Nuremberg Code. He strongly suggested that the Code was not meant to cover what he perceived as the morally distinct enterprise of conducting potentially therapeutic research with sick patients. Does it refer only to healthy volunteers who have nothing to gain in terms of their health by participating as research subjects? Or does it include the sick, whose physicians foresee for them the possibility of personal benefit through their participation? The distinction is important in that we believe that it would be difficult and might prove to be impossible to devise one set of guiding principles that would apply satisfactorily to both of these two different categories. Gardella offered a variety of specific objections to the Army Surgeon General's principles, but several of these points related directly to the general questions raised above. The first rule of the Army principles stated, in a clear example of borrowing from the Nuremberg Code, that the voluntary consent of the human subject is absolutely essential. Gardella, like Beecher, did not question the general spirit of this stricture. He worried about the practical application of this seemingly simple idea. Some of Gardella's worries arose specifically in the context of research with sick patients. The concept of voluntary consent is of central importance in any code relating to experimentation on humans. And yet, the concept of consent is not satisfactorily defined in the Army principles. The quality of the subject's consent depends upon an interpretation of a factual situation which will frequently be complex. Could the subject comprehend what he was told? Did he in fact comprehend? How far was his consent influenced by his condition or by his trust in his physician? These questions may be easily answered in the case of the healthy volunteer. They may be more difficult for the sick. Perhaps the most significant addition to the Nuremberg Code found in the Army principles was the requirement for written consent from research subjects. Gardella objected to this requirement in research on patients in a firm and revealing fashion. This condition is inappropriate except in connection with healthy, normal volunteers. The legal overtones and implications attendant to such a requirement have no place in a patient-physician relationship based on trust. Here, such faith and trust serve as the primary basis of the subject's consent. Moreover, being asked to sign a somewhat formal paper is likely to provoke anxiety in the subject, 
i.e. patient, who can but wonder at the need for so much protocol. Dr. Gardella presented his analysis of the Army principles to the other members of the Harvard Medical School Administrative Board on March 23, 1962. The minutes of that meeting document that Gardella's views were not extreme or exceptional among leading medical scientists in the early 1960s, at least at Harvard University. The members of the board were in general agreement with the objections and criticisms expressed in Gardella's critique. At this same meeting, Henry Beecher agreed in an expansive moment to attempt to capture in a paragraph or so the broad philosophical and moral principles that underlie the conduct of research on human beings at the Harvard Medical School. The members of the board hoped that such a statement might satisfy the Army and that it would allow Harvard, as Gardella put it, to avert the catastrophic impact of the Surgeon General's regulation. A few months later, Beecher had completed a two-and-a-half-page statement outlining the philosophy and ethical principles governing the conduct of research on human beings at Harvard Medical School. At the June 8, 1962, board meeting, Beecher's colleagues commended and reaffirmed the views expressed in Beecher's document. In this statement, as in his 1959 published paper, Beecher emphasized the significance of consent, but he also asserted that it is folly to overlook the fact that valid, informed consent may be difficult to the point of impossible to obtain in some cases. More than consent, Beecher believed in the significance of a special relationship of trust between subject or patient and the investigator. In the end, Beecher concluded that the only reliable foundation for this relationship was a virtuous medical researcher with virtuous peers. It is this writer's point of view that the best approach to research with human subjects concerns the character, wisdom, experience, honesty, imaginativeness, and sense of responsibility of the investigator who in all cases of doubt or where serious consequences might remotely occur will call in his peers and get the benefit of their counsel. Rigid rules will jeopardize the research establishments of this country where experimentation in man is essential. Available evidence suggests that by offering Henry Beecher's replacement for the Nuremberg Code, representatives of Harvard Medical School were able to extract a clarification during a meeting with Army Surgeon General Leonard D. Heaton on July 12, 1962 that the principles being inserted into Harvard's research contracts with the Army were guidelines rather than rigid rules. While the Harvard Medical School discussion of the Army's principles took place behind closed doors and involved a policy of limited applicability, the leaders of the international medical community were simultaneously engaged in a far more visible and global attempt to bring the standards enunciated in the Nuremberg Code into line with the realities of medical research. The 1964 statement by the World Medical Association, WMA, commonly known as the Declaration of Helsinki, created two separate categories in laying out rules for human experimentation. Clinical research combined with professional care and non-therapeutic clinical research. In the former category, physicians were required to obtain consent from patient subjects only when consistent with patient psychology. In the latter type of research, the consent requirements were more absolute. Clinical research on a human being cannot be undertaken without his free consent after he has been fully informed. Another noteworthy deviation from the Nuremberg Code is Helsinki's allowance in both therapeutic and non-therapeutic research, for third-party permission from a legal guardian. As one might predict from the similarity between the changes introduced by the Declaration of Helsinki and the changes to the Nuremberg Code suggested by the American participants at the NSMR conference in 1959, the WMA document met with widespread approval among researchers in this country. Organizations including the American Society for Clinical Investigation, the American Federation for Clinical Research, and the American Medical Association 
offered their quick and enthusiastic endorsements. Compared with the lofty, idealized language of the Nuremberg Code, the Helsinki Declaration may have seemed more sensible to many researchers in the early 1960s because it offered rules that more closely resembled research practice in the clinical setting. Conclusion In the late 1940s, American medical researchers seldom recognized that research with patient subjects ought to follow the same principles as those applied to healthy subjects. Yet, as we have seen in this chapter, some of those few who asked themselves hard questions about their research work with patients concluded that people who are ill are entitled to the same consideration as those who are not. That some did in fact reach this conclusion is evidence that it was not beyond the horizon of moral insight at that time. Nevertheless, they were a minority of the community of physician researchers, and the organized medical profession did not exhibit a willingness to reconsider its responsibilities to patients in the burgeoning world of post-war clinical research. While a slowly increasing number of investigators reflected on the ethical treatment of human subjects during the 1950s, it was not until the 1960s and a series of highly publicized events with names like Thalidomide, Willowbrook, and Tuskegee that it became apparent that a professional code, whether it originated in Nuremberg or Helsinki, did not provide sufficient protection against exploitation and abuse of human subjects of research. In the next chapter, we examine how the federal government became intimately, extensively, and visibly involved in the regulation of research with human subjects. End of Section 19 Recording by Melanie Young Section 20 of The Final Report of the Advisory Committee on Human Radiation Experiments. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Final Report of the Advisory Committee on Human Radiation Experiments. Ethics of Human Subjects Research, a Historical Perspective. Chapter 3, Part 1 Government Standards for Human Experiments, the 1960s and 1970s The year 1974 marks the upper bound for the period of the Advisory Committee's historical investigation. That year, two landmark events in the history of government policy on research involving human subjects took place the promulgation by the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare, DHEW, of Comprehensive Regulations for Oversight of Human Subject Research, and passage by Congress of the National Research Act. The DHEW regulations set rules for oversight of human subject research, supported by the single largest funding source for such research, and the National Research Act authorized the establishment of the National Commission for the Protection of Human Subjects of Biomedical and Behavioral Research, also known as the National Commission, which was charged with examining the conduct of research involving human subjects. In the years following 1974, many of the rules promulgated by DHEW were subsequently adopted by various other government agencies, culminating in government-wide regulations under the Common Rule in 1991. In the first part of this chapter, we trace the developments in the 1960s and early 1970s that influenced and led up to the DHEW regulations and the National Research Act. These developments included congressional hearings on the practices of the drug industry and the thalidomide tragedy, critical scholarly writings, interim policies at DHEW, public outcry over controversial cases of medical research, and the congressional hearings these cases occasioned. People were surprised and shocked to learn about practices and behaviors they knew to be wrong, 
while the ethical principles such practices violated may not have been well articulated specific to the enterprise of human research they were part of individuals moral consciousness the history of these events has been well told before and we only summarize it here drawing heavily on the previous work of other authors the 1974 regulations were promulgated by DHEW and applied only to that agency. Likewise, the National Research Act authorized the establishment of the National Commission and directed it to make recommendations to the Secretary of DHEW. In the latter part of this chapter, we review developments in policies governing human research during this period in agencies other than DHEW. This is a history that has received comparatively little scholarly attention. In the 1970s, just as DHEW was moving ahead with broad new regulations, scandal rocked the Department of Defense and the CIA. It was revealed that, with cooperation from university researchers, these agencies had engaged in secret experimentation on military and civilian subjects, without their knowledge, sometimes with tragic results. The discovery of the existence of these secret programs led to further congressional investigations and to a 1975 Department of the Army review of the effectiveness of the 1953 Secretary of Defense Wilson Memorandum adopting the Nuremberg Code. This Army review led to the eventual declassification of the Wilson Memorandum, which had been top secret upon its issuance and remained classified until 1975. It also led, much later, to litigation in which justices of the U.S. Supreme Court for the first time commented on the applicability of the Nuremberg Code to actions undertaken by the U.S. government, the chapter concludes with a discussion of these important events. The Development of Human Subject Research Policy at DHEW As the largest funding source in the federal government for human subject research, DHEW led the way in developing regulations aimed at protecting the rights and welfare of subjects. The evolution of the regulations, which would eventually be adopted on a government-wide basis, was influenced by revelations of unethical research, congressional reaction to these revelations, and concern over public perception of such research. That regulations were eventually adopted at all by DHEW was influenced by the political realities of the time, and the lack of congressional support for a standing regulatory body to oversee human subject research, as had been recommended by an influential federally appointed panel, the Tuskegee Syphilis Study Ad Hoc Panel. In a trade-off that would have major influence on the future of human subject research oversight, the proposed bill creating the standing regulatory body was withdrawn in exchange for the National Research Act establishing the National Commission, and an understanding that DHEW would promulgate the aforementioned regulations. This historical backdrop is outlined in the remainder of this chapter. The Thalidomide Tragedy and Congressional Requirement for Patient Consent In 1959, a Senate subcommittee chaired by Senator Estes Kefauver of Tennessee began hearings into the conduct of pharmaceutical companies. Testimony revealed that it was common practice for drug companies to provide samples of experimental drugs, whose safety and efficacy had not been established, to physicians, who were then paid to collect data on their patients taking these drugs. Physicians throughout the country prescribed these drugs to patients without their knowledge or consent, as part of this loosely controlled research. These practices and others prompted calls by Kefauver and other senators for an amendment to the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act of 1938 to address the injuriousness and ineffectiveness of certain drugs. In 1961, the dangers of new drug uses were vividly exemplified by the thalidomide disaster in Europe, Canada, and to a lesser degree the United States. 
Starting in late 1957, the sedative thalidomide was given to countless pregnant women and caused thousands of birth defects in newborn infants, most commonly missing or deformed limbs. The thalidomide disaster was widely covered by the television networks, and the visual impact of these babies stunned viewers and caused Americans to question the protections afforded those receiving investigational agents. It is in large measure because of the thalidomide episode that the 1962 Kefauver-Harris amendments to the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act were passed, requiring that informed consent be obtained in the testing of investigational drugs. While such testing occurred mainly with patients, Congress carefully avoided interfering in the doctor-patient relationship and in the process severely reduced the effectiveness of this requirement. Consent was not required when it was not feasible or was deemed not to be in the best interests of the patient. Both judgments made according to the best judgment of the doctors involved. Despite being limited in scope, the Kefauver-Harris amendments were influential in advancing considerations of protections of research subjects, first within the DHEW and later throughout the rest of the government. NIH and PHS develop a uniform policy to protect human subjects. In late 1963, concerns were raised within NIH by Director James Shannon after disturbing revelations about two research projects funded in part by the Public Health Service and NIH. One was the unsuccessful transplantation of a chimpanzee kidney into a human being at Tulane University, a procedure that promised neither benefit to the recipient nor new scientific information. The transplant was reportedly done with the consent of the patient, but without consultation or review by anyone other than the medical team involved. The second was research undertaken in mid-1963 at the Brooklyn Jewish Chronic Disease Hospital. There, investigators... The chief investigator, Dr. Chester M. Southam, was a physician at the Sloan Kettering Cancer Research Institute, and he received permission to proceed with the work from the hospital's medical director, Dr. Emmanuel E. Mandel, had undertaken a research project in which they injected live cancer cells into indigent elderly patients without their consent. The research went forward without review by the hospital's research committee and over the objections of three physicians consulted who argued that the proposed subjects were incapable of giving adequate consent to participate. The disclosure of the experiment served to make both PHS officials like Shannon and the Board of Regents of the University of the State of New York, which had jurisdiction over licensure of physicians, aware of the shortcomings of procedures in place to protect human subjects. They were further concerned over the public's reaction to disclosure of the research and the impact it would have on research generally and the institutions in particular. After a review, the Board of Regents censured the researchers. They suspended the licenses of Drs. Mandel and Southam, but subsequently stayed the suspension and placed the physicians on probation for one year. There were no immediate repercussions for the hospital, Sloan Kettering, the university, or PHS, but the case nonetheless profoundly affected the subsequent development of federal guidelines to protect research subjects. To add to the ferment, NIH officials had closely followed the work of the Law Medicine Research Institute at Boston University, which issued survey findings in 1962 showing that few institutions had procedural guidelines covering clinical research. And in the year after both the above-mentioned cases came to light, the World Medical Association issued its Declaration of Helsinki, which set standards for clinical research and required that subjects give informed consent prior to enrolling in an experiment. Thus, national and world opinion on matters related to the ethics of human subject research created a climate ripe for changes in policies and approaches toward research ethics. <laughs>
concern over disturbing cases and the growing attention paid to research ethics prompted NIH Director James Shannon to create a committee in late 1963 under the direction of the NIH Associate Chief for Program Development, Robert B. Livingston, whose office supported centers at which NIH-funded research took place. The internal committee was charged with studying problems of inadequate consent and the standards of self-scrutiny involving research protocols and procedures. The committee was also to recommend a suitable set of controls for the protection of human subjects in NIH-sponsored research. The Livingston Committee recognized that ethically questionable research, exemplified by the research at the Jewish Chronic Disease Hospital, could wreak havoc on public perception, increase the likelihood of liability, and inhibit research. These problems made it worthwhile to consider central oversight, or lack thereof, for research contracted out. However, the committee expressed concern over NIH taking too authoritarian a posture toward research oversight, and so argued that it would be difficult for the agency to assume responsibility for ethics and research practices. When it issued its report in late 1964, the committee did not recommend any changes in the current NIH policies, and, moreover, cautioned that whatever NIH might do by way of designating a code or stipulating standards for acceptable clinical research would be likely to inhibit, delay, or distort the carrying out of clinical research. In deference to physician autonomy and traditional regard for the sanctity of the doctor-patient relationship, the report concluded that NIH was not in a position to shape the educational foundations of medical ethics. Director Shannon did not think the conclusions of the Livingston Committee went far enough, feeling as he did that NIH should take a position of increased responsibility for research ethics, especially in light of the Jewish Chronic Disease Hospital case and its implications for the NIH both internally and in terms of public perception, he felt that a stronger reaction was needed. Thus, despite the committee's limited conclusions, Shannon and Surgeon General Luther Terry together decided in 1965 to propose to the National Advisory Health Council, NAHC, an advisory committee to the Surgeon General of the Public Health Service, that in light of recent problems, the NIH should assume responsibility for formal controls on individual investigators. At the NAHC meeting, Shannon argued for impartial prior peer review of the risks research posed to subjects and questioned the adequacy of the protections of the rights of subjects. The Council's members mostly agreed with Shannon's concerns, and three months later issued a resolution concerning research on humans, following Shannon's broad recommendations and endorsing the importance of obtaining informed consent from individuals. Be it resolved that the National Advisory Health Council believes that public health service support of clinical research and investigation involving human beings should be provided only if the judgment of the investigator is subject to prior review by his institutional associates to assure an independent determination of the protection of the rights and welfare of the individual or individuals involved, of the appropriateness of the methods used to secure informed consent, and of the risks and potential medical benefits of the investigation. What this statement did not do, however, was explain what would count as informed consent. The NAHC recommendations were accepted by the new Surgeon General, William H. Stewart, and in February 1966 he issued a policy statement requiring PHS grantee institutions to address three topics by committee prior review for all proposed research involving human subjects. This review should assure an independent determination, one, of the rights and welfare of the individual or individuals involved, 
two of the appropriateness of the methods used to secure informed consent and three of the risks and potential medical benefits of the investigation the 1966 PHS policy required that institutions give the funding agency a written assurance of compliance. But, like the NAHC recommendations, the policy spoke strictly to the procedural aspects of informed consent, and not to its meaning or criteria. Substantive informed consent criteria were established for research at the NIH Clinical Center shortly after the PHS policy was issued, but this new policy applied only to intramural research, that is, to research undertaken at the clinical center. The clinical center policy was important as the first federal research policy with a specific definition of what constituted informed consent requirements in the research context. The inclusion of specific consent requirements in policies applying to extramural research would not occur, however, until the mid-1970s. The 1966 PHS policy is significant, both for its recognition that patient subjects, like healthy subjects, should be included in the consent provisions for federally sponsored human experimentation and for its attempt to strike a balance between federal regulation and local control, which continues to this day. Such a balancing continued the work begun by the AEC in its provision for local human use communities as a condition for the use of AEC-supplied isotopes, and the Department of Defense in the provision for a high-level review of proposed experimentation, Although a landmark in the government regulation of biomedical research, the 1966 policy was to be revised and changed throughout the decade as biomedical research drew greater attention and informed consent grew in importance. While from the outset the PHS policy was revised periodically, site visits by PHS employees to randomly selected institutions revealed a wide range of compliance. These site visits found widespread confusion about how to assess risks and benefits, refusal by some researchers to cooperate with the policy, and in many cases indifference by those charged with administering research and its rules at local institutions. Complaints of overworked review committees and requests for clarification and guidance came from research institutions all over the country. In response to continued questions about the scope and meaning of the policy, DHEW in 1971 produced the Institutional Guide to DHEW Policy on Protection of Human Subjects. Better known as the Yellow Book because of the cover's color, this substantial guide contained both the requirements and commentary on how the requirements were to be understood and implemented. The guide provided that informed consent was to be obtained from anyone who may be at risk as a consequence of participation in research, including both patients and healthy volunteers. As the 1960s progressed, increased discussion of research practices appeared in both professional literature and the popular press. One person who advanced the debate in both arenas was Henry Beecher of Harvard Medical School. Henry Beecher, the Medical Insider, Speaks Out Henry Beecher, as noted in Chapter 2, was an active participant in professional discussions of ethics in research during the late 1950s and early 1960s. In March 1965, Beecher focused attention on the issues at a conference for science journalists sponsored by the Upjohn Pharmaceutical Company. There, Beecher presented a paper discussing 22 examples of potentially serious ethical violations in experiments that he had found in recent issues of medical journals. Among them was the Brooklyn Jewish Chronic Disease Hospital study. He explained this research had not taken place in a remote corner 
but in leading medical schools, university hospitals, top governmental military departments, governmental institutes and industry. He also acknowledged that his own conscience was not entirely clear. Lest I seem to stand aside from these matters, I am obliged to say that in years gone by, work in my laboratory could have been criticized. Beecher also explained the consciousness-raising purpose of these revelations with stark clarity. It is hoped that blunt presentation of these examples will attract the attention of the uninformed or the thoughtless and careless, the great majority of offenders. In making this presentation to a group of journalists, Beecher was clearly breaking with a professional expectation that such matters should be addressed within the biomedical community. After some reservations on the part of medical journals, the March 1965 paper having been rejected by at least the Journal of the American Medical Association, JAMA, Beecher published a revised version in the New England Journal of Medicine in June 1966, that article, like his presentation at the conference, indicted the entire biomedical research community and the journals that published biomedical research results. Beecher's efforts to focus professional, press, and therefore public awareness on the conduct of research involving human subjects met with some success. A July 1965 article in the New York Times Magazine was headlined, Doctors must experiment on humans, but what are the patient's rights? In February 1966, as the PHS issued its first uniform policy for biomedical research, more headlines, this time in the Saturday Review, asked, Do we need new rules for experimentation on people? In July 1966, following Beecher's article in the New England Journal of Medicine, and an editorial in JAMA, another article declared, Experiments on People, the Growing Debate. Thus, by the mid to late 1960s, professional, governmental, and public attention was all being drawn to issues of research on human subjects. Revelations of purportedly unethical treatment of research subjects would not be over by this time, but changes in policy largely driven by attention from so many corners, were beginning to move toward a more comprehensive approach to research oversight. End of Section 20 Recording by Maria Casper Section 21 of Final Report of the Advisory Committee on Human Radiation Experiments This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Final Report of the Advisory Committee on Human Radiation Experiments Ethics of Human Subjects Research, A Historical Perspective, Chapter 3, Part 2 Public Attention is Galvanized, Willowbrook and Tuskegee From 1956 to 1972, Dr. Saul Krugman of New York University led a study team at the Willowbrook State School for the Retarded on Staten Island, New York. The study was not secret or hidden. It was one of the 22 projects Beecher discussed as ethically troublesome in his 1966 article. The Willowbrook study was discovered by the media beginning in the late 1960s and was the subject of further discussion of the case in separate places by Beecher theologian Paul Ramsey, and physician Stephen Goldby. Noting the high incidence of hepatitis among the residents of the school, nearly all of whom were profoundly mentally impaired children and adolescents, Krugman and his colleagues injected some of them with a mild form of hepatitis serum. The researchers justified their work on the grounds that the subjects probably would have become infected anyway, and they hoped to find a prophylaxis for the virus by studying it from the earliest stages of infection. Before beginning the work, Krugman discussed it with many physician colleagues and sought approval from the Armed Forces Epidemiological Board, which approved and funded the research. In 
and the executive faculty of the New York University School of Medicine, who approved the research. A review committee for human experimentation did not exist in 1955, but later, when such a committee was formed, it too approved the research. According to Krugman, the parents of each subject signed a consent form after receiving a detailed explanation of the research without any pressure to enroll their child. Some critics argued that the content of the consent form was itself deceiving, since it seemed to say that the children were to receive a vaccine against the virus. Moreover, charges of coercion arose. It is alleged that the parents who enrolled their children in the study were initially offered more rapid admission to the school through the hepatitis unit, and later found, due to overcrowding, that the only route for admission of new patients was through the hepatitis unit. Commentators further argued that the fault in the doctor's study lay in their deliberate attempt to infect the children, with or without parental consent, as opposed to studying the course of the disease in children who naturally became sick. Soon after Willowbrook, another research project, the Tuskegee Syphilis Study, provoked widespread public outcry when it was revealed the study had exposed people to unnecessary and serious harm with no prospect of direct benefit to them. Beginning in 1932, public health service physicians sought to trace the natural history of syphilis by observing some 400 African-American men affected by the disease and another group of approximately 200 African-American men without syphilis serving as controls. All the subjects lived in or around Tuskegee, Alabama. Originally designed to be a short-term study in the range of six to eight months, some researchers successfully argued that the potential scientific value of longer-term study was so great that the research ought to go on indefinitely. The subjects were enticed into the study with offers of free medical examinations, Many of those who came from around the area to be tested by government doctors had never had a blood test before and had no idea what one was. Once selected to be subjects in the study, the men were not informed as to the nature of their disease or of the fact that the research held no therapeutic benefit for them. Subjects were asked to appear for special free treatments, which included purely diagnostic procedures, such as lumbar punctures. By the mid-1940s, it was becoming clear that the death rate for the infected men in the study was twice as high as for those in the control group. This was the period in which penicillin was discovered, and soon after began to be used to treat syphilis, at least in its primary stage. The study was reviewed by public health service officials and medical societies, and reported by a number of journals from the early 1930s to 1970. In the 1960s, a growing number of criticisms began to appear, although the study was not stopped until 1973. Thus, men with a confirmed disease were not told of their diagnosis and were deceived into participating in the study under the guise of its being therapeutic for unspecified maladies. In addition to exposing the subjects to the additional harms of participation in the study, the false belief that treatment was being administered prevented the subjects from otherwise seeking medical care for their disease. As at Willowbrook, a justification given after the fact for the research was that the disease had appeared in a way that was natural and inevitable and that the study would be of immense benefit to future patients. Over this 40-year history, at least 28 participants died and approximately 100 more suffered blindness and insanity from untreated syphilis before the study was stopped. In 1972, an account of the study was published on the front page of the New York Times. In response, the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare appointed the Tuskegee Syphilis Study Ad Hoc Panel to review the Tuskegee Study, as well as the Department's policies and procedures for the protection of human subjects. The work of the ad hoc panel, which consisted of physicians, a university president, a theologian, an attorney, and a labor representative, contributed in large measure to the passage of the first comprehensive regulations for federally sponsored human subjects research. One member of the ad hoc panel, who is also a member of the advisory committee, 
J. Katz, expressed his dismay over the unwillingness or incapacity of society to mobilize the necessary resources for treatment at the beginning of the study, and the deliberate efforts of the investigators to obstruct the opportunity for treatment. Despite the fact that the Public Health Service policy for the protection of human subjects had been in place for six years by the time the Tuskegee study was revealed, it was exposed by a journalist rather than by the review committee. Although an institutional committee had allegedly reviewed the Tuskegee study, the study was not discontinued until after the recommendation of the ad hoc panel. The human rights abuses of the Tuskegee study demonstrated the need for both prior and ongoing review, in that the study had been undertaken before prior review requirements were in place, and the prevailing review policies during the period of the study were so flawed that the study was allowed to continue. As a result of their deliberations, the ad hoc panel found that neither the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare nor any other agency in the government had adequate policies for oversight of human subjects' research. The panel recommended that the Tuskegee study be stopped immediately and that remaining subjects be given necessary medical care resulting from their participation. The panel also recommended that Congress establish a permanent body with the authority to regulate at least all federally supported research involving human subjects. In summary, the panel concluded that despite the lessons of Nuremberg, the Jewish Chronic Disease Hospital case, and the Declaration of Helsinki, human subject research oversight and mechanisms to ensure informed consent were still inadequate, and new approaches were needed to adequately protect the rights and welfare of human subjects. Congressional Response to the Abuses of Human Subjects, the National Research Act Public attention to abuses such as those inflicted on the subjects of the Tuskegee study increased during the late 1960s and early 1970s. Following the initial revelations about the Tuskegee syphilis study, Several bills were introduced in Congress to regulate the conduct of human experimentation. In February 1973, Senator Edward Kennedy held hearings on these bills, the Tuskegee study, experimentation with prisoners, children, and poor women, and a variety of other issues related to biomedical research and the need for a national body to consider the ethics of research and advancing medical technology. After the hearings, Senator Kennedy introduced an unsuccessful bill to create a National Human Experimentation Board, as recommended by the Tuskegee Syphilis Study Ad Hoc Panel. When it became clear, however, that the bill would not be successful, Senator Kennedy introduced the bill that would become the National Research Act, endorsing the regulations about to be promulgated by the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare, and establishing the National Commission for the Protection of Human Subjects of Biomedical and Behavioral Research, in return for DHEW's issuance of human subject research regulations. The trade-off was clear. No national regulatory body, in return for regulations applying to the research funded or performed by the government agency responsible for the greatest proportion of human subject research, this meant that the goal of oversight of all federally funded research would not be achieved, and that whatever oversight did exist was left to the funding agencies rather than to an independent body. On May 30, 1974, DHEW published regulations for the use of human subjects in the Federal Register. These regulations required that each grantee institution form a committee what became known as an Institutional Review Board, or IRB, to approve all research proposals before they were passed to DHEW for funding consideration. These committees were charged with reviewing the safety of the proposals brought to them, as well as the adequacy of the informed consent obtained from each subject prior to participation in the research. Additionally, the regulations defined not only the procedure for obtaining informed consent, but substantive criteria for it as well. Shortly after the announcement of the DHEW regulations, in July 1974, the National Research Act was passed, and with it came the establishment of the National Commission. The National Commission, 
charged with advising the secretary of DHEW, though the National Research Act did not require the secretary to follow the commission's recommendations, existed over the next four years and published 17 reports and appendix volumes. During its tenure, the commission did pioneering work as it addressed issues of autonomy, informed consent, and third-party permission, particularly in relation to research involving vulnerable subjects such as prisoners, children, and people with cognitive disabilities. It was also charged with examining the IRB system and procedures for informed consent as background for proposing guidelines that would ensure that basic ethical principles were instituted in the research oversight system and in research involving vulnerable populations. In the course of its deliberations, the Commission identified three general moral principles, respect for persons, beneficence, and justice, as the appropriate framework for guiding the ethics of research involving human subjects. These three are known as the Belmont Principles, because they appeared in the Belmont Report, one of the Commission's major publications. The National Commission was required to examine the nature and definition of informed consent, as well as the adequacy of current practices. In its reports, the Commission decisively argued that the basic justification for obligations to obtain informed consent is the moral principle of respect for persons. This emphasis on respect for persons meant a great premium was put on autonomous decision-making by the research subject, an emphasis that continues to the current day. While it may not have been the intent of those who sponsored it, the National Research Act, because it was limited to DHEW-funded research, did not ensure that all federally sponsored research would be subject to requirements for informed consent and prior review. Nonetheless, by this time, as was described below, published policies within the Department of Defense, the Atomic Energy Commission, the Veterans Administration, and NASA did meet these requirements. The passage of the National Research Act and the promulgation of DHEW's regulations were important milestones in the development of federal standards for the protection of human subjects of research. They represented the first national recognition of the need to protect human subjects. Moreover, they attempted to provide for that protection through the IRB requirement and the establishment of the National Commission. The Advisory Committee's charter requires that it examine the standards for research between 1944 and 1974. These two landmark events in 1974 ushered in a new era in which the conduct and oversight of biomedical experimentation with humans remained a topic of national scrutiny and debate. Eventually, the approaches required by the 1974 DHEW regulations would be applied to nearly all federally funded human research, as described in Chapter 14. The Development of Requirements for Human Subject Research in Other Federal Agencies The history and evolution of human subject research policy in the federal government is well documented for the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare. However, many other agencies, most notably the military services, have important but less well-documented and less well-studied histories. Some of this history is described in Chapter 1 of this report. Here we continue with a brief treatment of that history in the context of the evolution of human subject research policy. Army Policy in 1962, the Army, for the first time, issued as a formal regulation, Army Regulation AR-70-25, the 1953 policy embodied in the Wilson Memorandum. The regulation made explicit, as the 1953 Department of Defense and Army policies had only left implicit, basic issues about the scope of the DOD's rules. Unlike the Wilson Memorandum, the new regulation applied to all types of research, not simply that related to atomic, biological, or chemical warfare. However, the regulation specifically excluded clinical research, that is, the research likely to be performed with patients at the Army's many hospitals. In 
In 1963, an ad hoc committee of Army and civilian personnel concluded that the rule applied where research was done by contractors. However, tracer research, which arguably posed minimal risk, was excluded. Despite the committee's recommendations, no immediate changes were made to the regulation. In 1963, however, the Army issued a regulation for radioisotope use that required local institutions to convene review committees and obtain approval from the Secretary of the Army, pursuant to AR-70-25, when radioisotopes were to be used with volunteer experimental subjects. The regulatory void apparently persisted until 1973, when another rule, AR-40-38, Medical Services Clinical Investigation Program, closed the gap. That rule clearly applied to any person who may be at risk because of participation in clinical investigation, including patients and normal individuals. It required that subjects of research be given an explanation of the proposal in understandable language and sign a volunteer agreement. Moreover, clinical research with patients as well as healthy people was to be reviewed by a human use committee. Navy Policy As we saw in Chapter 1, the Navy had required oral consent from research volunteers since at least 1951. Some evidence suggests that written consent was required in the mid-1960s. In a 1964 proposal to study the effects of hypoxia on service personnel, it is indicated that assigned consent to voluntarily participate in research experiment NMRI Form 3 would be used. In 1967, a clear requirement for written consent appeared in the Navy's Medical Department Manual. It is unclear whether the policy drew a distinction between research on patients and research on healthy subjects. In 1969, in any event, the Secretary of the Navy issued a comprehensive policy requiring written informed consent of research subjects, which appeared to cover both groups. Air Force Policy In 1965, the Air Force promulgated AFR 169-8, Medical Education and Research, Use of Volunteers in Aerospace Research, which required voluntary and written informed consent from all subjects in any research, development, test, and evaluation that may involve distress, pain, damage to health, physical injury, or death. As such, it seems inclusive of both healthy and patient subjects. Updating the language of the Nuremberg Code's first principle, the policy was based on the idea that the voluntary informed consent of the human subject is absolutely essential. Additionally, the regulation provided for the appointment of a committee to review all human research proposals at each originating facility. NASA Policy The National Aeronautics and Space Administration, NASA, created in 1958, inherited staff and research expertise from the Department of Defense and other federal agencies. Before 1968, local centers at which research using isotopes was conducted, notably the Ames Research Center and the Manned Spacecraft Center, MSC, were essentially autonomous. Each center established medical use subcommittees as required by AEC rules, Reorganization within NASA in 1968 combined the medical operations functions and the medical research functions at MSC into one Medical Research and Operations Directorate, headed by Dr. Charles A. Berry. By 1968, Ames had a policy of requiring informed consent. By definition, of course, the work of astronauts is frequently risky and experimental, the question of the proper boundary between experimental and occupational activities was one that could not be drawn easily. Consequently, the policy authorized the director of Ames to waive the consent requirement in several instances, including when obtaining consent would seriously hamper the research or when test pilots or astronauts were involved. Between 1968 and 1970, 
prior review for risk and subject consent was adopted at Ames in the form of the Human Research Experiments Review Board, and indirectly at the MSC in accordance with the AEC requirements for a medical use committee. In 1972, the prior review provisions and consent requirements of Ames and the MSC were reformulated in a NASA-wide policy. This policy required voluntary and written informed consent from subjects prior to participation. The policy continued to provide waivers for exceptional cases, as in the Ames policy, and did not apply to research conducted by NASA contractors or grantees. The development of NASA's policies, like those at the Public Health Service, National Institute of Health, and the Department of Defense, appeared at a time when the public was becoming increasingly interested in biomedical research. In contrast with the 1940s and 1950s, bureaucratic developments during the 1960s and 1970s were mirrored by growing public debate about the adequacy of protections for human subjects. End of Section 21. Recording by Maria Casper. Section 22 of Final Report of the Advisory Committee on Human Radiation Experiments. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Final Report of the Advisory Committee on Human Radiation Experiments. Ethics of Human Subjects Research, a Historical Perspective, Chapter 3, Part 3 Supreme Court Dissents Invoke the Nuremberg Code CIA and Department of Defense Human Subjects Research Scandals As we have seen, the development of federal legislation for government-sponsored research with human subjects arose in part because of institutional and governmental concern and public reaction to perceived abuses and failures by the government. Around the same time that the 1974 National Research Act was enacted, a scandal arose surrounding the discovery of secret Cold War chemical experiments conducted by the CIA and Department of Defense. The review of these experiments led to the rediscovery of the previously secret 1953 Wilson Memorandum, and later to the first Supreme Court decision in which comment was made, in dissent, on the application of the Nuremberg Code to the conduct of the U.S. government. In December 1974, the New York Times reported that the CIA had conducted illegal domestic activities, including experiments on U.S. citizens, during the 1960s. That report prompted investigations by both Congress, in the form of the Church Committee, and a presidential commission known as the Rockefeller Commission into the domestic activities of the CIA, the FBI, and intelligence-related agencies of the military. In the summer of 1975, congressional hearings and the Rockefeller Commission report revealed to the public for the first time that the CIA and the Department of Defense had conducted experiments on both cognizant and unwitting human subjects as part of an extensive program to influence and control human behavior through the use of psychoactive drugs, such as LSD and mescaline, and other chemical, biological, and psychological means. They also revealed that at least one subject had died after administration of LSD. Frank Olson, an Army scientist, was given LSD without his knowledge or consent in 1953, as part of a CIA experiment, and apparently committed suicide a week later. Subsequent reports would show that another person, Harold Blower, a professional tennis player in New York City, died as a result of a secret army experiment involving mescaline. The CIA program, known principally by the code name M. Cultra, 
began in 1950 and was motivated largely in response to alleged Soviet, Chinese, and North Korean uses of mind control techniques on U.S. prisoners of war in Korea. Because most of the M. Cultra records were deliberately destroyed in 1973 by order of then Director of Central Intelligence Richard Helms, it is impossible to have a complete understanding of the more than 150 individually funded research projects sponsored by M. Cultra and the related CIA programs. Central Intelligence Agency documents suggest that radiation was part of the M. Cultra program and that the agency considered and explored uses of radiation for these purposes. However, the documents that remain from M. Cultra, at least as currently brought to light, do not show that the CIA itself carried out any of these proposals on human subjects. The Congressional Committee investigating the CIA research, chaired by Senator Frank Church, concluded that prior consent was obviously not obtained from any of these subjects. The committee noted that the experiments sponsored by these researchers call into question the decision by the agencies not to fix guidelines for experiments. Documents show that the CIA participated in at least two of the Department of Defense committees whose discussions in 1952 led up to the issuance of the Wilson Memorandum. Following the recommendations of the Church Committee, President Gerald Ford, in 1976, issued the first Executive Order on Intelligence Activities, which, among other things, prohibited experimentation with drugs on human subjects, except with the informed consent, in writing, and witnessed by a disinterested party, of each such human subject, and in accordance with the guidelines issued by the National Commission. Subsequent orders by Presidents Carter and Reagan expanded the directive to apply to any human experimentation. Following on the heels of the revelations about CIA experiments were similar stories about the Army. In response, in 1975, the Secretary of the Army instructed the Army Inspector General to conduct an investigation among the findings of the Inspector General was the existence of the then-still-classified 1953 Secretary of Defense Wilson Memorandum. In response to the Inspector General's investigation, the Wilson Memorandum was declassified in August 1975. The Inspector General also found that the requirements of the 1953 Memorandum had, at least in regard to Army drug testing, been essentially followed as written. The Army only used volunteers for its drug testing program, with one or two exceptions. However, the Inspector General concluded that the volunteers were not fully informed as required prior to their participation, and the methods of procuring their services in many cases appeared not to have been in accord with the intent of the Department of the Army policies governing the use of volunteers in research. The Inspector General also noted that the evidence clearly reflected that every possible medical consideration was observed by the professional investigators at the medical research laboratories. This conclusion, if accurate, is in striking contrast to what took place at the CIA. The revelations about the CIA and the Army prompted a number of subjects or their survivors to file lawsuits against the federal government for conducting illegal experiments. Although the government aggressively and sometimes successfully sought to avoid legal liability, several plaintiffs did receive compensation through court order, out-of-court settlement, or acts of Congress. Previously, the CIA and the Army had actively and successfully sought to withhold incriminating information, even as they secretly provided compensation to the families. One subject of Army drug experimentation, James Stanley, an Army sergeant, brought an important, albeit unsuccessful, suit. The government argued that Stanley was barred from suing it under a legal doctrine known as the Fears Doctrine, after a 1950 Supreme Court case, Fears v. United States, that prohibits members of the armed forces from suing the government 
for any harms that were inflicted incident to service. In 1987, the Supreme Court affirmed this defense in a 5-4 to four decision that dismissed Stanley's case. The majority argued that a test for liability that depends on the extent to which particular suits would call into question military discipline and decision-making would itself require judicial inquiry into and hence intrusion upon military matters. In dissent, Justice William Brennan argued that the need to preserve military discipline should not protect the government from liability and punishment for serious violations of constitutional rights. The medical trials at Nuremberg in 1947 deeply impressed upon the world that experimentation with unknowing human subjects is morally and legally unacceptable. The United States Military Tribunal established the Nuremberg Code as a standard against which to judge German scientists who experimented with human subjects. In defiance of this principle, military intelligence officials began surreptitiously testing chemical and biological materials, including LSD. Justice Sandra Day O'Connor, writing a separate dissent, stated, No judicially crafted rule should insulate from liability the involuntary and unknowing human experimentation alleged to have occurred in this case. Indeed, as Justice Brennan observes, the United States played an instrumental role in the criminal prosecution of Nazi officials who experimented with human subjects during the Second World War, and the standards that the Nuremberg military tribunals developed to judge the behavior of the defendants stated that the voluntary consent of the human subject is absolutely essential to satisfy moral, ethical, and legal concepts. If this principle is violated, the very least that society can do is to see that the victims are compensated as best they can be by the perpetrators. This is the only Supreme Court case to address the application of the Nuremberg Code to experimentation sponsored by the U.S. government. And while the suit was unsuccessful, dissenting opinions put the army and by association the entire government on notice that the use of individuals without their consent is unacceptable. The limited application of the Nuremberg Code in U.S. courts does not detract from the power of the principles it espouses, especially in light of stories of failure to follow these principles that appeared in the media and professional literature during the 1960s and 1970s, and the policies eventually adopted in the mid-1970s. Conclusion. The 1960s and early 1970s witnessed an extraordinary growth in government, institutional, and public awareness of issues in the use of human subjects, fueled by scandals and an increasing emphasis on individual expression. The branches of the military had articulated policies during this period, in spite of numerous problems in implementation. By 1974, the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare had established a set of regulations and a system of local review, and Congress had established a commission to issue recommendations for further change to the DHEW. Together, these advances created a model and laid the groundwork for human subjects' protections for all federal agencies. Many conditions coalesced into the framework for the regulation of the use of human subjects in federally funded research that is the basis for today's system. Described further in Chapter 14, this framework is undergirded by the three Belmont principles that were identified by the National Commission as governing the ethics of research with human subjects, respect for persons, beneficence, and justice. The federal regulations and the conceptual framework built on the Belmont principles became so widely adopted and cited that it might be argued that their establishment marked the end of serious shortcomings in federal research ethics policies. Whether this position is well supported is evaluated in light of the Advisory Committee's contemporary studies in Part 3. By 1974, DHEW had extensive policies to protect human subjects within its purview, 
policies were more variable among other government agencies. By 1975, the branches of the military set about adopting their own more comprehensive policies for human subject research, and the CIA was required by executive order to comply with consent requirements in human subject research in light of scandalous practices in the past. In order to evaluate the adequacy of the efforts taken to protect people before these policies were established, we must take into account both the government's policies and rules and the norms and practices of medicine reviewed in Chapters 1 through 3. The Advisory Committee's framework for the consideration of these factors is presented in the next chapter. End of Section 22 Recording by Maria Casper. Section 23 of Final Report of the Advisory Committee on Human Radiation Experiments. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Elsie Selwyn. Final Report of the Advisory Committee on Human Radiation Experiments Ethics of Human Subjects Research, a Historical Perspective, Chapter 4, Part 1 According to the mission set out in our charter, the Advisory Committee is in essence a National Ethics Commission. In this capacity, we were obliged to develop an ethical framework for judging the human radiation experiments. This proved to be one of our most difficult tasks, for we were not only dealing with complex events that occurred decades ago, but also with some of the most controversial issues in moral philosophy. This chapter sets out the standards that we believe are appropriate for evaluating human radiation experiments and offers reasons for relying on them. It then applies these standards to the results of the historical research we have conducted and draws ethical conclusions. Fulfilling our charge to determine the ethical and scientific standards and criteria to evaluate human radiation experiments that took place between 1944 and 1974 requires consideration of a complex question. Is it correct to evaluate the events, policies, and practices of the past, in the agents responsible for them, against ethical standards and values that we accept as valid today, but that may not have been widely accepted then? Or must we limit our ethical evaluation of the past to those standards and values that were widely accepted at the time? This is the problem of retrospective moral judgment. Quite apart from the issue of the validity of projecting current standards onto the past, there is another question that this chapter must address. In a pluralistic society such as ours, is there at present a sufficiently broad consensus on ethical standards to make possible a public evaluation that is not simply the arbitrary imposition of one particular moral point of view among several or even many? This is the problem of value pluralism. The ethical framework the advisory committee employs takes both these issues into account. This chapter is divided into two parts. In the first part, we present and defend the ethical framework adopted by the Committee for the Evaluation of Human Radiation Experiments conducted from 1944 to 1974 and the agents responsible for them. We begin by identifying the types of moral judgments with which the Committee is concerned and the different kinds of ethical standards against which these judgments can be made. We next address two challenges to the position that the Advisory Committee can use these or any other standards to make valid ethical judgments. These challenges are 1. That the diversity of views about ethics in American society invalidates any effort by a public body, such as the Advisory Committee, to make moral judgments, and 2. That the diversity of views about ethics across time similarly invalidates our making defensible moral judgments about the past. Although the Committee does not accept these challenges as definitive, we discuss these as well as other factors that influence or limit ethical evaluation. We include here a discussion of an issue of particular relevance to our charge. What role, if any, considerations of national security should play in the committee's ethical framework? We also consider factors that can mitigate the blame we would otherwise place on agents, 
whether individuals or collective entities, for having conducted morally wrong actions. In the second part of the chapter, we explore how the committee's ethical framework can be used to evaluate both experiments conducted in the past and the people and institutions that sponsored and conducted them. Drawing on the history presented in chapters 1 through 3, we illustrate how, when applied, the framework is specified by context and detail. This specification of the framework continues in part 2 of the report when the framework is used to evaluate specific cases. An Ethical Framework Two Types of Moral Judgment For purposes of the committee's charge, there are two main types of moral judgment. Judgments about the moral quality of actions, policies, practices, institutions, and organizations, and judgments about the praiseworthiness or blameworthiness of individual agents, and in some cases entities such as professions and governments, insofar as these can be viewed as collective agents with powers and responsibilities. The first type contains several kinds of judgments. Actions may be judged to be obligatory, wrong, or permissible. Institutions, policies, and practices can be characterized as just or unjust, equitable or inequitable, humane or inhumane. Organizations can be said to be responsible or negligent, fair-dealing or exploitative. The second type of judgment about the praiseworthiness or blameworthiness of agents also contains a diversity of determinations. Agents, whether individual or collective, can be judged to be culpable or praiseworthy for this or that action or policy, to be generous or mean-spirited, responsible or negligent, to respect the moral equality of people, or to discriminate against certain individuals or groups, and so on. Three Kinds of Ethical Standards A recognized way to make moral judgments is to evaluate the facts of a case in the context of ethical standards, the committee identified three kinds of ethical standards as relevant to the evaluation of the human radiation experiments. 1. Basic ethical principles that are widely accepted and generally regarded as so fundamental as to be applicable to the past as well as the present. 2. The policies of government departments and agencies at the time. and 3. Rules of professional ethics that were widely accepted at the time. Basic Ethical Principles Basic ethical principles are general standards or rules that all morally serious individuals accept. The advisory committee has identified six basic ethical principles as particularly relevant to our work. One ought not to treat people as mere means to the ends of others. One ought not to deceive others. One ought not to inflict harm or risk of harm. One ought to promote welfare and prevent harm. One ought to treat people fairly and with equal respect, and one ought to respect the self-determination of others. These principles state moral requirements. They are principles of obligation, telling us what we ought to do. Every principle on this list has exceptions, because every moral principle can justifiably be overridden by other basic principles and circumstances when they conflict. To give priority to one principle over another is not a moral mistake. It is a reality of moral judgment. The justifiability of such judgments depends on many factors in the circumstance. It is not possible to assign priorities to these principles in the abstract. Far more social consensus exists about the acceptability of these basic principles than exists about any philosophical, religious, or political theory of ethics. This is not surprising, given the central social importance of morality and the fact that its precepts are embraced in some form by virtually all major ethical theories and traditions. These principles are at the deepest level of any person's commitment to a moral way of life. It is important to emphasize that the validity of these basic principles is not typically thought of as limited by time. We commonly judge agents in the past by these standards. For example, the passing of 50 years in no way changes the fact that Hitler's extermination of millions of people was wrong, nor does it erase or even diminish his culpability, nor would the passing of a hundred years, or a thousand, do so. This is not to deny that it might be inappropriate to apply to the distant past some ethical principles to which we now subscribe. It is only to note that there are some principles so basic that we ordinarily assume, with good reason, 
that they are applicable to the past as well as the present, and will be applicable in the future as well. We regard these principles as basic because any minimally acceptable ethical standpoint must include them. Policies of Government Departments and Agencies The policies of departments and agencies of the government can be understood as statements of commitment on the part of those governmental organizations, and hence of individuals in them, to conduct their affairs according to the rules and procedures that constitute those policies. In this sense, policies create ethical obligations. When a department or agency adopts a particular policy, it in effect promises to make reasonable efforts to abide by it. At least where participation in the organization is voluntary, and where the organization's defining purpose is morally legitimate, it is not, for example, a criminal organization, to assume a role in the organization is to assume the obligations that attach to that role. Depending upon their roles in the organization, particular individuals may have a greater or lesser responsibility for helping to ensure that the policy commitments of the organization are honored. For example, high-level managers who formulate organizational policies have an obligation to take reasonable steps to ensure that these policies are effectively implemented. If they fail to discharge those obligations, they have done wrong and are blameworthy unless some extenuating circumstance absolves them of responsibility. One sort of extenuating circumstance is that the policy in question is unethical. In that case, we would hold an individual blameless for not attempting to implement it, at least if the individual did so because of recognition that the policy was unethical. Moreover, we might praise the individual for attempting an institutional reform at some professional or personal risk. Different types of organizations have different defining purposes, and these differences determine the character of the department's or agency's role-derived obligations. All government organizations have special responsibilities to act impartially and to fairly protect all citizens, including the most vulnerable ones. These special obligations constitute a standard for evaluating the conduct of government officials. Rules of Professional Ethics Professions traditionally assume responsibilities for self-regulation including the promulgation of certain standards to which all members are supposed to adhere. These standards are of two kinds, technical standards that establish the minimum conditions for competent practice, and ethical principles that are intended to govern the conduct of members in their practice. In exchange for exercising this responsibility, society implicitly grants professions a degree of autonomy. The privilege of this autonomy in turn creates special obligations for the profession's members. These obligations function as constraints on professionals to reduce the risk that they will use their special power and knowledge to the detriment of those whom they are supposed to serve. Thus, physicians, whose special knowledge gives them opportunities for exploiting patients or breaching confidentiality, are obligated to act in the patient's best interests in general and to follow various prescriptions for minimizing conflicts of interests. Unlike basic ethical principles that speak to the whole of moral life, Rules of professional ethics are particularized to the practices, social functions, and relationships that characterize a profession. Rules of professional ethics are often justified by appeal to basic ethical principles. For example, as we discuss later in this chapter, the obligation to obtain informed consent, which is the rule of research in medical ethics, is grounded in principles of respect for self-determination, the promotion of others' welfare, and the non-infliction of harm. In one respect, rules of professional ethics are like the policies of institutions and organizations. They express commitments to which their members may be rightly held by others. That is, rules of professional ethics express the obligations that collective entities impose on their members and constitute a commitment to the public that the members will abide by them. Absent some special justification, failure to honor the commitment to fulfill these obligations constitutes a wrong. To the extent that the profession as a collective entity has obligations of self-regulation, failure to fulfill these obligations can lead to judgments of collective blame. Ethical Pluralism and the Convergence of Moral Positions Although we have argued that there is broad agreement about an acceptance of basic ethical principles in the United States, such as principles that enjoin us to promote the welfare of others and to respect self-determination, 
People nevertheless disagree about the relative priority or importance of these principles in the moral life. For example, although any minimally acceptable ethical standpoint must include both these principles, some approaches to morality emphasize the importance of respecting self-determination, while others place a higher priority on duties to promote welfare. These differences in approaches to morality pose a problem for public moral discourse. How can a public body such as the advisory committee purport to speak on behalf of society as a whole and at the same time respect this diversity of views about ethics? The key to understanding how this is possible is to appreciate that different ethical approaches can and often do converge on the same ethical conclusions. People can agree about what ought to be done without necessarily appealing to the same moral arguments to defend their common position. This phenomenon of convergence has been observed in the work of other public bodies whose charge was to make ethical evaluations on research involving human subjects, including the National Commission for the Protection of Human Subjects of Biomedical and Behavioral Research and the President's Commission for the Study of Ethical Problems in Medicine and Biomedical and Behavioral Research. For example, both those who take the viewpoint that emphasizes obligations to promote welfare and to refrain from inflicting harm, and those who accord priority to self-determination can agree that law and medical and research practice should recognize a right to informed consent for competent individuals. The argument for a requirement of informed consent based on promoting welfare and refraining from inflicting harm assumes that individuals are generally most interested in and knowledgeable about their own well-being. Individuals are thus in the best position to discern what will promote their welfare, and generally most when deciding about participation in research or medical care. Allowing physicians or others to decide for them runs too great a risk of harm or loss of benefits. By contrast, an approach based on self-determination assumes that, at least for competent individuals, being able to make important decisions concerning one's own life and health is intrinsically valuable, independent of its contribution to promoting one's well-being. The most compelling case for recognizing a right of informed consent for competent subjects and patients draws upon both lines of justification, emphasizing that this requirement is necessary from the perspective of self-determination considered as valuable in itself, and from the standpoint of promoting welfare and refraining from doing harm. Therefore, although people may have different approaches to the moral life, which reflect different priorities among basic moral principles, these differences need not result in a lack of consensus on social policy, or even on particular moral rules, such as the rule that competent individuals ought to be allowed to accept or refuse participation in experiments. On the contrary, the fact that the same moral rules or social policies can be grounded in different basic moral principles and points of view greatly strengthens the case for their public endorsement by official bodies charged to speak for society as a whole. The three kinds of ethical standards upon which the committee relies for our ethical evaluations the basic moral principles, government policies, and rules of professional ethics also enjoy a broad consensus. They are not idiosyncratic to a particular ethical value system. Thus, it would be a mistake to think that in order to fulfill our charge of ethical evaluation, the advisory committee must assume that there is only one uniquely correct ethical standpoint. A broad range of views can acknowledge that the medical profession should be held accountable for moral rules it publicly professes, and that individual physicians can be held responsible for abiding by these rules of professional ethics. Likewise, regardless of whether one believes that the ultimate justification for government policies is the goal of promoting welfare and minimizing harms, or respect for self-determination, one can agree that policies represent commitments to actions and hence generate obligations. Moreover, any plausible ethical viewpoint will recognize that when individuals assume roles in organizations, they thereby undertake role-derived obligations. We have already argued that the basic ethical principles that we employ in evaluating experiments are widely accepted and command significant allegiance not only from our contemporaries, but also from reflective and morally sensitive individuals and ethical traditions in the past. It would be very implausible to construe any of them as parochial or controversial. Retrospective moral judgment and the challenge of relativism. Some may still have reservations about the project of evaluating the ethics of decisions and actions that occurred several decades ago. The worry is that it is somehow inappropriate, if not muddled, to apply currently accepted standards to earlier periods when they were not accepted 
recognized, or viewed as matters of obligation. This is an important worry, though one that does not apply to our framework. The position that the values and principles of today cannot be validly applied to past situations in which they may not have been accepted is called historical ethical relativism. This is the thesis that moral judgments across time are invalid because moral judgments can be justified only by reference to a set of shared values, and the values of a society change over time. According to this view, one historical period differs from another by virtue of lacking the relevant values contained in the other historical period, namely those that support or justify the particular moral judgments in question. Understood in this way, historical ethical relativism if true, would explain why some retrospective moral judgments are invalid, namely, where the past society about which the judgments are made lack the values that, in our time, support our judgments. In other words, the claim is that moral judgments made about actions and agents in one period of history cannot be made from the perspective of the values of another historical period. The question of whether historical ethical relativism limits the validity of retrospective moral judgment is not a mere theoretical puzzle for moral philosophers. It is an eminently practical question, since how we answer it has direct and profound implications for what we ought to do now. Most obviously, the position we adopt on the validity of retrospective moral judgment will determine whether we should honor claims that people now make for remedies for historical injustices allegedly perpetrated against themselves or their ancestors. Similarly, we must know whether there is any special circumstance resulting from the historical context in which the responsible parties acted that mitigates whatever blame would be appropriate. We return to this question later in the chapter. In addition, something even more fundamental is at stake in the debate over retrospective moral judgment, the possibility of moral progress. The idea of moral progress makes sense only if it is possible to make moral judgments about the past and to make them by appealing to some of the same moral standards that we apply to the present. Unless we can apply the same moral yardstick to the past and the present, we cannot meaningfully say either that there has been moral progress or that there has not. For example, unless some retrospective moral judgments are valid, we cannot say that the abolition of slavery is a case of moral progress moral regression, or either one. More specifically, unless we can say that slavery was wrong, we cannot say that the abolition of slavery was a moral improvement. For these and other reasons, the acceptance of historical ethical relativism has troubling implications. But even if we were to accept historical ethical relativism as the correct position, it would not follow from this alone that there is anything improper about making judgments about radiation experiments conducted decades ago based on the three kinds of ethical standards the committee has identified. Two of these standards, government policies and rules of professional ethics, are standards used at the time the experiments were conducted. Neither of these kinds of standards involves projecting current cultural values onto a different cultural milieu. We have already argued that basic ethical principles, the third kind of standard adopted by the committee, are not temporally limited. Although there have been changes in ethical values in the United States between the mid-1940s and the present, it is implausible that these changes involve the rejection or affirmation of principles so basic as that it is wrong to treat people as mere means, wrong to inflict harm, or wrong to deceive people. Thus, the Advisory Committee's evaluation of the human radiation experiments in light of these basic principles is based on a simple, and we think reasonable, assumption that, even 50 years ago, these principles were pervasive features of moral life in the United States that were widely recognized and accepted, much as we recognize and accept them today. End of section 23. Recording by Elsie Selwyn. Section 24 of Final Report of the Advisory Committee on Human Radiation Experiments. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Elsie Selwyn. Final Report of the Advisory Committee on Human Radiation Experiments. Ethics of Human Subjects Research, A Historical Perspective, Chapter 4, Part 2.
Factors that influence or limit ethical evaluation. Several considerations influence and can limit the ability to reach ethical conclusions about rightness and wrongness and praise and blame. Some of these may be more likely to be present in efforts to evaluate the past, but all can arise when attempts are made to evaluate contemporary events as well. The most important such limitations relevant to the advisory committee's evaluations are these. 1. Lack of evidence as to whether ethical standards were followed or violated, and if so, by whom. And 2. The presence of conflicting obligations. The three kinds of ethical standards adopted by the committee can yield the conclusion that an individual or collective agent had or has a particular obligation. But this conclusion is not by itself sufficient to determine in any particular case whether anything wrong was done or whether any individual or collective agent deserves blame. Lack of evidence. Sound valuations cannot be made without sufficient evidence. Sometimes it cannot be determined if anything wrong was done because key facts about a case are missing or unclear. Other times, there may be sufficient evidence that a wrong was done, but insufficient evidence to determine who performed the action that was wrong, or who authorized the policy that was wrong, or who was responsible for a practice that was wrong. This is why the advisory committee strove during our tenure to reconstruct the details of the circumstances under which the human radiation experiments themselves took place. However, these records are incomplete, and even the copious documentation we have gathered does not tell as complete a story as sometimes was needed to make ethical evaluations. Conflicting Obligations Because we all have more than one obligation, because they can conflict with one another, and because some obligations are weightier than others, a particular obligation that is otherwise morally binding may not be binding in a particular circumstance, all things considered. For example, a government official might be obligated to follow certain routine procedures, but in a time of dire emergency, he or she might have a weightier obligation to avert great harm to many people by taking direct action that disregards the procedures. Similarly, a physician is obligated to keep his patient's condition confidential, but in some cases it is permissible and even obligatory to breach this confidence, for example, in order to prevent the spread of deadly infectious diseases. In such cases, the agent has done nothing wrong in failing to do what he or she would ordinarily be morally obligated to do. That obligation has been validly overridden by what is in the particular circumstances a weightier obligation. The presence of conflicting obligations may limit our ability to make moral judgments when, for example, it is difficult to determine in a particular case which obligation should take precedence. At the same time, however, if it can be determined which obligation is weightier, then the presence of this factor does not serve as an impediment to evaluation. Rather, it can lead to the conclusion that nothing morally wrong was done and that no one should be blamed. An example of a potentially overriding obligation that is especially important for the advisory committee's work is the possibility that, during the period of the radiation experiments, obligations to protect national security were sometimes more morally weighty than obligations to comply with standards for human subjects research. If the threat were great enough, considerations of national security grounded in the basic ethical principle that one ought to promote welfare and prevent harm could justifiably override the basic ethical principle of not using people as mere means to the ends of others, as well as the more specific rule of research ethics requiring the voluntary consent of human subjects. Had such an overriding obligation to protect national security existed during the period we studied, it also would have relieved responsible individuals of any blame otherwise attributable to them for using individuals in experiments that were crucial to the national defense. Especially during the late 1940s and early 1950s, and then again in the first years of the early 1960s, our country was engaged in an intense competition with the Soviet Union. A high premium was placed upon military superiority, not only in conventional warfare, but also in atomic, biological, and chemical warfare. The DOD's Wilson Memorandum, when originally promulgated in 1953, declared that it was directed toward the need to pursue atomic, biological, and chemical warfare experiments 
for defensive purposes in these fields. It would not be surprising, therefore, to discover that, in the government's policies and rules for human subject research, provisions had been made for the possibility that obligations to protect national security might conflict with and take priority over obligations to protect human subjects, and thus that such policies would have included exceptions for national security needs. The moral justification would also not be surprising that, in order to preserve the American way of life with its precious freedoms, some sacrifices of individual rights and interests would have to be made for the greater good. The very phrase, Cold War, expressed the conviction that we already were engaged in a life-or-death struggle, and that in war actions may be permissible that would be impermissible in peacetime. Survival in the treacherous and heavily armed post-World War II era might demand no less, repugnant as those actions otherwise might be to many Americans. The advisory committee did not undertake an inquiry to determine whether during either World War II or the Cold War there were ever circumstances in which considerations of national security might have justified infringements of their rights and protections that would otherwise be enjoyed by American citizens in the context of human experimentation. Our sources for answering this question were limited to materials pertinent to specific human radiation experiments and declassified defense-related memorandums and transcripts. With regard to the experiments, particular cases are reviewed in Part 2 of this report, and those experiments that took place under circumstances most closely tied to national security considerations, such as the plutonium injections, see Chapter 5, it does not appear that such considerations would have barred satisfying the basic elements of voluntary consent. Thus, for instance, although the word plutonium was classified until the end of World War II, subjects could still have been asked their permission after having been told that subjects in the experiment would be injected with a radioactive substance with which medical science had had little experience and which might be dangerous, and that would not help them personally, but that the experiment was important to protecting the health of the people involved in the war effort or safeguarding the national defense. With regard to defense-related documents, in none of the memorandums or transcripts of various agencies did we encounter a formal national security exception to conditions under which human subjects may be used. In none of these materials does an official, military or civilian, argue for the position that individual rights may be justifiably overridden owing to the needs of the nation in the Cold War. And none of them is an official position expressed that the Nuremberg Code or other conventions concerning human subjects could be overridden because of national security needs. Some government officials, military and civilian, may have personally advocated the view that obligations to protect national security were more important than obligations to protect the rights and interests of human subjects. It is, of course, possible that the priority placed on national security was so great in some circles of the government that the ability of security interests to override other national interests was implicitly assumed rather than explicitly articulated. It is a matter of historical record that some initiatives undertaken by government officials at some agencies during this period adopted the view that greater national purposes justified the exploitation of individuals. Notorious examples are the CIA's MKULTRA project and the Army's psychochemical experiments, which subjected unsuspecting people to experiments with LSD and other substances. See Chapter 3. However, even the internal investigation of the Department of Defense into these incidents in the 1970s concluded that these incidents were violations of government policy, not recognize legitimate exceptions to it. During the era of the Manhattan Project, the United States and its allies were engaged in a declared and just war against the Axis powers. Regarding the possibility of a wartime exception, it is well documented that during World War II, the Committee on Medical Research, CMR, of the Executive Office of the President funded research on various problems confronting U.S. troops in the field including dysentery, malaria, and influenza. This research involved the use of many subjects whose capacity to consent to be a volunteer was questionable at best, including children, the mentally retarded, and prisoners.
However, when the CMR considered proposed gonorrhea experiments that would have involved deliberately exposing prisoners to infection, the resulting discussion about the ethics of research exhibited a cautious attitude. The conclusion was that only volunteers could be used, and that they had to be carefully informed about the risks and benefits of participation. In these and other classified conversations, the CMR took the position that care is to be taken with human subjects, including conscientious objectors and military personnel. It is difficult to reconcile these deliberations with the fact that many subjects of CMR-funded research were not true volunteers. Whether the CMR believed that the needs of a country at war justified the use of people who could not be true volunteers as research subjects is not known. It would, however, be an error to conclude that even in contexts where important national security interests are at stake, such as during wartime, a conflict between obligations to protect national defense and obligations to protect human subjects ought always to be resolved in favor of national security. The question of whether any and all means are morally acceptable for the sake of national security and the national defense is a complex one. Even in the case of a representative democracy that is not an aggressor, it would be wrong to assume that there are no moral constraints in time of war. All of the major religious and secular traditions concerning the morality of warfare recognize that there are substantial limitations upon the manner in which even a just war is conducted. The issue of the morality of total warfare for a just cause, including the use of medical science, was beyond the scope of the advisory committee's charter, deliberations, and expertise. Distinguishing between the wrongness of actions and policies and the blameworthiness of agents. Factors that influence or limit judgments about blame. The factors we have just discussed, lack of evidence and the presence of conflicting obligations, place limits on our ability to make judgments about both the rightness and wrongness of actions and the blameworthiness of the agents responsible for them. Some factors, however, place limits only on our ability to make judgments about the blameworthiness of agents. Even in cases where actions or policies are clearly morally wrong, it may be uncertain how blameworthy the agents who conducted or promulgated them are, or in fact whether they are blameworthy at all. Some factors make it difficult to affix blame. Other factors can mitigate or lessen the blame actors deserve. Four such factors are of particular concern to the committee. 1. Factual ignorance. 2 culturally induced ignorance about relevant moral considerations. 3. Evolution in the interpretations and specification of moral principles. And 4. Indeterminacy in an organization's division of labor, with the result that it is unclear who has responsibility for implementing the commitments of the organization. Factual Ignorance Factual ignorance refers to circumstances in which some information relevant to the moral assessment of a situation is not available to the agent. There are many reasons that this may be so, including that the information in question is beyond the scope of human knowledge at the time, or that there was no good reason to think that a particular item of information was relevant or significant. However, just because an agent's ignorance of morally relevant information leads him or her to commit a morally wrong act, it does not follow that the person is not blameworthy for that act. The agent is blameworthy if a reasonable, prudent person in that agent's position should have been aware that some information was required prior to action, and the information could have been obtained without undue effort or cost on his or her part. Some people are in positions that obligate them to make special efforts to acquire knowledge, such as those who are directly responsible for the well-being of others. Determinations of culpable and non-culpable factual ignorance often turn on whether the competent person in the field at that time had that knowledge or had the means to acquire it without undue burdens. Culturally Induced Moral Ignorance Sometimes cultural factors can prevent individuals from discerning what they are morally required to do and can therefore mitigate the blame we would otherwise place on individuals for failing to do what they ought to do. In some cases, these factors may have been at work in the past, but are no longer operative in the present because of changes in culture over time. An individual may, like other members of the culture, be morally ignorant. Because of features of his or her deeply enculturated beliefs, the individual may be unable to recognize, for example, that certain people, 
such as members of another race, deserve equal respect, or even that they are people with rights. Moral ignorance can impair moral judgment and hence may result in a failure to act morally. In extreme cases, a culture may instill a moral ignorance so profound that we speak of cultural moral blindness. In some societies, the dominant culture may recognize that it is wrong to exploit people, but fail to recognize certain classes of individuals as being people. Some of those committed to the ideology of slavery may have been morally blind in just this way, and their culture may have induced this blindness. Here it is crucial to distinguish between culpable and non-culpable moral ignorance. The fact that one's moral ignorance is instilled by one's culture does not by itself mean that one is not responsible for being ignorant, nor does it necessarily render one blameless for actions or omissions that result from this ignorance. What matters is not whether the erroneous belief that constitutes the moral ignorance was instilled by one's culture. What matters is the extent to which the individual can be held responsible for maintaining this belief, as opposed to correcting it. Where opportunities for remedying culturally induced moral ignorance are available, a person may rightly be held responsible for remaining in ignorance and for the wrongful behavior that issues from his or her mistaken beliefs. People who maintain their culturally induced moral ignorance in the face of repeated opportunities for correction typically do so by indulging in unjustifiable rationalizations, such as those associated with racist attitudes. They show an excessive partiality to their own opinions and interests, a willful rejection of facts that they find inconvenient or disturbing, an inflated sense of their own self-worth relative to others, a lack of sensitivity to the predicament of others, and the like. These moral failings are widely recognized as such across a broad spectrum of cultural values and ethical traditions, both religious and secular. Only if an agent could not be reasonably expected to remedy his or her culturally induced moral ignorance would such ignorance exculpate his conduct. But even in cases in which the individual could not be blamed for persisting in ignorance, this would do nothing to show that the actions or omissions resulting from his or her ignorance were not wrong. Non-culpable moral ignorance only exculpates the agent. It does not make the wrong acts right. Evolution and Interpretation of Ethical Principles There is another respect in which the dependence of our perceptions of right and wrong on our cultural context has a bearing on the advisory committee's evaluations. While basic ethical principles do not change, interpretations and applications of basic ethical principles as they are expressed in more specific rules of conduct do evolve over time through processes of cultural change. Recognizing that more specific moral rules do change has implications for how we judge the past. For example, the current requirement of informed consent is the result of evolution, acceptance of the simple idea that medical treatment requires the consent of the patient, at least in the case of competent adults, seems to have proceeded by a considerable interval, the more complex notion that informed consent is required. Furthermore, the notion of informed consent itself has undergone refinement and development through common law rulings, through analyses and explanations of these rulings in the scholarly legal literature, through philosophical treatments of the key concepts emerging from legal analyses, and through guidelines and reports by government and professional bodies. For example, as early as 1914, the duty to obtain consent to medical treatment was established in American law. Every human being of adult years and sound mind has the right to determine what shall be done with his own body, and a surgeon who performs an operation without his patient's consent commits an assault. End quote. However, it was not until 1957 that the courts decreed that consent must be informed, and this 1957 ruling was only the beginning of a long debate about what it means for consent to be informed. Thus, it is probably fair to say that the current understanding of informed consent is more sophisticated, and what is required of physicians and scientists more demanding than both the preceding requirement of consent and earlier interpretations of what counts as informed consent. As the content of the concept has evolved, so has the scope of the corresponding obligation on the part of the professionals. For this reason, it would be inappropriate to blame clinicians or researchers of the 1940s and 1950s 
of not adhering to the details of a standard that emerged through a complex process of cultural change that was to span decades. At the same time, however, it remains appropriate to hold them to the general requirements of the basic moral principles that underlie informed consent, not treating others as mere means, promoting the welfare of others, and respecting self-determination, inferring bureaucratic responsibilities. It is often unclear in complex organizations such as government agencies who has the responsibility for implementing the organization's policies and rules. This is particularly common in new and changing organizations, where it is more likely than in stable organizations that there will be interconnecting lines of authority among employees and officials and job descriptions that are not explicit with respect to responsibility for implementation of policies and initiatives. When policies are not properly implemented in organizations that fit this description, it often is difficult to assign blame to particular individuals. An employee or official of an agency cannot fairly be blamed for a failed or poorly executed policy unless it can be determined with confidence that the person had responsibility for implementing that policy and should have known that he or she had this responsibility. The importance of distinguishing wrongdoing from blameworthiness Judgments of wrongdoing and judgments of blameworthiness have very different implications. Even where a wrong was done, it does not follow that anyone should be blamed for the wrong. This is because there are factors, including the four we have just described, that can lessen or remove blame from an agent for a morally wrong act, but that cannot in any way make the wrong act right. If experiments violated basic ethical principles, institutional or organizational policies, or rules of professional ethics, then they were and will always be wrong. Whether and how much anyone should be blamed for these wrongs are separate questions. The distinction between the moral status of experiments and that of the individuals who are involved with conducting, funding, or sponsoring them also has important implications for our own time. For a society to make moral progress, individuals must be able to exercise moral judgment about their actions. It is important for social actors to be critical about their activities, even those in which they have been engaged for some time. It is important for them to be able to step back and analyze their actions as right or wrong. If we did not distinguish between actions and agents, then people may feel that, once they have perceived their moral error, it is too late for them to change their ways, to object to the ongoing activity, and to try to rally others in support of reform. For any generation to initiate morally indicated reforms, it must be able to take this critical stance. As we see in part three of this report, even now there are aspects of our society's use of human subjects that should be critically examined. The actions we ourselves have performed do not condemn us as moral agents unless we refuse to open ourselves to the possibility that we have in some ways been in error. As we have said, even if we are exculpated by our own culturally induced moral ignorance, that does not make our wrong acts right. Even if we must accept a measure of blame for our actions, we are free to achieve a critical assessment and to initiate and participate in needed change. The Significance of Judgments About Blameworthiness the committee believes that its first task is to evaluate the rightness or wrongness of the actions, practices, and policies involved in the human radiation experiments that occurred from 1944 to 1974. However, it is also important to consider whether judgments ascribing blame to individuals or groups or organizations can responsibly be made and whether they ought to be made. There are three main reasons for judging culpability as well as wrongness. First, a crucial part of the committee's task is to make recommendations that will reduce the risk of errors and abuses in human experimentation in the future on the basis of its diagnoses of what went wrong in the past. A complete and accurate diagnosis requires not only stating what wrongs were done, but also explaining who was responsible for the wrongs occurring. To do this is likely to yield the judgment that some individuals were morally blameworthy, Second, unless judgments of culpability are made about particular individuals, one important means of deterring future wrongs will be precluded. 
People contemplating unethical behavior will presumably be more likely to refrain from it, other things being equal if they believe that they, as individuals, may be held accountable for wrongdoing than if they can assure themselves that at most their government or their particular government agency or their profession may be subject to blame. Third, ethical evaluation generally involves both evaluation of the rightness or wrongness of actions and the praiseworthiness or blameworthiness of agents. In the absence of any explicit exemption of the latter sorts of judgment in our mandate, the committee believes it would be arbitrary to exclude them. Having made a case for judgments of culpability as well as wrongness, the committee believes it is very important to distinguish carefully between judging that an individual is culpable for a particular action and judging that he or she is a person of bad moral character. Justifiable judgments of character must be based on accurate information about long-standing and stable patterns of action in a number of areas of a person's life under a variety of different situations. Such patterns cannot usually be inferred from information about a few isolated actions a person performs in one particular department of his or her life unless the actions are so extreme as to be on the order of heinous crimes. End of section 24. Section 25 of Final Report of the Advisory Committee on Human Radiation Experiments. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Elsie Selwyn. Final Report of the Advisory Committee on Human Radiation Experiments. Ethics of Human Subjects Research, A Historical Perspective, Chapter 4, Part 3. Applying the Ethical Framework. The three kinds of standards presented in this chapter provide a general framework for evaluating the ethics of human radiation experiments. In this section of the chapter, we revisit those standards in the specific context of human radiation experiments conducted between 1944 and 1974, and what we have learned about the policies and practices involving human subjects during that period. Basic Ethical Principles Earlier in this chapter, we identified six basic ethical principles as particularly relevant to our work. One ought not to treat people as mere means to the ends of others. One ought not to deceive others. One ought not to inflict harm or risk of harm. One ought to promote welfare and prevent harm. One ought to treat people fairly and with equal respect. And one ought to respect the self-determination of others. These principles are central to our analysis of the cases we present in Part 2 of the report, although not every case we evaluate engages every principle. Two of the principles, however, recur repeatedly as we consider the ethics of past experiments. These are, one ought not to treat people as mere means to the ends of others, and one ought not to inflict harm or risk of harm. Whether an experiment involving human subjects violates the principle not to use people as mere means generally depends on two factors. Consent and therapeutic intent. An individual may give his or her consent to being treated as a means to the ends of others. If a person freely consents, then he or she is no longer being used as a mere means, that is, as a means only. Thus, if a person is used as a subject in an experiment from which the person cannot possibly benefit directly, but the person's consent to that use is obtained, the person is not being used as a mere means to the ends of others. By contrast, if a person is used as a subject in such an experiment, but the person's consent is not obtained for that use, the person is being used as a mere means to the ends of the investigator conducting the experiment and the institutions funding or sponsoring the experiment. If an action that involves the use of a person is undertaken in whole or in part for that person's benefit, then the person is not being used as a mere means toward the ends of others. Thus, if a person is used as a subject in an experiment that is intended to offer the subject a prospect of direct benefit, then, even if the subject's consent has not been obtained, the subject is not being used as a mere means to the ends of others. This is because the experiment is intended to serve the subject's interests as well as the interests of the investigator and funding agency. It may be wrong not to obtain the subject's consent in this case, but the wrong does not stem from a violation of the principle not to use people as mere means. Instead, the wrong reflects the violation of other basic principles, such as the principles enjoining us to respect self-determination and to promote welfare and prevent harm.
These two factors, the obtaining of consent and an intention to benefit, also can transform the moral quality of an action that involves the imposition of harm or risk of harm. One important way to make the imposition of a risk of harm justifiable is to obtain the person's permission for the imposition. The imposition of risk on a person also is more justifiable when the risk is imposed to secure a benefit for that person, although even in the presence of a prospect of offsetting benefit, the imposition of a risk on another without the person's consent is morally questionable because it appears to violate the principle of respect for self-determination. Consider the following example of how the factors of therapeutic intent and consent can transform a morally questionable act into a morally acceptable one. Patients are enrolled in an experiment in which they are given a new drug that is unproven in humans, induces substantial discomfort or even suffering, and may produce irreversible damage to vital organs. There is, however, no effective treatment for the condition from which these patient subjects suffer, and the condition is life-threatening. The drug is theoretically promising compared with related drugs used in similar diseases, and it has proven effective in animals. Further, the opportunity to participate in the experiment is offered to patients while they are lucid, comfortable, and at ease. Under these circumstances, the imposition of harm may be transformed into a caring and respectful act. Policies of Government Agencies Where agencies of the government had policies on the conduct of research involving human subjects, and where the policies included requirements or rules that are morally sound, these policies constitute standards against which the conduct of the agencies and the people who work there, as well as the experiments the agency sponsored or conducted, can be evaluated. Government agencies must be held responsible for failures to implement their own policies. To do otherwise is to break faith with the American people, who have a reasonable expectation that an agency will conduct its affairs in accord with the agency's stated policies. As we noted in Chapter 1, it is not always clear, however, whether statements made in letters or memorandums constitute agency policy. When there is little evidence that a statement by a government official was ever implemented, it is often difficult to determine whether this was an instance of an agency failing to implement its own policies, or an instance where a statement by a government official was not perceived as agency policy in the first place. Among the general conclusions that can be drawn from the discussions about policies during the late 1940s and early 1950s is that the AEC, DOD, and NIH required investigators to obtain the consent of the healthy or normal subject, and prior group review was required for risk in research using radioisotopes for all private and publicly financed research, and in the NIH for all hazardous procedures. Also, in 1953, the Department of Defense adopted the Nuremberg Code as the policy for research related to atomic, biological, and chemical warfare, and the NIH Clinical Center articulated a consent requirement for patient subjects in intramural research. See Chapter 1. Two questions that arise at this juncture are whether an experiment was wrong if it violated one of these policies, but took place at another government agency, and whether an experiment was wrong if it took place under the auspices of an agency before it promulgated the policy. The answers to both questions is the same. Even if such an experiment was not wrong according to the policy of the agency sponsoring the experiment at the time, the experiment may nevertheless have been ethical based on one or more basic ethical principles or rules of professional ethics. As is the case today, decades ago, government officials had obligations to take reasonable steps to see that policies were adequately implemented. Policies constitute organizational commitments, and organizational commitments generate obligations on the part of the organization and its members. In some cases, however, it is not clear that conditions stated by individual officials rise to a level that all would be comfortable calling policies. Accordingly, it is not clear whether corresponding obligations to implement can be inferred. The two letters signed by AEC General Manager Carol Wilson in April and November 1947 are the best examples of this problem. Nevertheless, if it is correct to say that high officials have an obligation to exert due efforts to implement and communicate the rules they are empowered to establish, then they may reasonably be blamed for failures in this regard. Further, if they do not even attempt to articulate rules that are indicated by basic ethical principles and that are clearly relevant to organizational activities that fall under their authority, they are also subject to moral blame.
The mitigating condition of culturally induced moral ignorance does not apply to government officials who fail to exercise their responsibilities to implement or communicate requirements that clearly fell within the ambit of their office and of which they were aware. The very fact that these requirements were articulated by the agencies in which they worked is evidence that officials could not have been morally ignorant of them. We have observed, however, that, especially with regard to research involving patients, policies were frequently unclear. When this research offered patient subjects a chance to benefit medically, the widespread discretion granted physicians to make decisions on behalf of their patients is a mitigating factor in judging the blameworthiness of government officials for failing to impose consent requirements on physician investigators. This failure could be attributed to a cultural moral ignorance concerning the proper limits to the authority of physicians over their patients. The same cannot be said of government officials for failing to impose consent requirements on physician investigators who used patient subjects in research from which the patients could not benefit medically. This use of human subjects took place outside of the therapeutic context that defines the doctor-patient relationship and therefore also was outside of the authority then ceded to physicians. In this case, responsible agency officials had already analogued to healthy subjects for whom there was a lengthy tradition of policies and rules requiring the use of volunteers and the obtaining of consent. Government officials could and should have perceived the morally identical nature of these cases, that without consent both cases involved violation of the principle not to use people as mere means to the ends of others. Those who were ill should have been granted the same protection as those who were well. In contrast to requirements for consent, requirements intended to ensure that risks to experimental subjects were acceptable were far more clearly stated. Government officials are blameworthy if they permitted research to continue that was known to entail unusual risks to the subjects and direct violation of agency policy. Finally, some lessons that can be drawn from the experience of the human radiation experiments we considered speak to the conduct of government itself as a collective agent rather than simply to individual government officials. In too many instances, as we saw in Chapter 1, we found a lack of clarity about the status within an agency of specific declarations by responsible officials, particularly when agencies are engaged in activities that may compromise the rights or interests of citizens, it is critically important that agencies be clear about their commitments and policies, and that they not remain passive in the face of questionable practices for which they may bear some responsibility. In Chapter 3, we saw an effective response to such a situation in the 1960s by the PHS. This example attests to the fact that institutional clarity and active reform measures can succeed, and that when they do, they can be great forward strides. Rules of Professional Ethics Even if the federal government had adopted no formal human research ethics policies whatsoever, the medical profession and its members would still have moral obligations to those who entrust themselves to their care. The successes of modern medical research, regardless of its funding source, are ultimately due to the efforts of talented and dedicated medical scientists. These investigators bear a profound ethical burden in their work with human subjects. Society entrusts them with the privilege of using other human beings to advance their important work. Although society must not discourage them from the pursuit of new information, it must also diligently pursue signs that medical scientists have not exercised their ethical responsibility with the care and sensitivity that society has good reason to expect from them. Without reference to the policies adopted by federal agencies, what rules of professional ethics were seen by the medical profession during the 1944 to 1974 period as relevant to the conduct of its members engaged in human subjects research? The answer to this question depends upon which kind of experimental situation is under discussion, an experiment on a healthy subject, an experiment on a patient subject without a scientific or clinical basis for an expectation of benefit to the patient subject, or an experiment on a patient subject with a scientific or clinical basis for an expectation of benefit to the patient subject. Experiments on Healthy Subjects By the mid-1940s, it was common to obtain the voluntary consent of healthy subjects who were to participate in biomedical experiments that offered no prospect of medical benefit to them. Sophisticated philosophical analysis is not required to reach the conclusion that using a human being in a medical experiment that offers the person no prospect of personal benefits 
without that person's consent is wrong. As we have already noted, such conduct violates the basic ethical principle that one ought not to use people as mere means to the ends of others. Experiments on patient subjects without a scientific or clinical basis for an expectation of benefit to the patient subject. The Hippocratic tradition of medical ethics inherited by physicians in the 1940s holds that, unless the physician is reasonably sure that his or her treatment is, on balance, likely to do the patient more good than harm, the treatment should not be introduced. The heart of the Hippocratic ethic is the physician's commitment to putting the interests of the patient first. Subjecting one's patient to experimentation that offers no prospect of benefit to the patient without his or her consent is a direct repudiation of this commitment. If the patient consents to this use, the moral warrant for proceeding with the experiment comes from the patient's permission, not from the Hippocratic ethic. Experiments on patient subjects with a scientific or clinical basis for an expectation of benefit to the patient subject. Even in Hippocratic medicine, it is recognized that physicians should attempt to use unproven or experimental methods to benefit the patient whether through efforts at cure or palliation, but only so long as there is no efficacious standard therapy available and innovative measures are compatible with the obligation to avoid doing harm without the prospect of offsetting benefit. Interventions in this category should be based on scientific reasoning and conservative clinical judgment. Arguably, so long as these conditions prevailed, it was not thought morally necessary within the medical profession to obtain the patient's consent to such experimentation prior to the 1960s, but the physician assumed a corresponding obligation to base his or her deviation from standard practice on the reasonable likelihood of a patient benefit, sufficient to outweigh the risks associated with being in the experiment. This type of reasoning, too, has been available to and accepted by physicians for many years, even though the ability to assess and calculate risks has developed greatly. Although the professional ethics of the period thus had relevant moral rules for each of these three experimental situations, compliance with these rules is a separate matter. There may be many reasons for specific failures by physicians to adhere to the requirements of their ethical tradition, some of which may render them non-culpable, and there are various limitations on our ability to assign blame for particular cases of a physician's failure to adhere to professional ethics. However, any use of human subjects that did not proceed in accordance with these rules of professional ethics was wrong in the sense that it was a violation of sound professional ethical standards. Moreover, even if there was then or is now a lack of clarity about the rules of professional ethics, Recognition of morally serious individuals of basic ethical principles is enough to identify a certain source of human experiments as morally unacceptable. The special moral responsibilities of the medical profession as a whole, whether decades ago or in our own time, deserve careful consideration, especially insofar as previous experience can help formulate lessons for the future. Like the government, the medical profession as a whole must be held to a higher standard than individuals in society. Confidence in the medical profession is important because individuals put their very lives and the lives of their loved ones in the hands of those whom the profession has certified as competent to practice. Unlike government officials, members of the medical profession are explicitly bound to a moral tradition in their professional relations, based on which society grants the medical profession the privilege of largely policing itself. This authority is part of what constitutes the medical profession as a profession, but the authority is granted by society on the condition that the profession will adhere to the high moral rules it professes, and that, if necessary, the medical profession will reform or encourage the reform of relevant institutions to ensure that those rules will be honored in practice. Moreover, many of the privileges that devolve on the medical profession are granted on the condition that it is sufficiently well organized to police itself, with minimal intervention by the government and the legal system. Therefore, members of the medical profession are further legitimately expected to engage in organizational conduct that constitutes sound moral practices. Implicit in this arrangement is also the assumption that it will be self-critical even about its relatively well-entrenched attitudes and beliefs, so that it will be prepared to undertake reforms. Without this commitment to self-criticism, self-regulation cannot be effective, and the public's trust in the professional's ability to self-regulate would be unwarranted. Today we regard subjects of biomedical research whose consent was not obtained to have been wronged. Under conditions of significant risk, the wrong is greater, and in the absence of the potential of offsetting medical benefit, greater still. The historical silence of the medical profession with respect to non-therapeutic experiments 
was perhaps based on the rationale that those who are ill and perhaps dying may be used in experiments, because they will not be harmed, even though they will not benefit. But this rationale overlooks the principle that people should never be used as mere means, and the principle of respect for self-determination. It may also provide insufficient protection against harm, given the position of conflict of interest in which the physician-researcher may find him or herself. Nevertheless, until the mid-1960s, medical conventions were silent on experiments with patient subjects that offered no direct benefit, but which physicians believed to pose acceptable risk. This silence was a failure of the profession. One defense of the profession in this regard is that it was as subject to the phenomenon we have called cultural moral ignorance as any other group in society at the time, including the arguably excessive deference to physician authority on the part of the government and possibly the public at large. However, the medical profession was in a wholly different position from the others in several respects. First, it insisted upon and was given the privilege of policing its own behavior. Second, the profession was the direct beneficiary of the deference paid to it. Third, there were already examples of experiments that had involved subject consent that could have served as models of reform. Under these conditions, the profession had an obligation to be self-critical concerning the norms and rules it thought appropriate to govern its members' conduct. The medical profession could, and should, have seen that healthy subjects, and patient subjects, in non-therapeutic experiments were in similar moral positions. Neither was expected to benefit medically. Just as physicians had no moral license to determine an acceptable risk for healthy subjects without their voluntary consent, they had no moral license to do so in the case of other subjects who also could not benefit from being in research, even if they were patients. The prevailing standards for healthy subject groups could easily have been applied to patient subjects for whom there was no expectation of medical benefit. The moral equivalence of the use of healthy people and ill people as subjects of the experiments from which no subject could possibly benefit directly was perceptible at the time. This moral equivalence would have made it clear that no one, well or sick, should be used as a mere means to advance medical science without voluntary consent. Thus, this moral ignorance could have and should have been remedied at the time. Indeed, it is arguably the case that physicians could and should have seen that using patients in this way was morally worse than using healthy people, for in doing so one was violating not only the basic ethical principle not to use people as mere means, but also the basic ethical principle to treat people fairly and with equal respect. American physicians are members of a society that places a high value on these basic moral principles, still more vital than the advancement of medical science. These principles are as easily known to physicians as to anyone else, and it is unacceptable to single oneself out as an exception to these principles simply because one is a member of an esteemed profession. Someone who is ill deserves to be treated with the same respect as someone who is well. Accordingly, a physician who failed to tell a patient that what was proposed was an experiment with no therapeutic intent was, and is, blameworthy. To the extent that the experiment entailed significant risk, the physician is more blameworthy. Where it was reasonable to assume that the experiment imposed no risk or minimal risk or inconvenience, the blame is less. We argue here that the use of patients in non-therapeutic experiments without their consent was not only a violation of these basic moral principles, but also a violation of the Hippocratic principle that was the cornerstone of professional medical ethics at that time. That principle enjoins physicians to act in the best interests of their patients and thus would seem to prohibit subjecting patients to experiments from which they could not benefit. It might be argued that a widespread practice that is not in conformity with the principle of professional ethics invalidates the principle, since the practice shows that the profession was not really committed to the principle in the first place. This is a misunderstanding, however, of what it means for a profession to adopt and espouse a moral principle. Even if many or most physicians sometimes fail or even often fail to comply with the principle, it is still coherent to say that the principle is accepted by the profession, that the principle has been publicly pronounced and affirmed by the profession, as was clearly the case with respect to the Hippocratic ethic. To characterize a great profession as having engaged over many years in unethical conduct, years in which massive progress was being made in curbing some of mankind's greatest ills, may strike some as arrogant and unreasonable, However, fair assessment indicates that the circumstance was one of those times in history in which wrongs were committed by very decent people who were in a position to know that a specific aspect of their interactions with others should be improved. 
Wrongs are not less egregious because they were committed by a member of a certain profession or by people who are very decent in their relationships with other parties. It is common for us to look back at such conduct in amazement that so many otherwise good and decent people could have engaged in it without a high level of self-awareness. Moral consistency requires the advisory committee to conclude that, if the use of healthy subjects without consent was understood to be wrong at the time, then the use of patients without consent in non-therapeutic experiments should also have been discerned as wrong at the time, no matter how widespread the practice. It should be emphasized, however, that often these non-therapeutic experiments on unconsenting patients constituted only minor wrongs. Often there was little or no risk to patient subjects and no inconvenience. Although it is always morally offensive to use a person as a means only, as the burden on the patient's subject decreased, so too did the seriousness of the wrong. Much the same can be said of experiments that were conducted on patient subjects without their consent, but that offered a prospect of medical benefit. To the extent that such experiments were conducted within the moral environment of the doctor-patient relationship, that is, based on the physician's considered and informed judgment that it was in the patient's best interests to be enrolled in the research, then the less blameworthy the physician was for failing to obtain consent. However, where the risks were great or where there were viable alternatives to participation in research, then the physician was more blameworthy for failing to obtain consent. It is often difficult to establish standards and make judgments about right and wrong and about blame and exculpation. Our charge was all the more difficult because the context of the actions and agents we were asked to evaluate differs from our own. In arriving at this moral framework for evaluating human radiation experiments, we have tried to be fair to history, to considerations of ethics, and above all to the people affected by our analysis, former subjects, physician investigators, and government officials. End of section 25. Section 26 of Final Report of the Advisory Committee on Human Radiation Experiments. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Patrick McAfee, Evanston. Part 2. Case Studies. Part 2. Overview. When we began our work, the advisory committee was aware of several dozen human radiation experiments and the 13 intentional releases in our charter. Soon, however, we found that these represented a fraction of the several thousand government-sponsored human radiation experiments and hundreds of intentional releases conducted from 1944 to 1974. It was clear that the committee would have to decide how to proceed in examining the experiments. Our ability to review all of the experiments and releases in detail was limited not only by time and resources, but even more so by the information available. For the majority of experiments identified, only the barest descriptions remained. It appeared that the vast majority of experiments involved trace amounts of radioisotopes, as are routinely used today for the study of bodily processes and the diagnosis of disease. However, where reports or other data were available, they did not routinely provide information needed to assess the precise risks to which subjects were exposed. These reports were even less likely to identify what kind of people were chosen as subjects and why and how they were selected. Since the committee could not review all experiments, we decided to prepare a series of case studies focused on groups of experiments. We quickly found that there was no one right way to organize the experiments for purpose of case study. For example, the case studies could have been defined by the type of radiation to which subjects were exposed. This would likely have yielded groupings of experiments with differing purposes, differing populations, and differing risks and benefits. Likewise, grouping all experiments according to the characteristics of the people who were the subjects of the research would have lumped together experiments with differing purposes, risks, and scientific procedures.
the advisory committee on human radiation experiments a c h r e experiments database by cabinet directive on january 19 1994 federal agencies were ordered to quote, establish forthwith an initial procedure for locating records of human radiation experiments conducted by the agency or under a contract or grant of the agency, end quote. The agencies most closely associated with these activities, the DOD, DOE, DHHS, NASA, CIA, and VA, and later the NRC, in cooperation with advisory committee staff, identified record collections of importance and provided ACHRE with copies of documents potentially containing information on human radiation experiments. The documents were analyzed to identify individual experiments which were then described according to a protocol developed by ACHRE members and staff, given unique identifiers and recorded in an electronic database. Experiments were also identified by advisory committee staff in the published literature, discovered through a search of the National Library of Medicine databases and bibliographies and documented by individuals who came forward with information for the advisory committee. The database contains records for approximately 4,000 human radiation experiments. Information was collected, to the extent it was available, on the identity of the experiment, including investigators, location, dates, title, and documentation, funding, program approval and classification, the type and dose of radiation used, various characteristics of the experimental subjects, and the nature of the consent obtained. The experiments were, in addition, categorized by various themes and characteristics developed by advisory committee members and staff to reflect ACHRE research interests. Documentation for individual experiments varies widely, sometimes including significant primary protocol documentation, often including only a journal article or abstract, and, for the greatest number, just an investigator's name, a location, a date, and a title. As a result, although the database and the records it abstracts constitute an impressive and unique collection, of information on human radiation experiments, that collection is not a comprehensive information resource on human radiation experiments, but really just the best place to start to look for information. The supplemental volume, Sources and Documentation, contains a more extensive and detailed description of the database and its sources. After extensive deliberation, the committee settled on eight case studies, which together address the charges to and priorities of the committee. For example, we were charged to consider both intentional releases of radiation into the environment and the question of whether any former subjects of human radiation experiments would benefit medically from notification of their involvement. In addition, the committee saw a responsibility to address those experiments that had received significant public attention at the time of the committee's creation, as well as those brought to our attention by members of the public. These experiments either offered no prospect of medical benefit to subjects, or they involved interventions alleged to be controversial at the time. We also, however, recognized the importance of considering the far larger group of experiments that received no such attention, but that also may have involved no prospect of benefit to subjects. We also placed a priority on experiments that were conducted on behalf of secret programs and for national security reasons, 
experiments that posed the greatest risk of harm, and experiments in which the subjects selected for experimentation were particularly powerless to resist or exercise independent judgment about participation. Together, these considerations formed the basis for the selection of the case studies. In Chapter 5, we look at the Manhattan Project Plutonium Injection Experiments and Related Experimentation. Sick patients were used in sometimes secret experimentation to develop data needed to protect the health and safety of nuclear weapons workers. The experiments raise questions of the use of sick patients for purposes that are not of benefit to them, the role of national security in permitting conduct that might not otherwise be justified, and the use of secrecy for the purpose of protecting the government from embarrassment and potential liability. In contrast to the plutonium injections, the vast majority of human radiation experiments were not conducted in secret. Indeed, the use of radioisotopes in biomedical research was publicly and actively promoted by the Atomic Energy Commission. Among the several thousand experiments about which little information is currently available, most fall into this category. The committee adopted a two-pronged strategy to study this phenomenon. In Chapter 6, we describe the system the AEC developed for the distribution of isotopes to be used in human research. This system was the primary provider of the source material for human experimentation in the post-war period. In studying the operation of the radioisotope distribution system and the related human use committees at local institutions, we sought to learn the ground rules that governed the conduct of the majority of human radiation experiments, most of which have received little or no public attention. Also in this chapter, we review how research with radioisotopes has contributed to advances in medicine. The committee then selected for particular consideration, in Chapter 7, radioisotope research that used children as subjects. We determined to focus on children for several reasons. First, at low levels of radiation exposure, children are at greater risk of harm than adults. Second, children were the most appropriate group in which to pursue the committee's mandate with respect to notification of formal subjects for medical reasons. They are the group most likely to have been harmed by their participation in research and they are more likely than other former subjects still to be alive. Third, when the committee considered how best to study subject populations that were most likely to be exploited because of their relative dependency or powerlessness, children were the only subjects who could readily be identified in the meager documentation available. By contrast, characteristics such as gender, ethnicity, and social class, were rarely noted in research reports of the day. Moving from case studies focused on the injection or ingestion of radioisotopes, Chapter 8 shifts to experimentation in which sick patients were subjected to externally administered total body irradiation, TBI. The committee discovered that the highly publicized TBI experiments conducted at the University of Cincinnati were only the last of a series in which the government sought to use data from patients undergoing TBI treatment to gain information for nuclear weapons development and use. The experimentation spanned the period from World War II to the early 1970s, during which the ethics of experimentation became increasingly subject to public debate and government regulation. In contrast with the experiments that flowed from the AEC's radioisotope program, the use of external radiation, such as TBI, did not in its earlier years involve a government requirement of 
prior review for risk. The TBI experimentation raises basic questions about the responsibility of the government when it seeks to gather research data in conjunction with medical interventions of debatable benefit to sick patients. In Chapter 9, we examine experimentation on healthy subjects, specifically prisoners, for the purpose of learning the effects of external irradiation on the testes, such as might be experienced by astronauts in space. The prisoner experiments were studied because they received significant public attention and because a literally captive population was chosen to bear risks to which no other group of experimental subjects had been exposed or has been exposed since. This research took place during a period in which the once commonly accepted practice of non-therapeutic experimentation on prisoners was increasingly subject to public criticism and moral outrage. Chapter 10 also explores research involving healthy subjects, human experimentation conducted in conjunction with atomic bomb tests. More than 200,000 service personnel, now known as atomic veterans, participated at atomic bomb test sites, mostly for training and test management purposes. A small number also were used as subjects of experimentation. The committee heard from many atomic veterans and their family members who were concerned about both the long-term health effects of these exposures and the government's conduct. This case study provides the opportunity to examine the meaning of human experimentation in an occupational setting where risk is the norm. In Chapter 11, we address the 13 intentional releases of radiation into the environment specified in the committee's charter, as well as additional releases identified during the life of the committee. In contrast with biomedical experimentation, individuals and communities were not typically the subject of study in these intentional releases. Rather, the releases were to test intelligence equipment, the potential of radiological warfare, and the mechanism of the atomic bomb. While the risk posed by intentional releases was relatively small, the releases often took place in secret and remained secret for years. The final case study in Chapter 12 looks at two groups that were put at risk by nuclear weapons development and testing programs and, as a consequence, became the subjects of observational research. Workers who mined uranium for the Atomic Energy Commission in the western United States from the 1940s to 1960s, and residents of the Marshall Islands, whose Pacific homeland was irradiated as a consequence of a hydrogen bomb test in 1954. While these observational studies do not fit the classic definition of an experiment in which the investigator controls the variable under study, in this case radiation exposure, they are instances of research involving human subjects. The committee elected to examine the experiences of the uranium miners and Marshallese because they raise important issues in the ethics of human research not illustrated in the previous case studies and because numerous public witnesses impressed on the committee the significance of the lessons to be learned from their histories. Part 2 concludes with an exploration and an important theme common to many of the case studies openness and secrecy in the government's conduct concerning human radiation research and intentional releases. In Chapter 13, we step back and look at what rules governed what the public was told about the topics under the committee's purview, whether these rules were publicly known, and whether they were followed. End of Section 26
Recording by Patrick McAfee, Evanston. Section 27 of Final Report of the Advisory Committee on Human Radiation Experiments. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Patrick McAfee, Evanston. 5. Experiments with Plutonium, Uranium, and Polonium. In August 1944, at the secret Los Alamos Laboratory in New Mexico, a 23-year-old chemist was trying to learn what he could about the properties of a radioactive metal. One year later, the new product, one of several code words for this three-year-old element with a classified name, would power the bomb dropped on Nagasaki. That day, the young scientist, Don Mastic, was working with the entire Los Alamos supply of the material, 10 milligrams. It was sealed in a glass vial several inches long and about a quarter inch in diameter. Unknown to Mastic, a chemical reaction was causing pressure to build up inside the vial. Suddenly it burst, firing an acidic solution against the wall from where it splattered into Mastic's face, some of it entering his mouth. Realizing the importance to the war effort of the plutonium he had just ingested, Mastic hurried directly to the office of Louis Hempelman, the health director at Los Alamos. Hempelman pumped Mastic's stomach and instructed the young scientist to retrieve the plutonium from the expelled contents. Hempelman expressed a concern related to worker safety. There was no way available to determine how much plutonium remained in Mastic's body. He immediately pressed the lab's director, J. Robert Oppenheimer, for authorization to conduct studies to develop ways of detecting plutonium in the lungs and in urine and feces and of estimating the level of plutonium in the body from the amount found in excreta. Looming over Mastic's accident was the well-known tragedy of the radium dial workers more than a decade earlier. Like Mastic, they had ingested radioactive material through their mouths as they licked the brushes they used to apply radium paint to watch dials. As time passed, many suffered from a gruesome bone disease localized in the jaw, and some bone cancers developed. Could plutonium cause a similar tragedy? If so, how much plutonium needed to be ingested before harmful effects might arise? How could one tell how much plutonium a person had already ingested? The answers to these questions were crucial, not only in the case of accidents such as mastics, but also in the long run to establish occupational health standards for the hundreds of workers who would soon be mass-producing plutonium for atomic bombs. Several pounds of radium, handled without recognition of the dangers, had led to dozens of deaths. What might plutonium cause? A starting point was to examine the available data on radium poisoning. Compare the characteristics of the radiation emitted by radium and plutonium and try to extrapolate from radium to plutonium. However, plutonium had already revealed unexpected physical properties, which were posing problems for the bomb designers. Could plutonium also have unexpected biochemical properties? Extrapolation from radium was a good starting point, but could never be as reliable as data on plutonium itself. Oppenheimer agreed that this research was critical. In an August 16, 1944 memorandum to Hempelman, Oppenheimer authorized separate programs to develop methods to detect plutonium in the excreta and in the lung. With respect to biological studies, which Oppenheimer speculated might involve human experimentation, he wrote, quote, 
I feel that it is desirable if these can in any way be handled elsewhere not to undertake them here, end quote. The reason Oppenheimer did not want these experiments conducted at Los Alamos remains obscure. Nine days later, Hempelman met with Colonel Stafford L. Warren, medical director of the Manhattan Project, and others. They agreed to conduct a research program using both animal and human subjects. Mastic, who reported no ill effects from the accident, when advisory committee staff interviewed him in 1995, was not the first alert to the potential hazards of plutonium. Human experiments to study the metabolism and retention of plutonium in the body had been contemplated from the earliest days of the Manhattan Project. On January 5, 1944, Glenn Seaborg, who, in 1941, was the first to recognize that plutonium had been created in the cyclotron at the University of California at Berkeley, wrote to Dr. Robert Stone, health director of the Metallurgical Laboratory in Chicago, a Manhattan Project contractor, and a central figure in efforts to understand the health effects of plutonium. Quote, it has occurred to me that the physiological hazards of working with plutonium and its compounds may be very great. Due to its alpha radiation and long life, it may be that the permanent location in the body of even very small amounts, say one milligram or less, may be very harmful. The ingestion of such extraordinarily small amounts as some few tens of micrograms might be unpleasant if it locates itself in a permanent position. End quote. Seaborg urged that a safety program be set up. In addition, quote, I would like to suggest that a program to trace the course of plutonium in the body be initiated as soon as possible. In my opinion, such a program should have the very highest priority. End quote. Stone reassured Seaborg that human tracer studies quote, have long since been planned, although never mentioned in official descriptions of the program. End quote. The work began at Berkeley with studies on rats conducted by Dr. Joseph Hamilton. Even as these studies on the biological effects of plutonium were beginning, the amount of plutonium being produced was dramatically increasing. Most of the effort at Oak Ridge was devoted to the separation of isotopes of uranium. However, the X-10 plant at Oak Ridge was a larger version of the very small plutonium-producing reactor developed at the University of Chicago. The X-10 plant began operating on November 4, 1943, and by the summer of 1944, was sending small amounts of plutonium to Los Alamos. By December 1944, large-scale production of plutonium began at the Hanford-Washington Reactor Complex. By late 1944, in the wake of the Mastic accident, the need to devise a means of estimating the amount of plutonium in the body became acute. It seemed that the only way to estimate how much plutonium remained in a worker's body would be to measure over time the amount excreted after a known dose, and from this estimate the relationship between the amount excreted and the amount retained in the body. Maximum Permissible Body Burden, MPBB, for Plutonium the plutonium injections were part of a larger research project intended to provide data for an occupational safety program riddled with uncertainty. Not only was there a need for ways to monitor the exposure of personnel, the driving force behind the plutonium injections, but the maximum permissible body burden, MPBB, for plutonium the maximum amount of plutonium that would be permitted in the bodies of workers was still under debate. 
The concept of maximum permissible body burden had begun to develop before the war in light of the known hazards of radium. Just prior to the war, primarily at the request of the Navy, a committee of experts was formed to establish occupational health standards for the factories producing dials illuminated by radium paint. After examining the data on radium dial painters, this committee agreed that 0 0.1 microgram fixed in the body should be the tolerance level for radium, an amount that, in the words of the committee chairman, Robert Evans, would be, quote, at such a level that we would feel comfortable if our own wife or daughter were the subject, end quote. After the war, the term maximum permissible body burden was adopted and defined more precisely as the amount of a radioisotope that, when continuously present inside the body, would produce a dose equivalent to the allowable occupational exposure, the maximum permissible dose. For radioisotopes that, like radium, primarily reside in bone, biological data and mathematical models were used to determine how much of another bone seeker would produce the same dose as the original 0 0.1 microgram radium standard. Between 1943 and the spring of 1945, based on the body burden for radium and preliminary results of animal experiments, a tentative MPBB for plutonium of 5 micrograms was adopted by the Manhattan District. This level was derived by direct comparison of the relative energies of plutonium and radium. By the spring of 1945, differences between the deposition of radium and plutonium in the body were becoming clearer. Animal data indicated that plutonium deposited in what was called at the time the organic matrix of the bone, the part of the bone that most associated with bone growth. This was different from radium, which seemed to deposit instead in the mineralized bone. Wright Langham wrote to Heimer Friedel supporting the choice of one microgram as an operating limit in lieu of a more formal policy. Langham wrote that with the adoption of this lower limit, the medical legal aspect will have been taken care of and of still greater importance, we will have taken a relatively small chance of poisoning someone in case the material proves to be more toxic than one would normally expect. This level was adopted and held until the Tripartite Permissible Dose Conference at Chalk River, Canada in September 1949. At this conference, representatives from the United States, United Kingdom, and Canada agreed on tolerance doses for many radioactive isotopes, including a maximum body burden of 0 0.1 microgram for plutonium. This reduced by a factor of 10 the value under which Los Alamos production had been operating. This reduction was based on the results of acute toxicological experiments with animals, which indicated that plutonium was as much as 15 times more toxic than radium. On January 20, 1950, Wright Langham wrote to Shields Warren, then the director of the AEC's Division of Biology and Medicine, alerting him to the problems caused by the Chalk River Conference's new, quote, extremely conservative tolerances, which may have a drastic effect on the efficiency and productivity of the Los Alamos Laboratory. Their official adoption will undoubtedly force major alteration in both present and future laboratory facilities and may add millions of dollars to the cost of construction of the permanent building program now in the planning phases. End quote. 
Langham continued with reasons for regarding the Chalk River value of 0 0.1 micrograms of plutonium as unnecessarily low. He cited, among other things, differences between acute and chronic toxicity and new analysis of data from the radium watch dial painters. On January 24, 1950, Shields Warren, Austin Bruce of Argonne National Laboratory, Robley Evans, Carl Morgan, and Wright Langham met in Washington. Langham wrote later, quote, As a result of this meeting, Dr. Shields Warren of the Division of Biology and Medicine authorized 0 0.5 UG 0.033 UC of plutonium-239 as the AEC's official operating maximum permissible body burden, end quote. There were no minutes or transcripts taken of this meeting. The calculation of this level was again based on the body burden for radium, this time modified by the 1 15th toxicity factor since experiments had indicated that plutonium was up to 15 times more toxic than radium by the relative retention of plutonium and radium in rodents and by the energy ratios modified by radon retention. Thus far, the entire debate had occurred behind the closed doors of the AEC. Consideration of all the complex issues applied in setting a permissible body burden had been within a small circle of scientists and administrators, while the MPBB for plutonium accepted at the January 1950 meeting has held until today, its derivation has changed over the years. By March 1945, there was disturbing news that urine samples from Los Alamos workers were indicating, based on models developed from animal experimentation, that some might be approaching or had exceeded a body burden of one microgram. A March 25th meeting led to Hempelman's recommendation that the project, quote, help make arrangements for a human tracer experiment to determine the percentage of plutonium excreted daily in the urine and feces. It is suggested that a hospital patient at either Rochester or Chicago be chosen for injection of from 1 to 10 micrograms of material and that the excreta be sent to the laboratory for analysis. End quote. The overall program, as it was envisioned by Dr. Heimer Friedel, Deputy Medical Director of the Manhattan Engineer District, Oppenheimer, and Hempelman, consisted of three parts. Improvement of methods to protect personnel from exposure to plutonium. Development of methods for diagnosing overexposure of personnel and study of methods of treatment of overexposed personnel. On March 29th, Oppenheimer forwarded the recommendation to Stafford Warren with his, quote, personal endorsement, end quote. The accident at Los Alamos was part of the prelude to experiments conducted between 1945 and 1947, in which 18 hospital patients were injected with plutonium to determine how excreta, urine, and feces could be used to estimate the amount of plutonium that remained in an exposed worker's body. One patient was in injected at Oak Ridge Hospital in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. Eleven were injected at the University of Rochester, three at the University of Chicago, and three at the University of California. The results of these experiments contributed to the development of a monitoring method that, with small changes, is still used today. The experimental data were used to develop a model relating body burden to short-term excretion rate. Known as the Langham model, it was based on short-term excretion data, 
long-term excretion data that were collected in 1950 from two injection subjects, and worker excretion data. This model has been used almost universally to monitor plutonium workers since 1950, although it has been modified over the years as longer term and more extensive data were accumulated. While now, 50 years later, not every question concerning the quality of the science or the basis for estimating risk can be answered with precision, there is general agreement among radiation scientists that the experiments were useful. Although this would be the first time that plutonium would be injected into human beings, the plutonium experiments were not viewed at the time as being extremely risky, and for good reason. Based on experience with other bone-seeking radioisotopes, such as radium, the investigators had firm basis for believing, even in the 1940s, that the amount of material to be injected was likely too small to produce any immediate side effects or reactions. No one was expected to feel ill or have any negative reaction to the injection, and apparently no one did. Because acute effects were not expected, the plutonium injections were viewed as posing no short-term risks to human subjects. There was concern, however, about long-term risk. A draft report, written by one of the primary investigators within a few years of the injections, records that, quote, acute toxic effects from the small dose of PU, plutonium, administered were neither expected nor observed, end quote. The document also recognized that with regard to ultimate effects, it is too early to predict what may occur. Based largely on the experience of the radium dial painters, it was recognized that exposure to plutonium could result, perhaps 10 or 20 years later, in the development of cancer in a human subject. This was viewed as a significant risk, but also as a risk that could be minimized by the use of small doses and wholly avoided if the subjects were expected to die well before a cancer had a chance to materialize. Even if the plutonium injections had been entirely risk-free, an impossibility in human experimentation, they could still be morally problematic. As we discussed in Chapter 2, it was not uncommon in the 1940s for physicians to use patients as subjects in experiments without their knowledge or consent. This occurred frequently in research involving potential new therapies where there was at least a chance that the patient subjects might benefit medically from being in an experiment. But it also occurred even in experiments, like the plutonium injections, where there was never any expectation and no chance that the experiment might be of benefit to the subjects. The conduct of the plutonium experiments raises a number of difficult ethics and policy questions. Who should have been the subjects of an experiment designed to protect workers vital to bomb production in wartime? What should the subjects have been told about the risks of the secret substance with which they were being injected? What should they have been told about the purpose of the experiment? What were the subjects told? Did they know they were part of an experiment in which there was no expectation that they would benefit medically? An inquiry initiated by the AEC commissioners in 1974 investigated some of these questions. That inquiry focused on whether consent was obtained from the subjects, either at the time of the plutonium injections or during 1973 follow-up studies funded by the AEC's Argonne National Laboratory in Chicago, designed to determine the long-term effects of the injections. 
Sixteen patient charts were examined for evidence of consent at the time of injection. The other two charts had been either lost or destroyed. Of the sixteen charts examined, only one chart, that of the only subject injected after the April 1947 directive of AEC General Manager Carol Wilson, discussed in Chapter 1, that required documented consent, contained evidence of some form of consent. The other 15 contained no record of consent. According to AEC investigators, oral testimony pointed to failure to obtain consent in the case of the Oak Ridge injection and to some form of disclosure to patients for the California and Chicago experiments. The AEC concluded that testimony was inconclusive for the Rochester experiments. With regard to the follow-up studies conducted with three surviving subjects in 1973, the investigation concluded that two subjects had deliberately not been informed of the purpose of the follow-up, and that one subject had actually been misled about the purpose. As we will see later in this chapter, the AEC's conclusion that consent was not obtained from the surviving subjects for the 1973 follow-up studies was correct. Moreover, additional documentary evidence and testimony suggests that patient subjects at the universities of Rochester and California were never told that the injections were part of a medical experiment for which there was no expectation that they would benefit, and they never consented to this use of their bodies. The rest of this chapter provides a chronological account of the plutonium injection experiments and follow-up studies conducted over the course of many years, assesses the influence of secrecy on the conduct of the experiments, and examines the motivating factors behind the prolonged secrecy of the experiments, and the continued deception of surviving subjects. We also consider the conduct of experimentation with uranium and polonium. Finally, we render judgments where we can about the ethical conduct of these experiments. End of section 27 Recording by Patrick McAfee Evanston. Section 28 of Final Report of the Advisory Committee on Human Radiation Experiments. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Patrick McAfee, Evanston. Final Report of the Advisory Committee on Human Radiation Experiments, Case Studies, Chapter 5, Part 2. The Manhattan District Experiments. The First Injection. A few days after Hempelman's March 26, 1945 recommendation, that a hospital patient be injected with plutonium, Wright Langham of the Los Alamos Laboratories Health Division sent five micrograms of plutonium to Dr. Friedel with instructions for their use on a human subject. The subject, as it turned out, was already in the Oak Ridge Army Hospital, a victim of an auto accident that had occurred on March 24, 1945. He was a 53-year-old colored male named Eb Cade, who was employed by an Oak Ridge construction company as a cement mixer. The subject had serious fractures in his arm and leg, but was otherwise well-developed and well-nourished. The patient was able to tell his doctors that he had always been in good health. 
Mr. Cade had been hospitalized since his accident, but the plutonium injection did not take place until April 10. On this date, HP-12, the code name HP, human product, was later assigned to this patient and to patients at the University of Rochester, was reportedly injected with 4.7 micrograms of plutonium. It is important here to distinguish between administered dose and retained dose. Not all of the injected dose would remain fixed in the body. It was not known with certainty, however, how much of the 4.7 micrograms of plutonium would remain in his body. The small amount of material injected into Mr. Cade would not be expected to produce any acute effects, and there is no indication that any were experienced. However, except for his fractures, Mr. Cade was apparently in good health and at age 53 could reasonably have been expected to live for another 10 to 20 years. Thus, in Mr. Cade's case, the risk of a plutonium-induced cancer could not be ruled out. Dr. Joseph Howland, an army doctor stationed at Oak Ridge, told AEC investigators in 1974 that he had administered the injection. There was, he recalled, no consent from the patient. He acted, he testified, only after his objections were met with a written order to proceed from his superior, Dr. Friedel. Dr. Friedel told advisory committee staff in an interview that he did not order the injection and that it was administered by a physician named Dwight Clark, not Dr. Howland. The committee has not been able to resolve this contradiction. Measurements were to be taken from samples of Mr. Cade's blood after four hours, his bone tissue after 96 hours, and his bodily excretions for 40 to 60 days thereafter. His broken bones were not set until April 15, five days after the injection, when bone samples were taken in a biopsy. Although this was several weeks after his injury, during this era when antibiotics were only beginning to become available, it was common practice to delay surgery if there was any sign of possible infection. One document records that Mr. Cade had marked tooth decay and gum inflammation, and 15 of his teeth were extracted and sampled for plutonium. The committee has not been able to determine whether the teeth were extracted primarily for medical reasons or for the purpose of sampling for plutonium. In a September 1945 letter, Captain David Goldring at Oak Ridge informed Langham that more bone specimens and extracted teeth will be shipped to you very soon for analysis. It remains unclear whether these additional bone specimens were extracted at the time of the April 15 operation or later. According to one account, Mr. Cade departed suddenly from the hospital on his own initiative. One morning, the nurse opened his door and he was gone. Later, it was learned that he moved out of state and died of heart failure on April 13, 1953 in Greensboro, North Carolina. The experiment at Oak Ridge did not proceed as planned. Before and after urine samples were mistakenly commingled, so no baseline data on kidney function was available. Thus, the subject's kidney function would be difficult to assess.
In May 1945, Dr. Stone convened a conference on plutonium in Chicago to discuss health issues related to plutonium, including the relationship between dose and excretion rate, the permissible body burden, and potential therapy and protective measures. Wright Langham spoke about the Oak Ridge injection at the conference, carefully qualifying the reliability of the excretion data obtained from Mr. Cade. Langham observed that, quote, the patient might not have been an ideal subject in that his kidney function may not have been completely normal at the time of injection, end quote, as indicated by protein tests of his urine. The Chicago Experiments on April 11, the day after the Oak Ridge injection, Heimer Friedel transmitted the protocol describing the experiment on Mr. Cade to Louis Hempelman at Los Alamos. Quote, Everything went very smoothly, he wrote, and I think that we will have some very valuable information for you. End quote. He then went on to discuss the injection of more patients. Quote, I think that we will have access to considerable clinical material here, and we hope to do a number of subjects. At such time as we line up several patients, I think we will make an effort to have Mr. Langham here to review our setup. End quote. Subsequently, between late April and late December of 1945, three cancer patients, codenamed CHI-1, 2, and 3, were injected with plutonium. At least two, and possibly all three, were injected at the Billings Hospital of the University of Chicago. The doses to subjects CHI-2 and CHI-3 were the highest doses administered to any of the 18 injection subjects, approximately 95 micrograms. However, the amount of material injected was still below what would be expected to produce acute effects. Moreover, unlike Mr. Cade, all three of these patients were seriously ill and at least two of them died within 10 months of receiving the injection. That the injection of seriously ill patients was an intentional strategy to contain risk is indicated in a 1946 report on CHI-1 and CHI-2. Two, quote, some human studies were needed to see how to apply the animal data to the human problems. Hence, two people were selected whose life expectancy was such that they could not be endangered by injections of plutonium. End quote. It remains a mystery why CHI-3 was not included in this report. On April 26, 1945, CHI-1, a 68-year-old man who had been admitted to Billings Hospital in March, was injected with 6.5 micrograms of plutonium. At the time of injection, he was suffering from cancer of the mouth and lung. The patient reportedly, quote, remained in fair condition until August 1945, when he complained of pain in the chest, end quote. His lung cancer had apparently spread, and he died on October 3, 1945. The next injection took place eight months later. CHI2 was a 55-year-old woman with breast cancer, who had been admitted to Billings Hospital in December 1945 after the cancer had already spread throughout her body. 
The 1946 report recorded that, quote, the patient's general condition was poor at the time of admission and deteriorated steadily throughout the period of hospitalization, end quote. She was injected with 95 micrograms of plutonium on December 27 and died on January 13, 1946. There is little known about the condition of CHI-3, the other subject who was injected with approximately 95 micrograms. He was a young man suffering from Hodgkin's disease reportedly injected on the same date as CHI-2. His condition at the time of injection remains unknown, as does his date of death. There is some question whether he was injected at Billings Hospital or at another hospital in the Chicago area. There was no discussion of consent in the original reports on the Chicago experiments. However, a draft report on an interview conducted with E.R. Russell for the 1974 AEC investigation into the experiments. Russell was co-author of the 1946 report on the Chicago experiments. Summarized Russell's description of consent as follows, quote, He prepared the plutonium solutions for injection and acted together with a nurse as witness to the fact that the patient was or had been informed that a radioactive substance was going to be injected. The administration of this substance, according to what was said in obtaining consent, was not necessarily for the benefit of the patients, but might help other people. End quote. To say that the injection was not necessarily for the benefit of the patient implies that there was some chance these patients might benefit. In fact, there was no expectation that this would occur. Russell's account was obtained in the context of an official inquiry into his conduct and the conduct of the other investigators and officials involved in the plutonium injections, an inquiry that focused on whether consent was obtained from the subjects. We have no way of corroborating this account or of assessing what Dr. Russell's motivations were in explaining the plutonium injections to the subjects in the way claimed. The Rochester Experiments By the time the war began, the University of Rochester which had a cyclotron, had assembled a group of first-rate physicists and medical researchers who were pioneering the new radiation research. Following the selection of the university's Stafford Warren to head its medical division, the Manhattan Project turned to Rochester for an increasing share of its biomedical research including, in particular, research needed to set standards for worker safety. The university's metabolism ward at what is now the Strong Memorial Hospital became the central Manhattan district site for the administration of isotopes to human subjects. The two-bed ward, headed by Dr. Samuel Bassett, was part of the Manhattan District's Special Problems Division, which worked on the health monitoring of production plants, the development of monitoring instruments, and research on the metabolism and toxicology of long-lived radioactive elements. An experimental plan called for 50 subjects altogether in five groups of 10 subjects each. Each group would receive plutonium, radium, polonium, uranium, or lead. Although the exact number of subjects remains unknown, at least 22 patients were administered 
long-lived isotopes in experiments with plutonium, 11 subjects, polonium, 5 subjects, and uranium, 6 subjects. At the time the experiment was being designed, the main selection criterion for the subjects chosen at Rochester for the plutonium experiment was that they have a metabolism similar to healthy Manhattan Engineer District workers. In a work plan for the plutonium study, based on a September 1945 meeting with a representative of Colonel Warren's office and the Rochester doctors, Langham wrote, quote, The selection of subjects is entirely up to the Rochester group. At the meeting, it seemed to be more or less agreed that the subjects might be chronic arthritics, patients with serious collagen vascular diseases such as scleroderma, or carcinoma patients without primary involvement of bone, liver, blood, or kidneys. It is of primary importance that the subjects have relatively normal kidney and liver function as it is desirable to obtain a metabolic picture comparable to that of an active worker. Undoubtedly, the selection of subjects will be greatly influenced by what is available. The above points, however, should be kept in mind. End quote. Although this protocol specifies cancer patients as potential subjects, evidently the deliberate choice was made later by the experimenters to select patients without malignant diseases in the hope of ensuring normal metabolism. Thus, no cancer patients were included among the plutonium subjects at Rochester. Preference appears to have been given to patients the doctors believed would benefit from additional time in the hospital. An additional perspective on the selection of subjects for the plutonium experiments is provided in three retrospective reports written by Wright Langham. In a 1950 report on the plutonium project, including the experiments conducted at Rochester, Langham wrote that, quote, as a rule, the subjects chosen were past 45 years of age and suffering from chronic disorders such that survival for 10 years was highly improbable, end quote. In subsequent reports, Langham refers to the plutonium subjects as having been, quote, hopelessly sick, end quote, and, quote, terminal. End quote. Documents retrieved for the advisory committee show that all but one of the plutonium subjects at Rochester suffered from chronic disorders such as severe hemorrhaging secondary to duodenal ulcers, heart disease, Addison's disease, cirrhosis, and scleroderma. One subject, Ida Schultz Charlton did not have any such condition. According to the draft of the 1950 report, she was misdiagnosed, quote, a woman aged 49 years may have a greater life expectancy than originally anticipated due to an error in the provisional diagnosis, end quote. Most of the subjects at Rochester were not terminally ill, and at least some of them had the potential to live more than 10 years. Three of the Rochester subjects were known to still be living at the time of the 1974 AEC investigation into the plutonium experiments. Whether the inclusion of subjects at Rochester with the potential to live more than 10 years is an indication that the investigators were not using Langham's criterion to select subjects or that they erred in their predictions is unclear. 
Judgments about the life expectancy of the chronically ill are difficult to make and often in error, even today. The likelihood that long-term risks can be altogether eliminated does exist, however, if the subject is in the terminal stages of an illness and death is imminent. This was recognized by the plutonium investigators and it led to the observation that the use of a terminal patient permitted a larger dose, which would make analysis easier. The first terminal patient at Rochester was injected toward the end of that series, and the possibility of further injections into terminal patients was discussed explicitly. In a March 1946 letter, Wright Langham wrote to Dr. Bassett, the primary physician investigator at Rochester, quote, In case you should decide to do another terminal case, I suggest you do 50 micrograms instead of 5. This would permit the analysis of much smaller samples and would make my work considerably easier. I feel reasonably certain that there would be no harm in using larger amounts of material if you are sure the case is a terminal one, as was done in two of the three Chicago injections. End quote. As was the case at Oak Ridge and Chicago, there was no expectation that the patient subjects at Rochester would benefit medically from the plutonium injections. The advisory committee found no documents that bear directly on what, if anything, the subjects were told about the injections and whether they consented. The recollections of at least some of those intimately involved have survived, however, and these recollections all suggest that the patients did not know they had been injected with radioactive material or even that they were subjects of an experiment. Milton Statt, the son of a Rochester subject, told the advisory committee the following at a meeting in Santa Fe, New Mexico, on January 30, 1995. Quote, My mother, Jan Statt, had a number, HP-8. She was injected with plutonium on March 9, 1946. She was 41 years old, and I was 11 years old at the time. My mother and father were never told or asked for any kind of consent to have this done to them. My mother went in to the hospital for scleroderma, and a duodenal ulcer, and somehow she got pushed over into this lab where these monsters were. End quote. Dr. Hempelman, in an interview for the 1974 AEC investigation, said he believed that the patients injected with plutonium were deliberately not informed about the contents of the injections. Dr. Patricia Durbin, a University of California researcher who in 1968 undertook a scientific reanalysis of the experiments, reported on a visit with Dr. Christine Waterhouse in 1971. Dr. Waterhouse was a medical resident at Rochester at the time of the plutonium injections. Durbin wrote the following regarding the Rochester subjects who were still alive. Quote, she, Dr. Waterhouse, believes that all three persons would be agreeable to providing excretion samples and perhaps blood samples, but they are all quite old, in their middle or late seventies, and cannot travel far. More important they do not know that they received any radioactive material. End quote. 
In notes on a 1971 telephone conversation with Wright Langham, Dr. Durbin wrote, quote, He is, I believe, distressed by the fact that the injected people in the HP series were unaware that they were the subjects of an experiment. End quote. This recollection is even more troubling than the recollections of Drs. Waterhouse and Hempelman, as it indicates not only the subjects did not know that they were being injected with plutonium or a radioactive substance, but also that they did not know even that they were subjects of an experiment. Even the doctors in charge of some of the injections at Rochester may not have known what they were injecting into patients. In 1974, Dr. Hempelman suggested that the physician who actually injected the solution quite possibly did not know of its contents. Further evidence suggesting that the patient subjects were never told what was done to them comes from 1950 correspondence between Langham and the physicians at Rochester. These physicians investigators were looking for signs of long-term skeletal effects in follow-up studies with two of the subjects at Rochester. Langham wrote to Rochester that he was, quote, very glad to hear that you will manage to get follow-ups on the two subjects. The x-rays seem to be the all-important thing, but please get them in a completely routine manner. Do not make the examination look unusual in any way. End quote. Moreover, a letter from Langham to Dr. Bassett discussed the undesirability of recording plutonium data in the Rochester subjects' hospital records. Quote, I talked to Colonel Stafford Warren on the phone yesterday, and he recommended that I send copies of all my data to Dr. Andrew Dowdy, where it would be available to you and Dr. Robert M. Fink to observe. He thought it best that I not send it to you because he wanted it to remain in the Manhattan Project files instead of taking a chance on it finding its way into the hospital records. I think this is probably a sensible suggestion. End quote. Uranium Injections at Rochester Under the Manhattan Engineer District Program, physicians at the Rochester Metabolism Ward also injected six patients with uranium in the form of uranyl nitrate enriched in the isotopes uranium-234 and uranium-235 to establish the minimum dose that would produce detectable kidney damage due to the chemical toxicity of uranium metal and to measure the rate at which uranium was excreted from the body. To achieve the first objective, the experimenters used a higher dose with each new subject until the first sign of minimal kidney damage occurred. Damage occurred in the sixth and last subject at a calculated amount of radioactivity of 0 0.03 microcuries, indicated by protein tests of his urine. Unlike the plutonium injections, this was an experiment that evidently was designed not only to obtain excretion data, but to cause actual physical harm, however minimal. Thus, although the investigators could reasonably view the plutonium injections as an experiment that was extremely unlikely to produce acute effects, this was not true of the uranium experiment, which was intended to produce acute effects. As with the plutonium injections, the uranium injections also posed a long-term risk of the development of cancer. Dr. 
the committee does not know in this case how long subjects survived after injection there is no documentation of follow-up with these subjects as there is for some of the subjects of the plutonium injections the subjects of this experiment like some of the plutonium injection subjects were not at risk of imminent death but did suffer from chronic medical conditions such as rheumatoid arthritis alcoholism malnutrition cirrhosis and tuberculosis according to dr bassett again the primary investigator the subjects quote, were chosen from a large group of hospital patients criteria of importance in making the selection were reasonably good kidney function with urine free from protein and with normal sediment on clinical examination the probability that the patient would benefit from continued hospitalization and medical care was also a factor in the choice End quote. the 1948 report on the experiment did not discuss the question of consent we were not able to locate any documents that bear on what if anything the subjects were told about the uranium injections nor have any relevant recollections about the experiment survived two 1946 documents however discussing whether dr bassett should be permitted to give a departmental seminar on the excretion rate of uranium in humans illustrate the secrecy that surrounded these injections and suggest that the subjects were not informed of the experiment by the time of this correspondence the uranium research with animals at rochester had been declassified the first document a letter written by andrew dowdy the director of the manhattan department at the university of rochester to a manhattan district area engineer requesting permission for bassett to give the seminar included the following quote, i feel that there is no reason why he should not discuss this matter and i believe that the fact that this information was actually obtained on his own patients is of more concern to himself than to the district End quote. in the second document an inter-office memorandum the area engineer discussed this point and more quote, dr dowdy states that the patients were dr bassett's but it should be borne in mind that all the work performed by dr bassett was performed at the request of the manhattan district medical section this seminar is to be conducted for persons who are all doctors of medicine and it is doubtful if this information would get out to any of the families of the patients or the patients on whom the experiments were performed at the time these experiments were started this office was given strict orders that the information should not be released to any but authorized persons almost all the correspondence and result of experiments were exchanged between dr wright langham at santa fe and dr bassett of the university of rochester this rule is still in effect on some of the material that dr bassett is using and knowledge of the experiments is kept from personnel at the rochester area End quote polonium injections at rochester in addition to the subjects injected with plutonium and uranium at rochester five subjects were chosen for an experiment with polonium the purpose of the experiment was to determine the excretion rate of polonium after a known dose as well as to analyze the uptake of polonium in various tissues the primary investigator for these experiments was dr robert m fink assistant professor of radiology 
and biophysics at the university of rochester four patients were injected with the element and one ingested it all five patients selected for this study were suffering from terminal forms of cancer lymphosarcoma acute lymphatic leukemia or chronic myeloid leukemia it is unclear why patients with malignant diseases were chosen as subjects in this experiment but excluded from the subject pools for the plutonium and uranium experiments there is no discussion in the 1950 final report on the polonium experiments of the possibility that patients with malignant diseases might have abnormal metabolism and the excretion data were employed right away in the establishment of occupational safety standards the final report unlike other reports on the manhattan district metabolism studies briefly discusses the question of consent Quote, the general problem was outlined to a number of hospital patients with no previous or probable future contact with polonium of the group that volunteered as subjects four men and one woman were selected for the excretion studies outlined below end quote. this statement leaves no clear impression of what the subjects actually were told like the experiments with plutonium and uranium the human polonium experiment was a classified component of the metabolism program. Still, this report provides a contrast to the contemporaneous reports on the Manhattan District Plutonium and Uranium experiments, which make no mention of consent and which do not refer to the patient subjects as volunteers. End of section 28. Recording by Patrick McAfee, Evanston. Section 29 of Final Report of the Advisory Committee on Human Radiation Experiments. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Patrick McAfee, Evanston. Final Report of the Advisory Committee on Human Radiation Experiments. Case Studies, Chapter 5, Part 3. The California Experiments. While the University of Rochester had been conducting experiments for the Manhattan Engineer District, a related effort was underway at the University of California at Berkeley. Before the war, doctors Joseph Hamilton and Robert Stone had been exploring medical applications of radioisotopes with the aid of the University of California's cyclotron. Hamilton and his colleagues had pioneered in using radioisotopes to treat cancer, in particular iodine, in the 1930s. At the time the United States entered the war, they were investigating another isotope for cancer therapy, strontium-89. Indeed, it was this area of Hamilton's expertise that attracted the interest of the Manhattan Project. While Stone moved to the Chicago Metallurgical Laboratory during the war, Hamilton remained at the University of California's Radiation Laboratory, or RAD Lab, at Berkeley. A colleague of both men, Dr. Earl Miller, a radiologist at the University of California, reported regularly to Stone on the progress of the Berkeley Plutonium Project. Under the Manhattan District contract, Hamilton's studies originally had involved exposing rats to plutonium in an effort to determine its metabolic fate and thereby project the risk to workers at atomic plants toward the end of the war hamilton began to conduct plutonium studies on humans for the government experiments with humans could be handled expeditiously hamilton wrote 
because of the close relationship between the Rad Lab and the medical school at the University of California at San Francisco. In January 1945, Hamilton confirmed to the Manhattan District that he planned, quote, to undertake on a limited scale a series of metabolic studies with plutonium using human subjects, end quote. The purpose of this work, Hamilton wrote, quote, was to evaluate the possible hazards to humans who might be exposed to them either in the course of the operation of the Chicago pile or in the event of possible enemy action against the military and civilian population, end quote. Subsequently, three subjects, two adults and one child, known as Cal 1, 2, and 3, were injected with plutonium. In addition, in April 1947, a teenage boy, Cal A, was injected with americium, and in January 1948, a 55-year-old female cancer patient, Cal Z, was injected with zirconium. On May 10, 1945, Hamilton reported he was awaiting, quote, a suitable patient, end quote, for the plutonium experiment. Four days later, 58-year-old Albert Stevens, designated Cal-1, was injected with plutonium, becoming the first human subject in the California portion of the project. Albert Stevens was chosen in the belief that he was suffering from advanced stomach cancer. Shortly after the injection, however, a biopsy revealed a benign gastric ulcer instead of the suspected cancer. The researchers collected excreta daily for almost one year, analyzing them for plutonium content. Evidently, by two months after the injection, Mr. Stevens was considering moving out of the Berkeley area. This would have presented further collection of excretion specimens. Dr. Hamilton proposed to Dr. Stone and Stafford Warren that he be permitted to pay the man $50 per month in order to keep Mr. Stevens in the area. Hamilton recognized, however, that there were possible legal and security situations which may present insurmountable obstacles. In response to this request, Dr. Joe Howland, who was reportedly involved with the Oak Ridge plutonium injection, wrote the following to the California area engineer. Quote, Possible solutions to this problem could be A. Pay for his care in a hospital or nursing home as a service. B. Place this individual on Dr. Hamilton's payroll in some minor capacity without release of any classified information. It is not recommended that he be paid as an experimental subject only. End quote. According to a 1979 oral history of Kenneth Scott, an investigator at Berkeley who evidently was responsible for the analysis of Mr. Stevens's excretion specimens, the patient was paid some amount each month to keep him in the area. However, Dr. Scott also recalled that he never told Mr. Stevens what had happened to him. Quote, his sister was a nurse, and she was very suspicious of me, but to my knowledge, he never found out. End quote. In addition, an April 1946 report on the experiment records that, quote, several highly important tissue samples were secured, including bone, end quote. It appears that these tissue specimens, which included specimens of rib and spleen, were removed four days after the injection in an operation for the patient's suspected stomach cancer. Four months after Mr. Stevens was injected, Dr. Hamilton told the Manhattan District that the next subject would be injected, quote, along with PU-238 plutonium, small amounts of radioetrium, radiostrontium, and radiocerium. 
end quote. The purpose of this experiment was to, quote, compare in man the behavior of these three representative long-lived fission products with their metabolic properties in the rat, and second, a comparison can be made of the differences in their behavior from that of plutonium, end quote. This research would provide data to improve extrapolation from higher-dose animal experiments. Despite Hamilton's hope to have a second patient by the fall, Cal-2 was not selected until April 1946. Simeon Shaw was a four-year-old Australian boy suffering from osteogenic sarcoma, a rare form of bone cancer who was flown from Australia to the University of California for treatment. According to newspaper articles at the time, Simeon's family had been advised by an Australian physician to seek treatment at the University of California. Arrangements then were made by the Red Cross and the U.S. Army for Simeon and his mother to fly by Army aircraft to San Francisco. Within days, he had been injected with a solution containing plutonium, yttrium, and cerium by physicians at the university. Following his discharge on May 25, about a month after his injection, the boy returned to Australia, and no follow-up was conducted. He died in January 1947. In February 1995, an ad hoc committee at the University of California at San Francisco, UCSF, concluded that probably at least part of the motivation for this experiment was to gather scientific data on the disposition of bone-seeking radionuclides with bone cancers. One piece of evidence indicating that there was a secondary research purpose for the injection of Cal-2 was a handwritten note in the boy's medical record saying that the surgeons removed a section of the bone tumor for pathology and for studies to determine the rate of uptake of radioactive materials that had been injected prior to surgery in comparison to normal tissues. It is likely that the Cal-2 experiment was designed both to acquire data for the Manhattan District and also to further the physician's own search for radioisotopes that might treat cancer in future patients. The California researchers themselves noted the dual purpose of their research at the time. Hamilton wrote in a report to the Army in the fall of 1945 that there were, quote, military considerations which can be significantly aided by the results of properly planned tracer research, end quote. As the February 1995 UCSF report on the experiments concluded, however, the, quote, injections of plutonium were not expected to be, nor were they, therapeutic or of medical benefit to the patients, end quote. This corresponds with the evidence of a letter written by Hamilton in July 1946, three months after the injection of Cal-2, to the author of an article on the peacetime implications of wartime medical discoveries. Quote, to date, no fission products, aside from radioactive iodine, have been employed for any therapeutic purposes. There is a possibility that one or more of the long list of radioactive elements produced by uranium fission may be of practical therapeutic value. At the present time, however, we can do no more than speculate. End quote. Documentary evidence suggests that consent for the injections likely was not obtained from at least some of the subjects at the University of California. A 1946 letter from T.S. Chapman with the Manhattan District's Research Division said the following regarding preparations for injections. Quote, preparations were being made for injection in humans by doctors Robert Stone and Earl Miller. These doctors state that the injections would probably be made without the knowledge of the patient 
and that the physicians assumed full responsibility. Such injections were not divergent from the normal experimental method in the hospital, and the patient signed no release. A release was held to be invalid. The medical division of the district office has referred P reports for the project 48A to Colonel Cooney for review and approval is withheld pending his opinion. End quote. Chapman does not specify whether the injections referred to in this letter were injections of plutonium or of some other substance. It is unclear whether P reports refers to Hamilton's overall progress reports on his tracer research, which had reported mostly on research with plutonium, but also on research with cerium and yttrium, or whether P referred specifically to reports on work with plutonium. As we noted at the outset of this chapter, Chapman's claim that it was commonplace at the time to use patients in experiments without their knowledge and without asking them to sign a release is correct. In the case of Albert Stevens, Cal 1, no documentary evidence that bears on disclosure or consent has been found. Simeon Shaw's, Cal 2's, medical file contains a standard form, quote, consent for operation and or administration of anesthetic, end quote. This form, however, was signed by a witness attesting to consent of Simeon's mother one week after the injection, and therefore probably applies to a biopsy done a week after the injection, not to the injection itself. On December 24, 1946, at the prompting of Major Burchard M. Brundage, who was chief of the Manhattan District's Medical Division, Colonel K.D. Nichols, commander of the Manhattan District, ordered a halt to injections of, quote, certain radioactive substances, end quote, into human subjects at the University of California. Quote, such work, Nichols wrote, does not come under the scope of the Manhattan District programs and should not be made a part of its research plan. It is therefore deemed advisable by this office not only to recommend against work on human subjects, but also to deny authority for such work under the terms of the Manhattan contract, end quote. The following week, the civilian AEC took over responsibility for all Manhattan District research and temporarily reaffirmed the Manhattan District's suspension of human experimentation at the University of California. It is unclear why this action was taken. The AEC's reaction, preserving secrecy while requiring disclosure. When the Civilian Atomic Energy Commission took over for the Manhattan District on January 1, 1947, the plutonium injections provoked a strong reaction at the highest levels. One immediate result was the decision to keep information on the plutonium injections secret. Evidently for reasons not directly related to national security, but because of public relations and legal liability concerns. The other immediate result, as we saw in Chapter 1, was the issuing of requirements for future human subjects research as articulated in letters by the AEC's general manager, Carol Wilson. In December 1946, as the civilian AEC was about to open its doors, Heimer Friedel, who had been deputy medical director of the Manhattan Engineer District, recommended the declassification of one of the plutonium reports, C.H. Chicago 3607, the distribution and excretion of plutonium in two human subjects. The report, Friedel argued, Quote, will not, in my opinion, result in the release of information beyond that authorized for disclosure by the current declassification guide, End quote. 
Friedel's recommendation was soon reversed. Officials with the new AEC had learned of the human injection experiments, and on February 28, 1947, an AEC declassification officer concluded that declassification was out of the question. The reasons are revealed in a previously classified document recently found at Oak Ridge. Quote, the document, CH3607, appears to be the most dangerous since it describes experiments performed on human subjects, including the actual injection of the metal plutonium into the body. The locations of these experiments are given and the results even to the autopsy findings in the two cases. It is unlikely that these tests were made without the consent of the subjects, but no statement is made to that effect and the coldly scientific manner in which the results are tabulated and discussed would have a very poor effect on the public. Unless, of course, the legal aspects were covered by the necessary documents, the experimenters and the employing agencies, including the U.S., have been laid open to a devastating lawsuit which would, through its attendant publicity, have far-reaching results, End quote. It is not clear to the advisory committee on what basis the declassification officer who wrote this comment concluded that it was unlikely that consent was not obtained from the Chicago subjects. This statement could be read as careful bureaucratic language intended to leave an appropriate paper trail in the event of subsequent legal problems. On the other hand, the statement does support the claim noted earlier made by one of the Chicago doctors in 1974 that some form of oral consent for the injections had been obtained from the Chicago subjects. It is clear that there was no documentation of disclosure or consent on which the AEC could rely. As a consequence, secrecy was to be maintained, not as a defense against foreign powers, but to avoid, quote, a devastating lawsuit, end quote, and, Quote, attendant publicity, end quote. Upon further review, the report was, quote, reclassified, restricted on 3-31-47, end quote. In a March 19, 1947 memorandum, Major Brundage, by that time chief of the AEC's medical division, explained, quote, the medical division also agrees with public relations that it would be unwise to release the paper distribution and excretion of plutonium, primarily because of medical legal aspects in the use of plutonium in human beings, and secondly, because of the objections of Dr. Warren and Colonel Cooney that plutonium is not available for extra commission experimental work, and thus this paper's distribution is not essential to off-project experimental procedures. In July 1947, Argonne National Laboratory's declassification officer, Hoyland D. Young, inquired about possible declassification of this report as well as Hamilton's report on the Cal-1 injection. She stated that the directors of Argonne's biology and health divisions, including J.J. Nixon, one of the authors of the Chicago report on the injections, believed that declassification of these reports would not be, quote, prejudicial to the national interests, end quote. The AEC continued to withhold declassification of these reports, however, on the grounds that they involved, quote, experimentation on human subjects where the material was not given for therapeutic reasons, end quote. 
Thus, there was clearly no expectation at the time that the plutonium injections would benefit the patient subjects, but some expectation that the general public might be disturbed by human experimentation in the absence of a prospect of offsetting benefit. In 1950, Wright Langham and the Rochester doctors undertook to prepare a plutonium report that would be, quote, the last word on the plutonium situation. It would be the last word to only a select few. In 1947, Rochester's Andrew Dowdy had urged Los Alamos to give advance notice of declassification of the Rochester part of the experiment, quote, because of possible unfavorable public relations and in an attempt to protect Dr. Samuel Bassett from any possible legal entanglements, end quote. This is likely a reference to the same concern raised in the discussion of Dr. Bassett's seminar about his having experimented upon his own patients, except in this case, the context is the plutonium rather than the uranium injections. Quote, we think, Langen wrote to Stafford Warren, the classification will be secret and the circulation limited depending on Dr. Shields Warren's, the head of AEC's Division of Biology and Medicine, wishes, end quote. In August, Shields Warren approved the report for confidential classification and limited circulation, as Dr. Langham requested. Even though its data and analysis were the basis for widespread plutonium safety procedures, the report remained unavailable to the public until 1971, when, at the urging of Dr. Patricia Durbin, it was downgraded to official use only. This categorization means that while the document was not likely to be released to the public absent specific request, it could be disclosed. What was it that was so potentially embarrassing about the plutonium experiments? The answer appears to lie in the 1947 letters from General Manager Wilson, discussed in detail in Chapter 1. These letters state rules for both the conduct of human experiments and the declassification of previously conducted secret experiments. In his April 1947 letter, Wilson stated the requirements that there be expectation that research, quote, may have therapeutic effect, end quote, and that at least two doctors, quote, certify in writing made part of an official record to the patient's understanding state of mind, to the explanation furnished him, and to his willingness to accept the treatment, end quote. In his November 1947 letter, Wilson reiterated these terms for human experiments, again calling for, quote, reasonable hope that the administration of such a substance will improve the condition of patient, end quote and this time calling for, quote, informed consent in writing, end quote, by the patient. All of the 17 plutonium injections conducted prior to the letters violated both these terms. As a consequence, they would have to stay secret. The only secret experiments that could be declassified were those that satisfied these requirements, to do otherwise was to risk adverse public reaction. Thus, the decision to keep the plutonium reports secret was itself an example of the way in which the AEC's assertion of conditions for human experimentation was coupled with the decision to keep secret those experiments that evidently did not adhere to these conditions. See Chapter 13. End of section 29. Recording by Patrick McAfee, Evanston.
Section 30 of Final Report of the Advisory Committee on Human Radiation Experiments. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Patrick McAfee, Evanston. Final Report of the Advisory Committee on Human Radiation Experiments. Case Studies. Chapter 5, Part 4 Human Experimentation Continues In March 1947, just as he was declaring that quote, public relations, end quote, required the reclassification of plutonium data, Medical Division Chief Major Brundage approved a 1947-48, quote, research program and budget, end quote, for Rochester that provided for metabolism studies with polonium, plutonium, uranium, thorium, radio lead, and radium. The program was put on hold by the AEC soon after. The future of the metabolism work at Rochester apparently was decided when Shields Warren was named the first chief of the AEC's Division of Biology and Medicine in fall 1947. In his private diary for December 30, 1947, Warren tersely noted, quote, ordered abandonment of human isotope program at Rochester, end quote. The program at the University of California at Berkeley, however, continued. On December 4, 1947, Shields Warren had met with Hamilton and Stone, the decision to allow the program to continue clearly was not a hasty one. A 1974 recollection of Shields Warren indicates that his decision to allow the program to continue may have been due to Hamilton's assertion in December 1947 that it had been the University of California's practice to obtain some form of undocumented consent. According to Warren, Hamilton had said that subjects were told, quote, they would receive an injection of a new substance that was too new to say what it might do, but that it had some properties like other substances that had been used to control growth processes in patients, or something of that general sort, end quote. Warren went on to observe that, quote, you could not call it informed consent because they did not know what it was, but they knew that it was a new and to them unknown substance, end quote. Warren's observation does not go far enough, however. If Warren's secondhand account is accurate, and this is indeed what the patient subjects at the University of California were told, then they were more misled than informed. Analogizing plutonium to substances that, quote, control growth processes in patients, end quote, even in prospect, might reasonably lead patients to believe that they would be receiving a substance with some hope of treating their cancer. Certainly such a remark would not communicate to patients that the experiment to be performed was not for their own benefit it would have been appropriate that these patients be told that their participation might benefit future patients with the same conditions. It would have been crucial to distinguish, however, between this legitimate explanation of potential benefit to future cancer patients and misleading the patient into believing the experiment might benefit him or her. Human experimentation continues at the University of California. By the summer of 1947, human experimentation had resumed at the University of California under AEC contract. In June, Cal A., a teenage Asian American bone cancer patient at Chinese Hospital in San Francisco, was injected with americium. An instruction in the patient's file by one of Hamilton's assistants specifies that, quote, we will use the same procedure as with Mr. S. End quote. Evidently, a reference to Albert Stevens. Dr. Durbin, Hamilton's associate, 
believes that Cal A's guardian was informed of the procedure followed in that case. The advisory committee received incomplete records for Cal A that contained no evidence of disclosure or consent. UCSF has told the committee that records at Chinese Hospital from the 1950s and earlier have been destroyed. A 36-year-old African-American railroad porter named Elmer Allen, codenamed Cal-3, was believed to be suffering from bone cancer and was injected with plutonium at the University of California in July 1947. His left leg was amputated shortly thereafter. There is a note in his medical chart signed by two physicians stating that the experimental nature was, quote, explained to the patient who agreed to the procedure, end quote, and that, quote, the patient was in fully oriented and insane mind, end quote. It is likely that this note was intended to fulfill one of the April 1947 conditions for human experimentation, which allowed for such a procedure as documentation of having obtained the patient subject's consent. It is not clear from the note, however, whether in explaining about the experimental nature of the procedure, the physicians told the patient about the potential effects of the injection, as required by the Wilson letter, or that the injection was not intended to be of medical benefit to the patient. On this second point, the injection was in violation of the Wilson letter, which also required that there be an, quote, expectation that it may have therapeutic effect, end quote. As acknowledged by the February 1995 UCSF report, there was never any expectation on the part of the experimenters that the injection would be of therapeutic benefit to Mr. Allen. Mr. Allen lived until 1991. According to UCSF's 1995 Review of Patient Subjects Medical Charts, upon biopsy of his tumor, a pathologic diagnosis was made of chondrosarcoma, a type of malignant bone tumor. UCSF reported that patients with this type of tumor, quote, frequently survive many years beyond diagnosis if there is complete excision of the primary tumor, end quote. This pathology finding suggests that Mr. Allen was a long-term cancer survivor. A note in his patient chart recorded that the tumor was Quote, malignant but slow growing and late to metastasize. Prognosis therefore moderately good. End quote. On March 15, 1995, Elmerine Whitfield Bell, the daughter of Elmer Allen, told the advisory committee in Washington, D.C. that she quote, continues to be appalled by the apparent attempts at cover ups, the inferences, that the nature of the times, the 1940s, allowed scientists to conduct experiments without getting a patient's consent or without mentioning risks. We contend that my father was not an informed participant in the plutonium experiment. He was asked to sign his name several times while a patient at the University of California Hospital in San Francisco. Why was he not asked to sign his name permitting scientists to inject him with plutonium? Why was his wife, who was college trained, not consulted in this matter? End quote. On January 5, 1948, a 55-year-old woman with cancer was injected with zirconium at the University of California. The patient record for this case has not yet been located, nor have any other documents that might bear on whether this experiment was conducted in compliance with the consent requirements of the Wilson letters. We do know that the injection of zirconium was not expected to benefit the subject herself. A secret report on the zirconium injection 
was reviewed by the AEC in light of public relations and liability concerns. In August of that year, the report was denied declassification with the approval of Shields Warren, who wrote, quote, this document should not be declassified for general medical publication, and it would be very difficult to rewrite it in an acceptable manner, end quote. Warren was responding to a memorandum from Albert H. Holland, Jr., medical advisor at Oak Ridge, which specified that the concern about rewriting had to do with public relations and the fact that the report, quote, specifically involves experimental human therapeutics, end quote. Follow-up of the patient subjects at Rochester. The investigators at Rochester and the AEC were interested in obtaining long-term data from surviving subjects on excretion levels and the distribution of plutonium in various tissues. Follow-up studies at Rochester continued at least through 1953 with two of the subjects in the HP series, Ida Charlton and John Musso. We have already noted Wright Langham's 1950 instruction to the physicians at Rochester, suggesting that they were not to give these patients any indication of the true purpose of the follow-up studies. In addition, Langham sought help in early 1950 to locate Ebb Cade, the man injected at Oak Ridge Hospital, for follow-up excretion studies. Langham asked Dr. Albert Holland at Oak Ridge to try to locate Mr. Cade and to keep his, quote, eyes open for a possible autopsy, end quote. It is unclear to the committee whether follow-up of any kind was ever done with Mr. Cade. On June 8, 1953, Ida Charlton's rib was removed during exploratory surgery for cancer and analyzed for plutonium. Louis Hempelman, who by that time had moved from Los Alamos to Strong Memorial Hospital at Rochester, wrote to Charles Dunham of the AEC's Division of Biology and Medicine in advance of the procedure. Quote, the patient in question was brought in for a skeletal survey and turned out to have a coin-like lesion inside the chest wall. It is undoubtedly an incidental finding, but she must be explored by the chest surgeon here at Strong. In the course of the operation, he will remove a rib, which we can analyze. Her films show the same type of minimal indefinite change in the bone that the others have had, end quote. It was standard practice at the time to remove a section of rib incidental to lung surgery. It is clear that the patient was still being followed for long-term effects of plutonium and that some subclinical bone changes of unclear significance had already been observed by this time. Therefore, the examination of this rib segment would have included special tests to determine whether plutonium was present. On August 31, 1950, an internal DBM memorandum recorded the understanding of some AEC officials that Wright Langham and Rochester doctors were engaged in follow-up studies. In a 1974 interview, however, Shields Warren recalled that he had no knowledge that the patients were the subjects of follow-up studies. Quote, I did not learn of this continuing contact while I was in office at AEC. I had assumed because I had been told they were incurable patients that they all had died by the time we talked. End quote. Additional follow-up studies and the Argonne Exhumation Project. In 1968, Dr. Patricia Durbin undertook an investigation of the plutonium injection subjects 
which included a reevaluation of the original plutonium data. Her goal was to pursue, quote, some elusive information on PU in man and the information or assumptions about physiology needed to create a believable PU model for man, end quote. She, quote, decided to look at all the old PU patients as individuals rather than in a lump, end quote. Durbin was surprised to find in her search for the original experimental data that the University of California data were drawn from three subjects who received plutonium and one who received americium. The data from only one plutonium subject from California had previously been reported in the open scientific literature. Durbin asked the original researchers why these data had not been analyzed. She wrote, quote, I understand from Wright Langham that this problem has been discussed before and discarded as too messy, end quote. In 1972, after the classified report on the experiments had been downgraded to official use only, she went on to publish, quote, Plutonium in Man, A New Look at the Old Data, end quote a landmark paper in the plutonium story. This was the first review in the open literature to analyze Langham's results in light of the actual medical conditions of the patient subjects. Because of the prolonged secrecy surrounding the experiments, it was generally not known that two of the three University of California cases had been omitted from the 1950 analysis. The report also revealed in retrospect that all the patients were not hopelessly or terminally ill, as had been suggested in Langham's later public references, that some were still alive and that some had been misdiagnosed. In December 1972, Argonne National Laboratory's Center for Human Radiobiology, CHR, to whom Durbin had provided the names of surviving subjects, began a review of the data from all 18 people who were injected with plutonium between 1945 and 1947. CHR was the national center designated by the AEC to do long-term follow-up of individuals with internally deposited radionuclides, primarily the radium dial painters. Argonne's follow-up plan for the plutonium experiments was to uncover the post-injection medical histories of all the subjects, obtain biological material from those still living, and exhume and study the bodies of those deceased in order to, quote, provide data on the organ contents at long times after acquisition of plutonium, end quote. In 1973, three patients, Eda Charlton, John Musso, and Elmer Allen, were admitted to the University of Rochester's metabolic ward for more excretion studies paid for by CHR. Elmer Allen had first been brought to Argonne, where an unsuccessful attempt had been made to detect plutonium by external counting techniques. In the course of his examination, however, CHR found subclinical bone changes that an argon radiologist characterized as, quote, suggestive of damage due to radiation, end quote. Again, there was no disclosure to the subjects that they were now being followed because they had been subjects of an experiment that had been unrelated to their medical care, an experiment in which there was continuing scientific interest. The 1974 AEC investigation concluded that, in the case of the surviving Rochester subjects, Dr. Waterhouse who conducted the follow-up studies with these patients for Argonne, had not told them the purpose of the studies in 1973 
because she believed, quote, that disclosure might be harmful to them in view of their advanced age and ill health, end quote. This suggests that Dr. Waterhouse had well-intentioned motivations for not being straightforward with the Rochester subjects. It also suggests that these subjects had not been told the truth about the experiments at the time the injections occurred or that they had forgotten. According to Dr. Waterhouse, the studies were feasible without the subject's knowledge of the true purpose of the research, since these two patients, quote, were accustomed to participating in clinical studies unrelated to this matter involving the collection of excretion specimens, end quote. Elmer Allen's physician was told by C.H.R. that the purpose of bringing Mr. Allen to Argonne's C.H.R. and the University of Rochester for follow-up was interest in the treatment he received at the University of California in 1947 for his cancer. This use of the term treatment in the information provided Mr. Allen's physician which he presumably relayed to Mr. Allen and his family, was deceptive and manipulative. It implied that the injection Mr. Allen received had been given as therapy for his benefit. The second component of this follow-up study was research on the exhumed bodies of deceased subjects. The 1974 AEC investigation concluded that the families were not informed that plutonium had been injected. Instead, they were told that, quote, the purpose of exhumation was to examine the remains in order to determine the microscopic distribution of residual radioactivity from past medical treatment, end quote, and that the subjects had received an unknown mixture of radioactive isotopes. The investigation concluded that such disclosure, quote, could be judged misleading in that the radioactive isotopes were represented as having been injected as an experimental treatment for the patient's disease, end quote. Thus, the families of the deceased subjects, as well as those subjects still surviving, were deceived by officials of the AEC. A December 1972 intralaboratory memorandum written by an Argonne investigator instructs that, quote, outside of CHR, we will never use the word plutonium in regard to these cases. These individuals are of interest to us because they may have received a radioactive material at some time is the kind of statement to be made if we need to say anything at all, end quote. Robert E. Rowland, the author of this memorandum, told advisory committee staff in 1995 that he had written this after he had been instructed earlier that month by Dr. James Liverman, director of the AEC's Division of Biomedical and Environmental Research, that, quote, I could not tell the individuals that they were given plutonium. I protested that they must be given a reason for our interest in them, and I was told to tell them that they had received an unknown mixture of radioisotopes in the past and that we wanted to determine if it was still in their bodies. Further, we were not to divulge the names of the institutions where they received this unknown mixture." End quote. Dr. Rowland said he had received these instructions during a trip to Washington, D.C. to obtain approval and funding for the study. Dr. Liverman told advisory committee staff that he has, quote, no recollection of discussions with anyone in which some stricture would have been placed on what could be discussed with the patients. That is a medical ethics issue which would have been left to the physicians, end quote. This study was not brought to the attention of the Argonne Human Use Committee until November 1973, even though it had been established in January 1973. 
See Chapter 6 for a discussion of human use committees. In a briefing for the 1974 AEC investigation, Dr. Liverman attributed this failure to bring the study before the Human Use Committee to the following factors. Quote, 1. Argonne's opinion that the studies came under the scope of a protocol approved by that committee in 1971. 2. The nature of the studies was to be suppressed to avoid embarrassing publicity for AEC. End quote. In 1974, the AEC informed at least two of the four subjects, Ida Charlton and John Musso, of the plutonium injections and had them sign documents to this effect. These documents did not provide any information on possible effects of the injections, although they did describe the purpose as having been, quote, to determine how plutonium, a man-made radioactive material, is deposited and excreted in the human body, end quote. One living patient, Jan Statt, was not told because it was her attending physician's opinion that her condition was precarious and that disclosure in this case would be, quote, medically indefensible, end quote. This judgment, like that of Dr. Waterhouse's, exemplifies how physicians of the time commonly managed the information they shared with their patients. Physicians typically told patients only what they thought it was helpful for them to know. If, in the physician's judgment, information might cause the patient to become upset or distressed, this was often considered reason enough to withhold it. The judgment also suggests that Miss Statt, like Miss Charlton and Mr. Musso, had not been told the truth about the experiments at the time the injections occurred or that she had forgotten. The AEC recommended that exhumations continue, but only with full disclosure to the subjects next of kin. The Boston Project Uranium Injections Human experiments conducted to measure the excretion and distribution of atomic weapons materials did not stop with the last of the injections at the University of California. The Boston Project Human Uranium Injection Experiments were conducted from 1953 to 1957 at Massachusetts General Hospital, MGH, as part of of a cooperative project between the hospital and the Health Physics Division of Oak Ridge National Laboratory. Eleven patients with terminal conditions were injected with uranium, although data obtained from three of these subjects were never published. The ORNL and the AEC undertook the Boston project to obtain better data for the development of worker safety standards. One of the investigators wrote that the Boston project would provide, quote, a wonderful opportunity to secure human data for the analysis and interpretation of industrial exposures, end quote. The occupational standards for uranium at the time were based on animal data and on the experiment conducted at Rochester in the 1940s. No autopsy data were obtained from this earlier experiment at Rochester, however, since none of the patients had terminal diseases. Thus, wrote a Boston Project investigator, quote, the uncertainty, insofar as the distribution of uranium was concerned, was not reduced by the Rochester experiment or could not even be determined, end quote. The Boston Project involved a second purpose, the search for a radioisotope that would localize in a certain type of brain tumor called glioblastomas and destroy them when activated by a beam of neutrons. This had long been the research interest of Dr. William Sweet at MGH. At the time, these tumors were clearly diagnosable and 100% fatal, and there was no effective treatment. 
This research involved many radioisotopes over the years, most notably isotopes of boron and phosphorus. It is unclear whether Dr. Sweet would have tested uranium without ORNL's involvement or whether it would have been made available to him by the AEC. Dr. Sweet has indicated to the committee that he was interested in the potential of uranium as a therapeutic agent prior to being approached by the AEC about the possibility of conducting a joint project. The Boston Project produced data on the distribution of uranium in the human body that the earlier Manhattan District uranium studies had not provided. The data obtained indicated that uranium, at least at the dose levels used in the Boston Project, localized in the human kidney at higher concentrations than small animal data had predicted, and that therefore the maximum permissible levels for uranium in water and air might be unsafe. Recommendations made by the investigators of the Boston Project for more conservative occupational standards were apparently not heeded, however. The accepted occupational levels for uranium became less rather than more conservative over the years, despite the findings of the Boston Project. Hopes that uranium would localize sufficiently in brain tumors to be of potential therapeutic use were unfulfilled. In a 1979 interview, Robert Bernard, one of the health physicists at ORNL, most intimately involved with the study, was asked if during the experiment uranium was showing any promise as a treatment. Quote, no, it concentrated in the kidney just like Rochester said back in the 40s. They got brain tumor samples. There was very little uranium present, but Sweet was still wondering. Maybe it was not a high enough dose. End quote. In a 1995 interview, Carl Morgan, head of the Health Physics Division of ORNL at the time of the Boston Project, indicated that the project was ultimately discontinued in 1957 because of the concerns of an ORNL health physicist. Quote, he felt that the patients were given very large doses of uranium, which our data had indicated, that is, the data we collected at ORNL, in setting permissible doses, would be very harmful. I immediately canceled our participation in the program. Apparently, they were given doses that were many times the permissible body burden. End quote. In their application to their radioisotope committee, MGH investigators clearly recorded that the proposed dose of 2.12 rem per week quote, exceeds maximum permissible exposure rate of 0 0.3 rem per week, but patients are terminal, end quote. At least one of the subjects was selected for the distribution part of the study only. Reports describe the patients as, quote, virtually all, end quote, having malignant brain tumors. Newly available documents indicate that at least one patient injected with uranium did not have a brain tumor at all. An unidentified male, identity and age still unknown at the time of his death, became Boston Project subject, Roman numeral six, when he, quote, was brought to the emergency ward after being found unconscious. No other information was obtainable, end quote. According to his autopsy report, this patient was suffering from a subdural hematoma, a severe hemorrhage on his brain. There was clearly no benefit intended for this patient from the injection of uranium, but there is evidence of harm attributable to the injection. His autopsy report records clinical evidence of mild kidney failure and pathological evidence of 
nephrosis, damage to the kidney tubules from the chemical toxicity of uranium metal. The report also records that, quote, the liver, spleen, kidneys, and bone marrow showed evidence of radiation, end quote. Even for the patient subjects with brain cancer, there was no expectation on the part of investigators that the experiment would benefit the subjects themselves. The object of the experiment was to test whether uranium would localize sufficiently in brain tumors to be of therapeutic value in the future. In order for uranium to have had therapeutic potential for patient subjects, exposure to a reactor's neutron beam would have been necessary to then activate the uranium if it had localized sufficiently in the tumors, which it did not. There was, however, no plan to expose these patients to a neutron beam. The goal was to see whether the concentration would justify further research that would involve exposure to a neutron beam. Most of the subjects were already comatose and, quote, in the terminal phase of severe irreversible central nervous system disease, end quote. The doses used in the Boston Project were high. The lowest dose was comparable to the highest used in the earlier Rochester uranium experiment, a dose that had caused detectable kidney damage in one of the Rochester subjects. One document records that at least two Boston Project subjects, in addition to subject Roman numeral six, had kidney damage at the time of death, although this document does not directly link this damage to the uranium injections. There is no discussion of consent in any of the Boston Project reports. It appears that ORNL left such considerations to Dr. Sweet and MGH. In an interim report, ORNL discusses the division of responsibility in the experiment. Quote, it was agreed that the Y-12 Health Physics Department at Oak Ridge would prepare injection solutions and perform the analytical work associated with this joint effort. Massachusetts General Hospital agreed to select the patients, perform the injections, and care for the patients during the period of study. End quote. Dr. Sweet told the advisory committee in 1995 that it was his practice to obtain consent from patients or from their families and, quote, scrupulously to give a patient all the information we had ourselves, end quote. The committee has not been able to locate any documents that bear on questions of disclosure or consent for this experiment. The case of the Boston Project subject who was brought into the hospital after being found unconscious and who, according to his autopsy report, was never identified and never regained consciousness, indicates that this rule was not applied universally. End of section 30. Recording by Patrick McAfee, Evanston. Section 31 of Final Report of the Advisory Committee on Human Radiation Experiments. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Patrick McAfee, Evanston. Final Report of the Advisory Committee on Human Radiation Experiments. Case Studies. Chapter 5, Part 5 Conclusion From 1945 through 1947, Manhattan Project researchers injected 18 human subjects with plutonium, 5 human subjects with polonium, and 6 human subjects with uranium to obtain metabolic data related to the safety of those working on the production of nuclear weapons. All of these subjects were patients hospitalized at facilities affiliated with the universities of Rochester, California, and Chicago, or at Oak Ridge. 
Another set of experiments took place between 1953 and 1957 at Massachusetts General Hospital, in which human subjects were injected with uranium. In no case was there any expectation that these patient subjects would benefit medically from the injections. At 50 years remove, it is in some respects remarkable that so much information has survived that bears on the question of what the patient's subjects and their families were told. Particularly for the Manhattan Project plutonium experiments, information is available in large part because of the 1974 AEC inquiry in which interviews with principals of these experiments were conducted and records of these interviews maintained. At the same time, however, there are significant gaps in the record for all the experiments. Particularly where the evidence is skimpy, it is possible that some of the patient subjects agreed to be used in non-therapeutic experiments, but the picture that emerges suggests otherwise. This picture is bolstered by the historical context. As we discussed in Chapter 2, it was not uncommon in the 1940s and 1950s for physician investigators to experiment on patients without their knowledge or consent, even where the patients could not benefit medically from the experimental procedures. This context is referenced in a 1946 letter about the University of California injections. Quote, these doctors state that the injections would probably be made without the knowledge of the patient. Such injections were not divergent from the normal experimental method in the hospital. End quote. Here we present our conclusions about the ethics of these experiments. First, for the set of experiments conducted between 1945 and 1947, and then for the experiment conducted from 1953 to 1957. Because the facts appear to be different in the different institutions at which these experiments took place, we summarize what we have learned about risk, disclosure, and consent at each location. We also analyze the ethical issues the experiments raise in common. In our analysis, we focus on whether the subjects consented to being used in experiments from which they could not benefit medically, and the extent to which the subjects were exposed to risk of harm. We also focus on the particular ethical considerations raised when research is conducted on patients at the end of their lives. All but one member of the advisory committee believe that what follows is the most plausible interpretation of the available evidence in light of the historical context. With one exception, the historical record suggests that these patient subjects were not told that they were to be used in experiments for which there was no expectation they would benefit medically and, as a consequence, it is unlikely they consented to this use of their person. In the case of the plutonium experiments, there was no reason to think that the injections would cause any acute effects in the subjects. This was not true, however, in the case of the Rochester uranium experiments. Both the plutonium and the Rochester uranium experiments put the subjects at risk of developing cancer in 10 or 20 years' time. In some cases, this risk was eliminated by the selection of subjects who were likely to die in the near future. The selection of subjects with chronic illnesses was also an apparent strategy to contain this long-term risk of cancer. However, some of these subjects lived for far longer than 10 years, and some were misdiagnosed altogether. On the basis of available evidence, we could not conclude that any individual was or was not physically harmed as a result of the plutonium injections. There is some evidence that there were observable subclinical bone changes of unclear significance in at least two surviving subjects who were followed up in 
1953 and 1973, and in one deceased subject who was exhumed in 1973. The uranium injections at Rochester were designed to produce minimal detectable harm. That was the end point of the experiment. Such minimal damage is reported to have occurred in the sixth patient of the series. In the case of Mr. Cade at Oak Ridge, a physician claiming to have injected Mr. Cade reported that his consent was not obtained. An apparently healthy man in his early 50s, Mr. Cade was put at some probably small risk of cancer by the plutonium injection. At the University of Chicago, the only evidence that bears on disclosure and consent comes from an interview with a Chicago investigator conducted as part of the AEC's 1974 inquiry. The investigator was recorded as saying that in obtaining consent, patients were told that the radioactive substance to be injected, quote, was not necessarily for the benefit of the patients, but might help other people, end quote. This statement is misleading. It suggests that there was some chance these patient subjects might benefit when there was no such expectation. At the same time, however, this statement suggests that the subjects at Chicago were told something. These subjects also were all apparently terminally ill and thus at no risk of developing plutonium-induced cancer. At least two of the three were known to have died within one year of the injection. Misleading language was purportedly also used with subjects at the University of California, where a second-hand account suggests that subjects were told they were to be injected with a new substance that, quote, had some properties like other substances that had been used to control growth processes in patients, end quote. Language in a 1946 letter suggests that at least some of the injections at the University of California may have occurred altogether without the knowledge of the patients. In the case of Mr. Allen, one of the California subjects, two physicians attested that the experimental nature of the procedure had been explained to Mr. Allen and that he had consented. And yet Mr. Allen's physician was subsequently informed that the follow-up studies were in relation to treatment Mr. Allen had received at the University of California. This suggests that while Mr. Allen may have been told the procedure was experimental, it is not likely he was told that the procedure was part of an experiment in which there was no expectation that he would benefit medically. Both Mr. Allen and Mr. Stevens survived long enough after injection to be at risk of plutonium-induced cancer. All the available evidence suggests that none of the subjects injected with either plutonium or uranium at Rochester knew or consented to their being used as subjects in experiments from which they could not benefit. This evidence comes from recollections of some of the individuals who were involved with the plutonium injections, as well as documents about seminars and follow-up studies in the early 1950s, suggesting that information about the experiments should be concealed from the subjects. Most of the subjects at Rochester had serious chronic illnesses. It is unclear how likely it was at the time that these patients would not survive more than 10 years. A few of these subjects were still alive more than 20 years after the injections. None of the plutonium subjects, but all of the uranium subjects, were put at risk of acute effects from the experiment. The purpose of the 1973 follow-up studies was withheld from two surviving subjects. Also, both Elmer Allen's physician and family members of deceased subjects were misled by AEC officials about the purpose of the follow-up studies.
They were told that the follow-up was in relation to past medical treatment, which was not true. It is unlikely that AEC officials would have lied about or otherwise attempted to conceal the purpose of the follow-up studies if at the outset the subjects had known and agreed to their being used as subjects in non-therapeutic experiments. It is also relevant that when the Atomic Energy Commission succeeded the Manhattan Project on January 1, 1947, officials decided to keep the plutonium injections secret. It appears that this decision was based on concerns about legal liability and adverse public reaction, not national security. The documents show that the AEC responded to the possibility that consent was not obtained in the plutonium experiments, as well as their lack of therapeutic benefit, by stating requirements for informed consent and therapeutic benefit for future research while still keeping the experiments secret. As a result of the decision to keep the injections secret, the subjects and their families, as well as the general public, were denied information about these experiments until the 1970s. The one likely exception to this picture of patients not knowing that they were used as subjects in experiments that would not benefit them is the polonium experiment conducted at Rochester. This is the one instance in which the patient subjects are said to have volunteered after being told about, quote, the general problem, end quote. Although there is no direct evidence that these subjects were told that the experiment was not for their benefit, the language of volunteering suggests a more forthright disclosure was made, more in keeping with the conventions in non-therapeutic research with healthy subjects than in research with patients, see chapter 2. We cannot reconcile the account of the polonium experiment with the historical record on the other injections. The advisory committee is persuaded that these experiments were motivated by a concern for national security and worker safety, and that particularly in the case of the plutonium injections, they produced results that continue to benefit workers in the nuclear industry today. However, with the possible exception of the polonium experiments, we believe that these experiments were unethical. In the conduct of these experiments, two basic moral principles were violated. That one ought not to use people as a mere means to the ends of others, and that one ought not to deceive others in the absence of any morally acceptable justification for such conduct. National security considerations may have required keeping secret the names of classified substances, but they would not have required using people as subjects in experiments without their knowledge or giving people the false impression that they or their family members had been given treatment when instead they had been given a substance that was not intended to be of benefit. The egregiousness of the disrespectful way in which the subjects of the injection experiments and their families were treated is heightened by the fact that the subjects were hospitalized patients. Their being ill and institutionalized left them vulnerable to exploitation. As patients, it would have been reasonable for them to assume that their physicians were acting in their best interests, even if they were being given experimental interventions. Instead, the physicians violated their fiduciary responsibilities by giving the patients substances from which there was no expectation they would benefit and whose effects were uncertain. This is clearest at Rochester, where at least the uranium subjects and perhaps the plutonium subjects were apparently the personal patients of the principal investigator. Concern for minimizing risk of harm to subjects is evident in several of the planning documents 
relating to the experiments, an obligation that many of those involved apparently took seriously. At Chicago, for example, where the highest doses of plutonium were used, care was taken to ensure that all the subjects had terminal illnesses. In those cases where this concern for risk was less evident and subjects were exposed to more troubling risks, the moral wrong done in the experiments was greater. Where it was not reasonable to assume that subjects would be dead before a cancer risk had a chance to materialize, or in the case of the uranium injections at Rochester, where acute effects were sought, the experiments are morally offensive. Consideration for the basic moral principle that people not be put at risk of harm is apparently what animated the decision to give higher doses to only terminal patients who could not survive long enough for harms to materialize. A person who is dying may have fewer interests in the future than a person who is not. This does not mean, however, that a dying person is owed less respect and may be used like an object, as a mere means to the ends of others. There are many moral questions about research on patients who are dying. The desperation of their circumstances leaves them vulnerable to exploitation. At a minimum, non-therapeutic research on a dying patient without the patient's consent or the authorization of an appropriate family member is clearly unethical. Uranium was also injected in 11 patients with terminal conditions at Massachusetts General Hospital in an experiment conducted jointly by the hospital and Oak Ridge National Laboratory from 1953 to 1957. ORNL's purpose was to obtain data for setting nuclear worker safety standards. A second purpose was to identify a radioisotope that would localize in brain tumors and destroy them when activated by a neutron beam. Although all but one of the patient subjects had brain cancer, the limited purpose of the experiment to establish whether uranium would localize sufficiently meant that there was no expectation that patient subjects might benefit medically from the uranium injections. The uranium doses in the Boston experiment were comparable to or higher than the one that caused measurable physical harm in the Rochester subject. Boston subjects were apparently subjected to brain biopsies, presumably solely for scientific purposes. At least three Boston subjects showed kidney damage at the time of death. In one of these cases, a trauma victim who was found unconscious, the autopsy report recorded clinical evidence of some amount of kidney failure and pathological evidence of kidney damage due to the chemical toxicity of uranium. The only evidence available about what the Boston subjects were told comes from 1995 testimony of one of the investigators, Dr. William Sweet, who said it was his practice to, quote, give a patient all the information we had ourselves, end quote. Presumably, this would have included that the injections had no prospect of benefiting the patient. The Boston Project was an instance in which high doses were given to dying patients. Some of these patients were comatose or otherwise suffering from severe irreversible central nervous system disease. Unless these patients or the families of comatose or incompetent patients understood that the injections were not for their benefit and still agreed to the injections, this experiment also was unethical. There was no justification for using dying patients as mere means to the ends of the investigators and the AEC. In at least one case, this disrespectful treatment clearly occurred. The trauma victim who arrived at the hospital unconscious was used as a subject, despite the fact that his identity was 
was never known. Presumably, he was not accompanied by any family or friends who might have authorized such a use of his body. Only extraordinary circumstances can justify deception and the use of people as mere means by government officials and physicians in the conduct of research involving human subjects. In the case of the injection experiments, we see no reason that the laudable goals of the research could not have been pursued in a morally acceptable fashion. There is no reason to think that people would not have been willing to serve as subjects of radiation research for altruistic reasons, and indeed there is evidence of people writing to the AEC to volunteer themselves for just such efforts. See chapter 13. That people are not likely to live long enough to be harmed does not justify failing to respect them as people. Concerns about adverse public relations and legal liability do not justify deceiving subjects, their families, and the public. Insofar as basic moral principles were violated in the conduct of the injection experiments, the Manhattan Engineer District, the AEC, the responsible officials of these agencies, and the medical professionals responsible for the injections are accountable for the moral wrongs that were done. End of section 31. Recording by Patrick McAfee, Evanston. Section 32 of Final Report of the Advisory Committee on Human Radiation Experiments. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Final Report of the Advisory Committee on Human Radiation Experiments. Case Studies, Chapter 6, Part 1 the AEC Program of Radioisotope Distribution At the dawn of the atomic age, many people hoped for dramatic advances in medicine, akin to the new miracle drug penicillin. Many of these hopes have been fulfilled. Radioisotopes have become remarkable tools in three areas. First, as their travels within the body are traced, radioisotopes provide a map of the body's normal metabolic functions. Second, building on tracer research, diagnostic techniques distinguish between normal and abnormal functioning. Finally, radioisotopes carried by the body's own processes to abnormal or cancerous cells can deliver a lethal dose of radiation to those undesirable cells. By supplying radioisotopes and supporting their use, the Atomic Energy Commission, AEC, actively promoted the research needed to achieve this progress. The growth in the applications of radioisotopes involved thousands of experiments using radioisotopes. No feasible method was found to review in detail the vast number of individual radioisotope experiments in the Advisory Committee's database. This was due not only to the large number of experiments, but also to the scarcity of information about many of the individual experiments. Both consent and exact dose levels were often not discussed in public work. No federal repository was found that had collected records documenting these aspects of experiments. Given the decentralized structure of American medicine, it is not surprising that the committee found that records on consent and exact dose, if they exist, would still be at the local institutions conducting research, or perhaps even in the private papers of physicians and scientists. Even when records were found at the local level, there was little documentation about consent. Thus, for the largest group of human radiation experiments, little documentation remains, and a meaningful examination of all such experiments was not possible. The committee instead chose to focus its energies in two directions, examining the overall system of oversight created by the federal government and examining small subsets of radioisotope experiments 
that posed significant ethical issues the first effort led to this chapter an overview of the system created by the federal government to monitor radioisotope experiments the second effort led to the case study on experiments involving children chapter seven since those raised questions of both additional biological risk and justification for doing non-therapeutic research on minors the aec's isotope distribution program was faced with three essential ethical questions the most immediate question concerned the allocation of a scarce resource given the likelihood that demand for radioisotopes would exceed supply how should priorities be set the question involved not simply the choice among competing proposals for human uses including experimentation treatment of disease and diagnosis but between human uses and other kinds of uses for example basic scientific research or industrial uses another immediate question was the safety with which this new material would be used since the government was actively promoting the use of radioactive isotopes it had an obligation to ensure their safe use harm to patients physicians and others involved could arise from inexperienced and untrained users of radioisotopes when properly used in trace amounts radioisotopes posed risks well below those deemed acceptable in occupational settings balancing risks versus benefits and seeking means to decrease risks and increase benefits as the field developed was a major ethical obligation finally there was the question of the relationship between researcher and subject or precisely the question of the authorization for use in humans and the process of disclosure and consent if any to be followed these uses can be divided into one therapeutic diagnostic uses two therapeutic diagnostic research and three non-therapeutic research as we shall see great attention was paid initially to the question of resource allocation but supply soon proved far greater than expected and the need for this attention evaporated. The control of the risk posed by the use of AEC-provided radioisotopes was also a source of intense focus from the outset, and remained so as the program grew. By contrast, notwithstanding the 1947 declarations by AEC General Manager Carol Wilson on the importance of consent, the matter of consent received only limited attention in the early years of the program origins of the aec radioisotope distribution program in the manhattan project the medical importance of radioisotopes was recognized before world war ii but distribution was unregulated by government the post-war program for distributing radioisotopes grew out of the part of the manhattan project that had developed the greatest technical expertise during the war the isotopes division of the research division at oak ridge production of useful radioisotopes required extensive planning for both their physical creation and their chemical separation from other materials plans to distribute radioisotopes to medical researchers outside the manhattan project were developed in the final year of the project in june 1946 the manhattan project publicly announced its program for distributing radioactive isotopes. The new world of radioisotope research was to be shared with all. Most research would be unclassified. An enthusiastic Science magazine reported, Production of tracer and therapeutic radioisotopes has been heralded as one of the great peacetime contributions of the uranium chain reacting pile this use of the pile will unquestionably be rich in scientific medical and technological applications an article in the new york times magazine told readers that properly chosen atoms can become a powerful and highly selected weapon for the destruction of certain types of cancer until now the doctors and biologists have had to plea for samples of isotope material from their brothers in the cyclotron laboratories now the picture has changed in a revolutionary way 
the government has adapted one of the oak ridge uranium piles to the mass production of radioactive byproduct material extensive planning led up to this public announcement although the initial expectations were that basic research would precede extensive medical applications from the very beginning official plan for clinical investigation with humans in doing so they recognized that the administration to humans places extreme demands both moral and legal upon the specifications and timing of the radioisotope material supplied the recognition of special moral and legal aspects of human experimentation and reliance on the professional competency of those administering radioisotopes form the cornerstones of the radioisotope distribution systems oversight of experiments significantly however the system was not designed to oversee consent from subjects prior to the administration of radioisotopes radioisotopes could not simply be ordered from the manhattan engineer district each purchase had to be reviewed and approved for human applications each application was reviewed by a special group of experts the advisory subcommittee on human application of the interim advisory committee on isotope distribution policy of the manhattan project according to one of the initial planners the chief reason for setting this group up as a separate entity from the research group another subcommittee is that of medical legal responsibility involved in the use or treatment of humans experimentally or otherwise when the aec began its work this subcommittee continued but was renamed the subcommittee on human applications of the committee on isotope distribution of the aec in 1959 it was absorbed into the advisory committee on medical uses of isotopes in 1974 the aec's responsibilities were transferred to the nuclear regulatory commission coupled with this review was a requirement that those wishing to purchase radioisotopes demonstrate the special competence required for working with radioactive materials this mechanism for centralized nationwide review was unusual at the time it was begun the breadth of the subcommittee's purview can be seen in the range of proposals examined although the advisory committee is concerned primarily with medical research the aec subcommittee review extended well beyond this realm apparently the subcommittee reviewed all proposed uses for radioisotopes that might result in the exposure of humans to radiation these included, for example, using cobalt-60 in nails in wooden survey stakes, probably to assist in later locating them, sulfur-35 in firing underground coal mines, and yttrium-90 as a tracer in gasoline in simulated airplane crashes. Its jurisdiction was limited to byproduct material, however, and did not extend to fissionable materials such as plutonium and uranium soon after the manhattan project's public announcement both the radioisotope distribution system and its oversight structure began operation on june twenty eighth nineteen forty six the subcommittee on human applications held its first meeting attending as members were dr andrew dowdy chairman and biophysicist giochino faila Dowdy was director of the University of Rochester's Manhattan Project Division, while Philo was a professor at Columbia University and consultant to the Meturgical Laboratory in Chicago. Not attending was the third member of the subcommittee, Dr. Heimer Friedel, executive officer of the Manhattan Project's medical section. Attending as non-voting secretary was Paul Abersold, in charge of the production of radioisotopes at Oak Ridge, later to head the AEC's isotope division. His efforts to promote the use of radioisotopes later earned him the nickname Mr. Isotope. Also attending as advisors from Oak Ridge were W. E. Cohn, the author of the original memorandum proposing a system for distributing radioisotopes and Carl Morgan, Director of Health Physics at Oak Ridge, 
who would over the years become a leading figure in the establishment of occupational exposure limits for radioisotopes although the primary task of the subcommittee was to oversee safety at the time many expected a shortage of radioisotopes thus much of this first meeting was taken up with a discussion of priorities for allocation as it happened supply exceeded demand within one year it was in the context of this discussion of allocation not a discussion of safety or ethics that a system of local committees was suggested each local committee also called local isotope committee at this meeting would include a a physician well versed in the physiology and pathology of the blood forming organs b a physician well versed in metabolism and metabolic disorders c a competent biophysicist radiologist or radiation physiologist qualified in the techniques of radioisotopes the main advantage of a system of local committees were administrative efficiency and delegation of prioritization for scarce isotopes the primary functions of each local isotope committee were coordination allocation and safety evidently no mention was made of overseeing subject consent at this first meeting the subcommittee had before it no actual request to evaluate even so members did agree on the general principles on which they would deny a request a the requesters are not sufficiently qualified to guarantee a safe and trustworthy investigation b insufficient knowledge exists to permit a safe application of the material in the proposed human cases there was no elaboration of crucial terms such as qualified safe and trustworthy insufficient knowledge and safe application although no standards of adequate consent were mentioned this degree of oversight was unusual in medical research during this time and even later although it had no specific request before it the subcommittee did consider the anticipated uses of some isotopes the uses of some isotopes were apparently rejected not only because of the hazards of radiation but also because of chemical toxicity and the availability of less hazardous alternatives for others specific limits were set for example the subcommittee was especially cautious concerning isotopes of strontium because it concentrated in bone as did radium which was known to be hazardous from the pre-war experience of the dial painters the subcommittee set a specific exposure limit the sr ninety and y ninety daughter should not contribute in excess of one per cent to the total rate of beta disintegration such general guidelines have little effect unless a procedure is established for their implementation at its first meeting the subcommittee set out in detail the mechanism for its own future operation what the subcommittee would be reviewing were requests to purchase isotopes for any use in human beings only after the subcommittee approved a request would the isotope be sold and shipped to the researcher the need for speed in responding to requests for human uses was recognized details of the procedure for purchasing isotopes were disseminated to potential users through a brochure issued in october nineteen forty six by the isotopes branch at oak ridge most of the brochure concerned the paperwork which among other things ensured that the subcommittee on human applications would actually be notified of all applications for human use the last stage of the purchase procedure indicates the underlying concern with legal liability although manhattan project approval was required the actual purchase was from the private contractor operator of the clinton laboratories later designated the oak ridge national laboratory in oak ridge at that time monsanto chemical company the final purchase agreement contained a clause relieving both the government and the private contractor from any responsibility for injury to persons or other living material or for any damage to property in the handling or application of this material the manhattan project also required the purchaser to file with the isotopes office a statement required by section five o five i 
of the federal food drug and cosmetic act however the advisory committee found no evidence of direct involvement by the fda at that time in the planning or operation of the radioisotope distribution program by october nineteen forty six the distribution program was well under way two hundred and seventeen requests had been received of these two hundred and eleven had been approved human use requests totaled ninety four of which ninety had been approved the aec assumes responsibility for radioisotope distribution when the aec took over responsibility for the program on january first nineteen forty seven the structure of the radioisotopes distribution system remained intact the subcommittee on allocation and the subcommittee on human applications remained as standing subcommittees of the interim committee on isotopes distribution policy which became known as the advisory committee on isotope distribution policy the forms developed by the manhattan project were reissued as aec forms without substantial revision the system of application from private users review purchase and distribution continued to operate at first there appears to have been some confusion over the responsibility of the aec for its own research program and for its program to distribute radioisotopes to private researchers as discussed in chapter one two 1947 letters from aec general manager carol wilson describe strong consent requirements the april letter to stafford warren was expressly directed to the terms on which research conducted by aec contractors including universities would be approved the november letter was sent to robert stone as we have discussed those clear statements to contract researchers do not seem to have been made to those applying for radioisotopes this confusion about the relationship between contract research and isotope distribution is discussed in a september twenty sixth nineteen forty seven memorandum from j c franklin manager of oak ridge operations to carol wilson other correspondence also indicates confusion over whether the aec's own labs which were themselves often operated by contractors were to follow the procedures for the radioisotope distribution program which would have placed their human use request before the subcommittee on human applications initially requests for by-product materials from within the aec used a form that did not specify whether the radioisotope was to be used on humans by august nineteen forty nine shields warren director of the aec's division of biology and medicine had directed that human use by aec laboratories be subject to review by the subcommittee on human applications however when regulations governing radioisotope distribution were first promulgated aec owned facilities were specifically exempted from all such regulations warren's goal was achieved instead by a memorandum from carol wilson in july nineteen fifty this memorandum discontinued use of the earlier form and directed that all requests use the same form used by outside purchasers which directed human use requests to the subcommittee on human applications End of section 32section thirty three of final report of the advisory committee on human radiation experiments this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org final report of the advisory committee on human radiation experiments case studies chapter six part two the AEC Subcommittee on Human Applications At the heart of overseeing the expansion of the use of radioisotopes was the Subcommittee on Human Applications of the AEC's Advisory Committee on Isotope Distribution. Applications had to have been approved by a local isotope committee before even being considered by the subcommittee. The subcommittee itself conducted most of its reviews by mail, 
Unfortunately, only fragmentary records of this correspondence have been found. The subcommittee formally met only once a year to discuss general issues. By its second meeting, in March 1948, membership had grown to four. Dowdy was no longer on the subcommittee. Joseph Hamilton and A. H. Holland had been added. Hamilton was, as described in Chapter 5, a physician investigator with the University of California's Radiation Laboratory in Berkeley. Holland was a physician investigator who became medical director at the AEC's Oak Ridge operations in late 1947. As we shall see in Chapter 13, he played a central role in the question of the declassification of secret experiments. As the subcommittee continued to examine each case on its own merits, it began to generate principles for general guidance. In doing so, it began to categorize experiments, apparently according to the degree of hazard posed. One category was tracer studies in normal adult humans using beta and gamma emitters with half-lives of 20 days or fewer. Applications needed to include information on biodistribution and biological half-life of the radioisotope, based either on animal studies or references to the literature. A second category was studies in normal children. In 1948, the subcommittee did not issue detailed guidelines, but instead simply stated that such applications would be given special scrutiny by the Subcommittee on Human Applications. In 1949, it issued more detailed guidelines, which indicate that the concern was with minimizing risk, not requiring or overseeing consent. In general, the use of radioisotopes in normal children should be discouraged, However, the subcommittee will consider proposals for use in important researches, provided the problem cannot be studied properly by other methods, and provided the radiation dosage level in any tissue is low enough to be considered harmless. It should be noted that in general the amount of radioactive material per kilogram of body weight must be smaller in children than that required for similar studies in adults. Coupled with the children's category in 1949 were studies on pregnant women. The use of radioactive materials in all normal pregnancies should be directly discouraged where no therapeutic benefit is to be derived. Although not specifically mentioned in the minutes, such a policy may, like research in normal children, have been waived for important researches that could not otherwise be undertaken. One recurring difficulty was the problem of deciding when an application could be considered safe. There was no simple mechanical process for making such a judgment. This can be seen in the subcommittee's detailed consideration of an application for phosphorus-32 to be used in a blood volume study of children. The amount of radioactivity proposed ranged from one-fourth to one microcurie per kilogram of body weight. Initially, three of the four members approved the application, and the allocation was made. However, the fourth member, replying late, reopened the question. Following reconsideration by the entire subcommittee, Three of the four members concluded the original application for use on children should be turned down, and the investigator was asked to revise the application to state the importance of making the study in children and to keep the amount of activity less than one-half microcurie per kilogram. The reduction in the allowable amount of activity illustrates both the diligence with which the subcommittee pursued its task and the inherent difficulties in making judgments about what constituted safe practices in a rapidly developing field of research. The subcommittee's task was made a bit easier when considering applications with adults, where it could draw upon occupational guidelines. Requests for long-lived radioisotopes were placed in a third category, defined as those with a biological half-life greater than 20 days, 
In contrast with experiments on children, here the subcommittee was willing to set a general dose limit. The dosage in the critical tissue should be such as to conform to the limitations stated by the National Committee on Radiation Protection, the NCRP, now the National Council on Radiation Protection and Measurements, is an independent organization that publishes occupational radiation protection guidelines based on expert reviews of contemporary scientific knowledge. As with children, such applications must be reviewed separately. The subcommittee did not wish this limit to be ironclad. In special cases, however, the Subcommittee on Human Applications may permit the use of radioisotopes in higher dosages. At this point, the Subcommittee appears to have been establishing general principles. No specific radioisotopes or particular research proposals are mentioned. A final category was applications using radioisotopes with long half-lives in patients with short life expectancies. The term moribund was used in correspondence by Paul Ebersold prior to the second meeting of the subcommittee in March 1948. He wrote to the subcommittee members explaining that the item was on the agenda because requests for such work had been received. He referred to a written request from a physician at Massachusetts General Hospital to use calcium-45 and an oral request from a staff member at Presbyterian Hospital in Chicago to use testosterone labeled with carbon-14. Abersold did not provide any details as to the purposes of the proposed research. The issue was what policy to adopt when the patients were predicted not to live long enough for long-term hazards to develop. Abersold told the subcommittee that this office feels that such requests should be allowed if a satisfactory mechanism for determining the moribundness of the patients in question is established. We believe that this question should be decided by a group of doctors and written evidence signed by the group filed with the Isotopes Division prior to the use of the material. The subcommittee had no objection to the basic principle of applying larger doses to patients with short life expectancies, but its language was more oblique than Abersold's letter. It is recognized that there may be instances in which the disease from which the patient is suffering permits the administration of larger doses for investigative purposes. Safeguards were to be provided by reliance on the judgment of local physicians, not on a precise definition of moribund. Indeed, the subcommittee did not even use that term. Applications would be approved, providing 1. Full responsibility for conduct of the work is assumed by a special committee of at least three competent physicians in the institution in which the work is to be done. This will not necessarily be the local radioisotope committee. 2. The subject has given his consent to the procedure. 3. There is no reasonable likelihood of producing manifest injury by the radioisotope to be employed. No further explanation was given of how the second requirement, giving consent, would be fulfilled by a moribund patient, nor was additional guidance provided to clarify the third criterion. One instance in which this policy was applied took place at the Walter E. Fernald State School in Massachusetts. See Chapter 7. Correspondence between the researchers and the AEC indicates that the AEC allowed the administration of 50 microcuries of calcium-45, 50 times the amount the AEC allowed the researchers to administer to other subjects in the study, to a 10-year-old patient with a life expectancy of a few months, suffering from Hurler-Hunter syndrome, a degenerative disease of the nervous system. In applying for the radioisotope, Dr. Clemens Benda, the researcher, noted that permission for the use of higher doses administered to moribund patients has been granted by you to other investigators. This subject was part of a study of calcium metabolism approved by the superintendent of the school. Students had been described as voluntarily participating in 
in a letter sent earlier to the parents, asking if they objected, but that did not mention the use of radioactive tracers. Lack of response from a parent was presumed to be approval. The subject with Hurler-Hunter syndrome was found to have abnormal calcium metabolism, but died before the study could be completed. Even as it developed procedures for unusual cases, the subcommittee recognized that some existing uses were becoming routine and did not need to be continuously reviewed by the subcommittee itself. The subcommittee delegated the review of such requests to the isotopes division, setting out the criteria to be applied. Such applications should be justified by a. a commensurate increase in patient load, b. an expanded research program, c. provision of adequate storage and handling facilities, d. assurance that personnel protection and supervision are adequate for the larger amounts requested. An additional simplification occurred with the introduction in 1951 of general authorizations, which delegated more authority to the local radioisotope committees of approved institutions. These authorizations enabled research institutions to obtain some radioisotopes for approved purposes after filing a single application each year, therefore eliminating the need to file a separate application for each radioisotope order. As such, they also reduced the oversight of the AEC's Subcommittee on Human Applications, as each order was no longer reviewed individually. However, at first, the general authorizations did not apply to human use, and when they were expanded to human use in 1952, they were limited to certain radioisotopes for clinical use, and excluded radioisotopes in cancer research, therapy, and diagnosis. Both the AEC and the subcommittee reacted strongly when proper bureaucratic procedures were not followed. One example was a private industrial lab that used iodine-131 for a human study that had not been properly reviewed, even though no one was harmed, the AEC threatened to suspend shipments of all radioisotopes, not just iodine-131. Such an action would have put the company out of business. Abersold, at the direction of the committee, notified the company president that while the incident did not lead to any unfortunate results from the standpoint of radiation hazard, a recurrence of this type of violation should result in cessation of all shipment of radioactive materials to Tracer Lab Incorporated. For his part, the company president reacted by notifying employees that such action would be grounds for automatic dismissal. Thus, as it proceeded in its work of evaluating individual applications, the subcommittee developed more general principles, such as categories of human use based upon risk and updating of criteria based upon developing knowledge. The goal, as the AEC's Director of Research, K.S. Pitzer, stated in 1950, was to make radioisotopes as nearly as possible ordinary items of commerce in the technical world. For example, cancer researchers initially received radioisotopes at no charge. The free program was changed to an 80% discount program in 1952 and ended in July 1961. AEC Regulations and Published Guidelines An important step towards making the use of radioisotopes a component of medical practice routine was formally enacting regulations governing the use of isotopes. The first regulations were enacted in 1951. These early regulations essentially promulgated facility and personnel requirements without establishing dose limits or mentioning the consent requirement established in 1949 for administering larger doses to very sick patients. Throughout the 1950s, changes in the regulations dealt with administrative procedures. Other concerns about radioisotope use, such as consent requirements, were disseminated through circulars, brochures, and guides of the isotopes division. In 
In 1948, the circular describing medical applications was only three pages long. By 1956, it had been replaced by a 24-page guide that provided detailed requirements for many different applications of isotopes. This greater precision can be seen, for example, in the guidelines for terminal patients. By the time of the 1956 guide, the use of radioisotopes with half-lives greater than 30 days ordinarily would not be permitted without prior animal studies establishing metabolic properties, unless patients had a short life expectancy. The judgment of local physicians was now to be guided by a more exact definition. Exceptions would be limited to patients suffering from diseased conditions of such a nature, life expectancy of one year or less, that there is no reasonable probability of the radioactivity employed producing manifest injury. However, while a more precise definition of terminal was now provided, there was no longer an explicit mention of a specific requirement for consent from these patient subjects, as had been made earlier. Consent was required, though, in the section of the 1956 Guide on the Use of Radioisotopes in Normal Subjects for Experimental Purposes. Presumably normal here means healthy. This section included the earlier provisions that the tracer dose does not exceed the permissible body burden, and that such experiments not normally be conducted on infants or pregnant women. It also, however, included a new provision, that such experiments were to be limited to volunteers to whom the intent of the study and the effects of radiation have been outlined. The term volunteer would seem to imply a requirement that consent be obtained following a disclosure of information to potential subjects. The disclosure requirement does not include, however, all of the elements of information that today are included in duties to obtain informed consent. The 1956 consent requirement now governed all radioisotope experiments in normal subjects, a substantial expansion of the earlier requirement of consent only from terminal patients receiving larger-than-usual doses. It also explicitly required that both the purpose and effects of radiation be explained. It is unclear whether the failure to mention consent in the section on terminal patients was an oversight in drafting or a deliberate distinction between patients and normal subjects. The Advisory Committee has not found documents revealing the history of this provision, nor any explanation of the choice to limit the broad consent requirement to normal subjects. This broad requirement continued over the next decade as part of AEC policy. In 1965, the AEC published the Guide for the Preparation of Applications for the Medical Use of Radioisotopes. The guide described the application process and specific policies for the non-routine medical uses of byproduct material. This policy statement reiterated the exclusion of pregnant women and required that subject characteristics and selection criteria be clearly delineated in the application. Another requirement stated that applications should include confirmation that consent of human subjects or their representatives will be obtained to participate in the investigation, except where this is not feasible or in the investigator's professional judgment is contrary to the best interests of the subjects. During the 1960s, the entire system of oversight of radioisotope research began to change as the Food and Drug Administration began developing a more active role in supervising the development of radiopharmaceuticals. The regulatory history of this shift in authority is complex and beyond the scope of this report. Suffice it to say that by the mid-1960s, the regulation of radioisotope research was beginning to merge with the regulation of pharmaceutical research in general. End of Section 33 Recording by Maria Casper
Section 34 of Final Report of the Advisory Committee on Human Radiation Experiments. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Final Report of the Advisory Committee on Human Radiation Experiments. Case Studies, Chapter 6, Part 3. Local Oversight, Radioisotope Committees. From its inception, the AEC distribution system required each local institution to establish a local radioisotope committee, later termed a medical isotopes committee. Initially, the primary purpose was to simplify the allocation process by having local institutions establish their own priorities before applying to the AEC. Soon after the program began, supply increased and no dramatic new uses developed, so allocation was no longer a major issue. These local committees also took on responsibilities for physical safety, usually working closely with radiation safety offices. By October 1949, this requirement also applied to the AEC's national labs. When general authorizations were issued in 1951, granting broader discretion to qualifying local institutions, local isotope committees assumed greater responsibility. By 1956, the functions of the local radioisotope committees included reviewing applications, prescribing any special precautions, reviewing reports from their radiological safety officers, recommending remedial action when safety rules were not observed, and keeping records of their own activities. The basic focus on radiological safety remained, although in reviewing applications a local medical isotopes committee could also consider other factors which the local medical isotopes committee may wish to establish for medical use of these materials. Exactly what these other factors might be was not specified. These local committees together reviewed thousands of applications over the next decades. Although not federal agencies, they were required by the AEC, and their proper functioning was an important part of the oversight system envisioned by the AEC. To fully assess whether this system fulfilled its goals would be an enormous task, requiring the retrieval and examination of thousands of local records. However, to make a preliminary assessment of whether the system as a whole generally appeared to function as planned, the Advisory Committee did examine the records of several public and private institutions, the Veterans Administration, VA, the University of Chicago, the University of Michigan, and Massachusetts General Hospital, MGH. Doing so provided us with an understanding of the techniques of risk management as used at the local level on a day-to-day -day basis. We specifically examined whether local radioisotope committees in fact were established as directed and what techniques they developed to monitor consent and ensure safety. Establishment of Local Isotope Committees Overall, the federal requirement seems to have been an effective means of instituting a reasonably uniform structure across the nation for local radioisotope committees. The AEC's requirements for local committees were followed in all of the institutions studied, and there is no reason for believing they were exceptional. One local radioisotope committee, that of Massachusetts General Hospital, was established in May 1946, prior to the AEC requirement. The other institutions established a local radioisotope committee when required to do so by the AEC. Local committees also could have broader tasks than those required by the AEC. For example, the Radiation Policy Committee at the University of Michigan regulated all radioactive substances used on campus, not just those purchased from the AEC. These included reactor products, transuranic elements, and external sources of radiation. The Veterans Administration added another level of oversight in the form of a system-wide Central Advisory Committee, 
In 1947, the VA embarked on a radioisotope research program that would take place within the newly established radiation units in the hospitals that would be the recipients of AEC-supplied isotopes. Among early research projects were the treatment of toxic goiter and hyperthyroidism with iodine-131 and treatment of polycythemia rubra vera, overproduction of red blood cells, with phosphorus-32 at Los Angeles, radioactive iron tracers of erythrocytes at Framingham, and sodium-24 circulatory tracers in Minneapolis. By the end of 1948, radioisotope units had been established in eight VA hospitals. Each of the eight was asked to establish a radioisotope committee, as required by the AEC, to be appointed by the dean's committee of each hospital, while representatives from affiliated universities agreed to serve as consultants in the various units. Local Monitoring of Consent Generally, although local institutions created clear procedures to monitor safety, these local radio isotope committees did not establish procedures to monitor or require consent. See Part 1 for discussion of the broader historical context of consent in medical research. The standard application form to the Massachusetts General Hospital Committee, as of 1953, had no place to describe an informed consent procedure. This does not, of course, resolve the question of whether consent was given. According to one prominent neurosurgeon interviewed by the Advisory Committee staff, William Sweet, at that time, in the case of brain tumor patients, oral consent was obtained from both the patient and, since mental competency could later be an issue, the next of kin. Similarly, no mention of the 1947 AEC requirements stated in General Manager Wilson's letters is contained in the advice Shields Warren gave in 1948 to the VA. Even though Warren, as director of the AEC's Division of Biology and Medicine, must have known of discussions about consent requirements. An issue that arose before the VA Central Advisory Committee was whether patient subjects should sign release slips. This issue posed the question of whether the radioisotope units in the VA hospitals were treatment wards or clinical research laboratories. If wards, patients need not sign consent forms, for they were simply being treated in the normal course of an illness. Shields Warren agreed with this presumption and felt that there was no need for the patients to sign release slips. The proper use of radioisotopes in medical practice is encompassed in the normal responsibilities of the individual and of the institution or hospital. In addition, he felt that the practice would draw undue and unwholesome attention to the use of radioisotopes. Movement towards more formal consent requirements gradually arose at the local level. In 1956, the University of Michigan's own Human Use Subcommittee directed that in an experiment using sodium-22 and potassium-42, each volunteer would be required to sign a release indicating that he has full knowledge of his being subjected to a radiation exposure. Since the local committee was concerned about what it termed unnecessary radiation, the volunteers presumably were healthy subjects not otherwise receiving radiation for treatment or diagnosis. The committee appended a recommended release form to its minutes. I, the undersigned, hereby assert that I am voluntarily taking an injection of blank at a dose level which I understand to be considered within accepted permissible dose limits by the University of Michigan Radioisotope Human Use Subcommittee. By 1967, the Michigan Subcommittee also required that the subject explain the experiment to the researcher to clarify any doubts or misunderstandings. The following statement was incorporated into all applications to the university's Human Use Subcommittee. The opinion of the committee is that informed consent is the legal way of describing a meeting of minds in a contract, 
In this situation, it means that the subject clearly understands what the experiment is, what the potential risks are, and has agreed, and without pressure of any kind, elected to participate. The best way to ascertain that the consent is informed is to have the subject explain back fully to the interviewer exactly what he thinks he is submitting to and what he believes the risks might be. This facilitates clarification of any doubts, spoken or unspoken. The content of this discussion will be recorded in detail below. During the 1960s, as explained in Chapter 3, concern was growing over the adequacy of consent from subjects. Although not intended by the AEC to monitor the obtaining of consent from subjects, over the years the local radio isotope committees may have come to take on this task. By requiring such local committees, the AEC had probably unwittingly provided an institutional structure that allowed the later concern for informed consent to be implemented at the local level. Local Monitoring of Risk This local and informal approach to consent is in sharp contrast to the detail and documentation with which risk was assessed. As discussed earlier, monitoring risk was the major task of the AEC's Subcommittee on Human Applications, the local committees mirrored this task, examining in detail the various experiments presented to them. As with the AEC subcommittee, local committees developed a variety of methods, none especially surprising, to ensure what they believed was adequate safety. The basic dilemma facing local committees was to allow exploration of new territory while attempting to guard against hazards that, precisely because new territory was being explored, were not totally predictable. This dilemma was apparent at the local level, as well as at the level of the AEC's Subcommittee on Human Applications. For example, in the minutes of the Massachusetts General Hospital Local Radioisotope Committee in 1955, during a discussion of new and experimental radiotherapies for patients, one member of the committee declared that the safety of the patient was of paramount importance. Yet other members suggested that a risk-benefit analysis needed to be an integral component of such a policy decision. The committee as a whole concluded merely that it was a complicated issue, and that it is not wise in any way to inhibit investigators with ideas, and yet the safety of the patient must come first. Requiring prior animal studies was a basic method of assessing risk. For example, the 22 studies reviewed by the University of Chicago's local committee in 1953 included multiple therapeutic and tracer studies involving brain tumors, the thyroid gland, metastatic masses, and tissue differentiation, those the Chicago Committee viewed as involving any risk to the patient were preceded by extensive animal studies. Animal studies were usually tailored to each project, and also raised the question of the differences between how humans and animals might respond to a particular radioisotope. A more uniform standard, directly applicable to humans, was the system of dose limits established by the National Committee on Radiation Protection for Occupational Purposes, the maximum permissible dose for each isotope. In addition, although no national system existed for reporting their decisions, local committees drew upon their knowledge of what had been approved at other institutions, at least one local committee issued its own dose limits. The Massachusetts General Hospital Local Committee in 1949 issued a seven-point policy on human use of beta and gamma-emitting radioisotopes. By 1956, the Michigan Committee provided explicit limits for exposure of volunteers. At other times, the condition of subjects who were patients was accepted as justification for higher doses. For example, in 1953, the Chicago Committee approved a tracer study using mercury-203 to study uptake by malignant renal tissue 
Although admitted to be unusual, it was approved as potentially efficacious in patients suffering hypernephroma, a kidney cancer. Total dose would not exceed 10 mg of ionic mercury, a high dose for most tracer studies, which was approved as reasonable given the illness of the patients. Similarly, the Harvard Medical School Committee in 1956 stipulated that the risk of incurring any type of deleterious effect due to the radiation received should be comparable to the normal everyday risks of accidental injury. For seriously ill patients receiving experimental treatment, however, the committee stated, the estimated deleterious effect from radiation should be offset by the expected beneficial effects of the procedure. In addition to setting limits, local committees encourage the use of technical methods to reduce risk. Use of different detection techniques could reduce the dose required. In 1955, for example, the Michigan Committee considered an application to administer to normal volunteers up to 30 microcuries of sodium-22 and up to 350 microcuries of potassium-42, resulting in internal radiation doses of up to 300 millirem per week. The purpose was to study sodium-potassium exchanges. The committee asked itself, is it justifiable to subject the volunteers to an exposure in excess of the maximum permissible? This committee did not resolve this question, but came forward with the suggestion that more sensitive counting techniques might permit this investigation at lower dose levels. Another method of reducing risk was to restrict the type of subjects to those whose life expectancy was too short for any long-term effects to appear. This has already been seen regarding terminal patients. Another variation of the same technique was to restrict the use of volunteers to those over a certain age. At Michigan, age restrictions on who would be acceptable as a volunteer began appearing in the 1960s. When a worthwhile experiment also involved novel risks, another method to control risk was to require additional monitoring by the local committee as the experiment proceeded. At times, the Michigan Committee required preliminary reports before allowing experiments to proceed further. In another instance, the Michigan Committee required the researcher to obtain long-term excretion data because of concern that the usual biologic half-life data might not be sufficient. Similar additional oversight was required at the University of Chicago in 1953. A proposal was made to use tritium-labeled cholesterol to study steroid estrogen metabolism in women. The question of the distribution of estrogenic hormones in humans was unexplored at that time and deemed worthy of research. While the risk appeared low, the committee ultimately approved the study for the first round of the experiment only for non-pregnant women who were sterile, or pregnant women who planned to be sterilized post-abortion. If data from the first round suggested minimal risk to the women and the fetuses, the program could be expanded. Thus, in establishing a system of local radioisotope committees, the AEC effectively increased the detail with which each proposed experiment was reviewed. Often, it appears, experimental protocols were revised at the local level before being approved and sent on to the AEC. Thus, the system created by the AEC did some of its most effective risk management out of sight of direct federal oversight. End of Section 34 Recording by Maria Casper